Hey, Chris, this is Lynn. Just wanted to test the mic on this computer and this platform since I'm reading a report later today. Hi, Chris, this is Lynn. Can you hear me now? Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate the test. Just wanted, because it's a different platform and a different computer, wanted to make sure things were good to go. Thank you. Uh, have a good morning. March Council meeting. Welcome back to day two of our March Council meeting. Uh, we're going to get started now with agenda item D3, which uh, is going to be a pretty meaty uh, salmon topic, so I will hand the gavel over to our Vice Chair, Brad Pettinger, who will ably handle this agenda item. All righty. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. Good morning, everyone. We're going to start off with the D3. And Robin, I just realized that I'm getting the pause. Uh, it says 8.45, so. Oh, it does. Maybe it doesn't be here yet. Have we started? Okay. The, the screen says 8.45. It's a second. Okay. I think Robin probably read what was on the screen. Probably. We'll just pause here for right now.
Okay. Um, apologies for that. We just uh, got a little ahead of the uh, the time on the uh, on the screen there before we started on D uh, on D three. And uh, with that, we'll turn to Robin and do uh, kick us off. Robin. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, yes, agenda item D3, the identify management objectives and preliminary definition of the 2022 management alternatives. So using the SAS management recommendations as a basis, which they've submitted supplemental SAS report one under this agenda item, the council should identify a range of management elements in the alternatives for public review. That includes the harvest ranges, special restrictions, and the proposed season structure. The STT will collate the council's identified management elements into coordinated coastwide alternatives. The 2022 collated alternatives will be returned to the council for review and any further direction on Friday, March 11th, Saturday, March 12th, Sunday, March 13th, as needed. This will be followed by STT analysis and final adoption of the alternatives on Monday, March 14th. Agenda item D3, attachment one, provides guidance for developing and assessing the alternatives. Any alternative considered for adoption that deviates from the objectives in the salmon FMP will require implementation by emergency rule. If a rule, emergency rule appears to be necessary, the council must clearly identify and justify the need for an action consist, consistent with the emergency criteria established on the council established by the council and these are attachment two and attachment three before defining the alternatives the council should be briefed on any pertinent management constraints resulting from action by the pacific salmon commission action by the california fish and game commission to set the allocation for the klamath river fall chinook or the sacramento fall chinook for the inside recreational fisheries and nymphs constraints for stocks listed under the endangered species act the council may also want to consider recommendations for in-season action to modify fisheries that may open prior to May 16, 2022, as impacts accrued in these fisheries may affect opportunity in summer fisheries. Additionally, under the Area 2A catch hearing plan for Pacific halibut, incidental halibut restriction in the commercial troll fisheries is scheduled to begin April 1. The council may discuss changes to the halibut retention when considering the regulations for the commercial salmon fisheries opening prior to May 16, 2020. I think we've already covered that part with our halibut agenda item. But your council action under this is to, by using the SAS proposals and any other agency and public input, define basic management elements and alternatives for STT collation into a coastwide management alternatives and then consider the need for any in-season action to address salmon fisheries opening prior to May 16, 2022. And for your reference materials, we have the two attachments that we spoke of in the situation summary. We'll also um, hear from Phil Anderson on a PSC report and let me just bring up whatever sorry about that Yeah, so we'll hear um, from Phil Anderson on the Pacific Salmon Commission. We'll hear from NIMPS, uh, their guidance letter, and we'll also have a PowerPoint. And then uh, for tribal uh, topics, we have a couple of tribal reports. We have a joint WDFW and tribal report. We have a report from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. We have a report a tribal report from the Colville tribe, an STT report, and a SAS report. And with all that, thank you. I think that wraps up my summary. Okay, thank you, Robin. Um, questions for Robin on her, uh, her summary? Okay. 
with that, I'll turn to Phil Anderson for the uh, for the Pacific Salmon Commission report. Phil, thanks, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'll uh, lean on my friends and colleagues uh, who accompany me in the Pacific Salmon Commission forum um, to help me out here, where I may miss important. Uh, items. Um, since the Council uh, last met in November, the Pacific Salmon Commission has met twice, as we typically do. We had our, uh, what we call our postseason meeting in January. Um, it's a, it was a week-long uh, meeting, and uh, we, we were hoping to do it in person, but that didn't happen, so we did it virtually again. Um, and we received reports, um, uh, both both countries, United States and Canada, uh, submit their postseason reports uh, for review by the commission, which which they did. Um, and we um, also uh, received a report from our incidental mortality uh, working group. Um, one of the things that came out of our most recent uh, agreement uh, was a commitment to look at incidental mortalities in various fisheries. Uh, we put limits on incidental mortalities that are allowed. And we're looking at um, how those incidental mortalities are tracked and reported. Um, uh, so we were pleased to receive that report. It's under review by what we call the Chinook Interface Group, which is a, a, a group that uh, interfaces, as the name suggests, between the Chinook Technical Committee and the Pacific Salmon Commission. Uh, we have also paid a, uh, a good deal of attention to uh, in tracking the uh, impacts of the uh, the pandemic uh, on the ability of the management entities to uh, sample and monitor fisheries, um, uh, uh, do work associated with uh, stock assess or uh, forecasts, um, and also on uh, marking of hatchery fish. Uh, so um, um, that has been a topic uh, in each one of our meetings uh, really since the pandemic began. Um, and I know we heard a little bit yesterday about the impacts um, domestically here. Um, so we're, we're tracking that as well. I think I can Generally, generally say that uh, the impacts of the pandemic on the sampling and monitoring and of fisheries has uh, impacted the Canadian work more than the work within the U.S., uh, Alaska, um, Washington, Oregon. Um, in February, we. Um, uh, it, it pursuant to our agreement, that is when the state of Alaska uh, reports out on the data that they collect and use in a formula that sets the Southeast Alaska catch limit. And uh, they did so. And so that that catch limit has been set by the commission based on based on that analysis and that data. As you know, uh, or may know, uh, we do, our Chinook Technical Committee uh, uses the model and goes through and looks at abundance indices uh, to determine the annual catch limits for the um, aggregate abundance-based management. So fisheries, which uh, includes Southeast Alaska, uh, but that's determined by the, by the method I just mentioned. Uh, but the CTC uses a model uh, to do that uh, for the northern BC fishery uh, catch limit, as well as the west coast of Vancouver Island catch limit. So that work um, is uh, is ongoing. Um, I don't have specific details or dates, but generally we look to get uh, have the CTC complete that work. Uh, and have it fully reviewed by the CTC 
prior to making their recommendation uh, to the commission uh, with a target of having that done by April 1st. Um, so um, hopefully we're we're on schedule to to have that, although a significant amount of the work will be done here over the course of the next uh, two to three weeks. That in information, of course, plays an important role in in our decision making here in the modeling um, of our fisheries. We need to have that information uh, and um, interfaced with with our Fram Chinook model and. Um, uh, so uh, that works on going. There's also been a, f a fair amount of work done within the um, Southern panel uh, as it has uh, relative to uh, the uh, limits, the exploitation re uh, rate limits on coho stocks. Uh, you may recall that with it here in the last two or three years within the council process, we've run up against that from time to time where the limit uh, that's prescribed in our agreement on uh, coho stocks has been in excess of what is allowed. Uh, and so there's um, a need to make adjustments to ensure that we're comp um, in compliance with those uh, ER uh, rates. Um, and there was uh, considerable discussion within the Southern panel uh, on those and how they're calculated. Um, and uh, my colleague here, Kyle Addix, it was a, played a big role in those discussions. And if there are details about that that you'd like to learn about, he's the guy to talk to. Um, looking ahead, we, we, um, um, we again, well, well, without the preface of looking ahead. We again uh, had uh, got funding uh, for some significant investments in habitat restoration and improvements within Puget Sound that's associated with the um, biological opinion. Um, uh, this was the third year of, of investing approximately $10 million into various projects within Puget Sound uh, focused on those um, critical stocks uh, in watersheds such as the Nooksack um, and the Stillaguamish, uh, Dungeness, Hood Canal. Um, and we also, again, received funding uh, to, to um, help augment the prey base for southern resident killer whales. Uh, that was also included in our... Um, our uh, budget this past year um, and we're hopeful that that will continue that level of funding will continue so that increased production can continue to occur uh, to help southern resident killer whales so i think i'll stop there and and um turn to my colleagues, uh, Ms. Evanson or Mr. Oatman um, or Ms. Bishop, uh, Mr. Addix, Mr. Kern, anyone here that uh, is, participates in the Pacific Salmon Commission forum that they may have something to add to what I have said. Uh, Danny? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks, Phil. I think you did an excellent job characterizing uh, the past year in the Pacific Salmon Commission arena. I would just add two more fiscal pieces. Uh, one is that uh, last year and this year, uh, we have uh, in invested uh, about $3 million into what we call Puget Sound critical stocks. So uh, those are the conservation hatcheries. And on top of that, we've also invested approximately 3.5 million and intend to again this year in what we refer to as sound science for Chinook stocks. So that is maintaining the coastwide coded wire tag system uh, and recovering those, which is also used in this process. 
uh, improving uh, our escapement estimation of salmon, uh, new tools, uh, estimates of uh, all ty types of parameters that we use uh, in those models. So we expect all of that to continue for this year as well. Thank you, Danny. Anyone else? All right. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. So that I think completes our report from the Pacific Salmon Commission. We're all happy to answer any questions. Perfect. Thank you, Phil. Okay. Uh, questions uh, on the report? Okay. Thank you. All right. Next up will be uh, Susan Bishop with the NIPS report. Susan? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I will be speaking from agenda item D3. Um, in the interest of time, I will highlight those stocks of most interest to the council fisheries. I know there's a lot in this guidance letter, so I'm happy to answer questions on anything in the letter, but for the interest of time, I'll try to keep it shorter than just reading it, the whole thing into the uh, record. Um, uh, first off, um, so the guidance letter is intended to provide um, our guidance on Endangered Species Act listed stocks, as Robin said, but we also uh, um, take the opportunity to comment or provide recommendations on things um, of other interest uh, to the Council and Fisheries Management um, under uh, NIMS, that NIMS is involved in. So. Sort of uh, segueing off of Mr. Anderson's report, uh, the guidance letter starts out um, as um, uh, calling the council's attention to the coho provisions under the Pacific Salmon Treaty <clears throat> that affect council fisheries that indicate that council fisheries together with other southern U.S. fisheries must be managed to stay within the exploitation rate caps identified in Chapter 5 of the 2019 Pacific Salmon Treaty Agreement. Um, and as they have in previous years, the STT should report upon both the U.S. Pacific Salmon Treaty Coho Management Unit obligations and the expected exploitation rates during the preseason process. Um, as a reminder to the Council of some deadlines, the current agreement includes a provision for either country to request an increase in those exploitation rate caps um, over, the, over those specified in the agreement but it includes a commitment by both countries not to change the status or the associated cap for a management unit after March 31st. Um, so therefore, any request for modifying the exploitation rate caps will need to be exchanged with Canada prior to May th March 31st. Um, and uh, the two countries will be meeting next week, I can believe it's March 15th, to exchange information um, on their respective expectations for the 2022 fishing season. Um, moving along, um, on, for Sacramento River Fall Chinook, um, we uh, comment that, um, as you all are aware, Sacramento River Fall Chinook were under a rebuilding plan until just recently, um, uh, in, which, in which case it was declared rebuilt, and it was rebuilt one, sooner, one year sooner than anticipated under its rebuilding plan. However, while the stock is now rebuilt, the larger picture is important in shaping 2022 salmon fisheries to ensure to the extent possible that the stock does not become overfished again. Um, it's had a somewhat volatile history uh, with the stock and the fishery performance have shown a consistent pattern of over forecasting abundance and uh, escapement and under um, estimating exploitation rates. Um, unfortunately, escapement has been below the floor in five of the last seven years and below preseason expectations in six of the sub last seven years. In addition, the exploitation rate, um, postseason exploitation rates have been significantly higher than the preseason um, expectations. And so given the model, the tendency of the model to over forecast abundance and underestimate exploitation rates, we recommend a ca caution in setting the uh, escapement target for 2022 ocean salmon fisheries. A risk averse approach is warranted such that fisheries should be structured to target an escapement at the upper end of the Sacramento uh, Fall Chinook conservation objective, which is um, the range there is 122,000 to 180,000. So the upper end of that range is 180,000. And I believe um, the uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife has a report that they'll pro be providing um, later that is relevant to this issue. 
Klamath River Fall Chinook uh, is consider con currently considered overfished um, and managed is managed under a rebuilding plan that includes the harvest control rule described in the FMP. Um, given that the 2022 forecast abundance in, in uh, consistent with the harvest control rule, 2022 ocean fisheries would be managed under a de minimis provisions. The FMP requires that the council consider eight factors in setting that allowable de minimis exploitation rate. Um, and those are described in the guidance letter and also outlined in the FMP. Um, given the status, performance, and outlook for the stock in 2022, NIMS encourages the council to take a cautious approach and carefully consider the factors described in the FMP in setting the exploitation rate limit. Um, for California Coastal Chinook, um, as we have discussed in the past last year, the data for this ESU is very limited, such that the ocean salmon fisheries are managed using a proxy based on uh, Klamath River Fall Chinook. Um, and that proxy limit is to not exceed a projected uh, uh, Klamath River Fall Chinook age four ocean harvest rate of 16%. Data remain insufficient to develop an ESU specific conservation objective for the ESU. So we are continuing to rely on that project proxy to manage impacts in ocean fisheries. Um, and the um, standard remains the 16% age four um, KRFC harvest rate. The model was updated last year to address a, 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 a bias in the estimates of the KRFC age four ocean harvest rate that had resulted in impacts exceeding the age four ocean harvest rate in recent years. Um, we want to express our appreciation for a lot of the work that at the STT did in a very short amount of time to try to address the issue. And we had every reason to expect the updated data inputs to the model would bring the ocean harvest rate into better alignment. There was a significant amount of work, science and analysis that went into the model adjustments that were made. However, the postseason estimate of the 2021 um, Klamath River Fall Chinook age four ocean harvest rate was 27%, substantially exceeding the ESA consultation limit of 16%. The magnitude and consistency of the deviations in recent years are of a great concern. Um, as indicated in the table in the guidance letter, over the last three years, the preseason estimate has been an average of 40% over 40% uh, of the postseason estimate. So, in other words, the postseason estimate has um, consistently exceeded um, the preseason uh, uh, estimate by uh, sort of a consistent amount. Um, so therefore, um, although the council salmon fisheries in 2022 should be managed to not exceed the Klamath River Fall Chinook age four ocean harvest rate of 16%. So in other words, the consultation standard does not change. However, given the pattern of exceedance in recent years to ensure that ocean harvest rates do not exceed the consultation standard, fisheries should be managed using a buffer of 40% on the preseason target ocean um, harvest rate. And so again, that is based on the observed um, exceedances in those uh, last uh, three to four years. This would result in a preseason target that will achieve postseason attainment of 16% given the pattern of recent model performance. So no, that's a, a lot to take in. So just to give you an example, um, I believe last year uh, the preseason target was 11%, but just to keep it simple in the math, um, if if you were to, if the preseason target was expected to be 10%, um, the fisheries would be adjusted so that they would actually be managed for a 6%. So given the 40, the tendency to, to um, um, under predict by 40%, that should result in a limit under the 16%. Um, unless, and so there's a second part to this, um, unless the council and its advisory bodies ad identify management measures or further model adjustments that, that the best available information indicates would have the same degree of certainty of keeping the postseason estimate of the age four harvest rate at or below the 16% for 2022 ocean salmon fisheries. Um, so to clarify that last point, um, it's an either or, so it's not a both. So the sort of the default that we're looking for is the, it we're looking at right now is the 40% buffer. Um, but we are aware that um, folks are working on um, 
model adjustments that might provide that same level of certainty or potentially um, uh, management measures that could do the same thing. Um, so we're looking for sort of one or the other of those things, not both. And sort of skipping down to uh, uh, to Central Valley Spring Chinook uh, ESU. Just to clarify, yesterday we had some discussion on the floor of sort of looking forward to 2023 and things that we might be, analysis that we might do to get ahead of a, um, what looks like a poor return in 2023. But for 2022 fisheries, our um, guidance is uh, that the control rule for Sacramento winter run Chinook should be sufficiently protective for this year. Um, Lower Columbia River Chinook ESU, um, uh, um, we don't anticipate additional actions to protect the spring run or bright run components of the ESU, expecting the states to manage their in-river fisheries to meet the goals. And that specifically the council should continue to manage ocean fisheries such that when combined with fisheries in state waters, the escapement goal of 5,700 Chinook salmon to the North Fork Lewis River is met. For Thule's, um, based on the, the abundance um, harvest matrix, uh, um, let's see, sorry, I lost my place. Um, uh, council fisheries in 2022 should be managed such that the total exploitation rate on Lower Columbia River Thule Chinook salmon in all ocean fisheries and all main stem Columbia River fisheries below Bonneville Dam, those fisheries combined, does not exceed a 38% um, exploitation rate. Uh, skipping down a little bit further to Puget Sound Chinook salmon. Um, NIMS is currently reviewing a 10-year uh, Chinook resource management plan developed by the Puget Sound co-managers. And I want to extend my congratulations to the co-managers for completion of that plan. It was a difficult journey and it was a lot of difficult conversations and good collaborations is my understanding. So um, uh, congratulations for a significant achievement. Um, however, NEMS's review of the new plan under the provisions of the Endangered Species Act will not be completed prior to the 2022 fishing season. Um, so therefore, 20, uh, um, for 2022, NEMS expects to consult on proposed actions related solely to the 2022 Puget Sound salmon fishing season um, and any impacts in ocean fisheries. So this is um, what we've typically done over the last several years. We've done a one-year biological opinion based on that year's, that results of that year's preseason planning. For 2022, council salmon fisheries should be managed such that exploitation rates on Puget Sound spring and fall Chinook salmon populations do not exceed three and 6% respectively. Additionally, the council should, de should determine that its fisheries, when combined with the suite of other fisheries impacting the Puget Sound Chinook Salmon ESU meet the conservation objectives identified in Table 4 of our guidance le letter. For the Skagit Summer Fall, Stillaguamish, Puyallup, and Midhood Canal Management Units, you will see um, that, that there, aren't, there is not an objective specified for those management units in Table 4. Discussions will continue between um, NIMS and the Puget Sound co-managers during the preseason planning process for the Council Fisheries and Puget Sound Fisheries. NIMS will provide further guidance to the Council as necessary during the March and April meetings to ensure that the fishery package that develops during the preseason process provides similar levels of conservation for each of these populations as has been provided in recent years. Um, and to let the Council know the conversations between NIMS and um, the co-managers in general, but those uh, co-managers involved in those watersheds in particular um, are ongoing and we have made um, substantive progress. Uh, for Oregon Coast, both the Oregon Coast Coho Salmon ESU and the Lower Columbia River Coho Salmon ESUs are both managed also under abundance-based matrices um, based on measures of parental escapement and marine survival. For Oregon Coast Salmon, um, that's uh, measured relative to three sub-aggregates of stocks within the ESU. Ocean fisheries are limited to the status of the weakest sub-aggregate. Um, in 2022, the total exploitation rate in marine and freshwater salmon fisheries are limited to no more than 15% for the north-central sub-aggregate. For the northern and south-central sub-aggregates, the total exploitation rate in 2022 marine and freshwater salmon fisheries is limited to no more than 30%. So there are some additional um, impacts available for inland fisheries for those two sub-aggregates. 
Uh, for the Lower Columbia River coho salmon ESU uh, for the 2022 season, salmon uh, co council salmon fisheries should be managed such that, such that the total exploitation rate in all mm -hmm. salmon fisheries below Bonneville Dam does not exceed 23%. Getting close to the end. Um, for uh, uh, Southern Oregon, Northern California coho ESU, um, salmon fisheries in 2022 should be managed consistent with the harvest control rules adopted by the council at its January 2022 emergency meeting with total exploitation rate limits of 16% for the Trinity population unit and 15% for each of the remaining individual populations within the ESU as represented by the Rogue River, Scott River, Shasta River, Freshwater Creek, and Bogus Creek. Coho-directed fisheries and coho retention in Chinook-directed fisheries should continue to remain prohibited in the EEZ off of California. Um, as our, um, mentioned in our NIMS report yesterday, NIMS is working on a new biological opinion on the effects of the ocean fisheries under the FMP, which would include those full harvest control rules. Um, uh, it is possible because we're doing the consultation and we have yet to complete that that new information may arise in the course of completing our consultation that may refine our guidance. And should that occur, we will make every effort to provide that information to the council and co-managers as quickly as possible as we expect to complete the opinion prior to promulgating the 2022 regulations. And then finally, um, for Southern resident killer whales, uh, in November of 2020, the council adopted Amendment 21 to the Salmon FMP, which provides additional protections to Southern resident killer whales in years when the abundance falls below a low abundance threshold. The low abundance threshold is calculated using both the FRAM model um, as informed by the Chinook stock distributions provided um, by what we have call, we're called the Shelton et al. model. Uh, we understand that both models have recently been updated. Section 6.6.8 of the FMP sort of includes what we, what, what I would call an adaptive management strategy. Um, so um, sort of, in other words, we anticipated that this might occur, that models and um, data would be updated periodically. Um, for the killer whale low abundance threshold, <clears throat> excuse me, that anticipates that, that may, it might be updated. Um, and the FMP language reads, if a technical review of the best scientific information available provides evidence that in the view of the STT, the SSC, and the council, a modification of the estimated value of the TS1 starting abundance estimates for the seven lowest years is necessary to be consistent with the best available scientific information, the council may adopt an updated value for the threshold which will be reported in the preseason process. <clears throat> so our guidance is that during its March meeting, the council should follow the process outlined in section 6.6.8 of the FMP to one, determine whether a review of the best scientific information available indicates or may indicate that a, a modification of the Chinook low abundance threshold is necessary and the timeline over which that re review would occur and to estimate and report the preseason adult Chinook salmon abundance based on the 2022 forecasts for each of five spatial areas, north of Falcon, the Salish Sea, southwest um, coast Vancouver Island, Oregon coastal waters, and California coastal waters. NIMS should compare the 2022 abundance estimates for the north of Falcon area to the low abundance threshold. If the, 2020, if the 2022 abundance estimates for North of Falcon is less than the low abundance threshold, the council should implement the management measures as described by the FMP through Amendment 21. We also acknowledge the state's commitment as stated in the FMP to implement management measures in state waters through state regulatory processes when the projected abundance is below the threshold. That concludes, excuse me, that concludes um, my overview of the NIMS guidance letter. There is, as Robin mentioned, a PowerPoint that follows, um, that goes into a bit more detail about the, what we know of the information um, and, and potential impacts to the threshold. This is preliminary information. The presentation would be given by Jeremy Jordan, Jordan just in, in a, in a 
um, attempt to ex explain some of what is in our guidance letter and provide some additional um, information to the council. Very good. Thank you, Susan. Questions for Susan on the guidance letter? Oh, uh, Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks, uh, Susan, for that report. Um, my question is uh, regarding the southern resident killer whale um, threshold. Um, I'm, I'm trying to understand here the the the, the Fram model has has been updated since the threshold was set through our previous discussions. Um, however, my understanding is there's still work being done on the update relative to the Shelton model. And I, I'm going to see if that's a question. If that is true, uh, would we see a revised threshold that we would use for 2022 based on the updated FRAM model? Um, and that might be further informed for 2023 with changes to the Shelton model. Is that, a, I'm just trying to understand those, understanding that those two models play into that threshold if I understand the sequence and what we might expect. Thank, thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Anderson, uh, through the vice chair. Um, just a little bit of a nuance on the first part of that. So the FRAM model has been updated and I understand, you know, reviewed um, by both the co-managers and the SCT is familiar with it, although I would defer to, to the co-managers and the uh, SCT to speak more about that. Um, the Shelton model has been updated, um, uh, is, has been updated for the fall, shock, uh, fall stock distribution. There is some ongoing work that likely will not be available for the next couple of years, probably, with regard to spring Chinook. Um, you know, again, not uh, just looking to a crystal ball, but not making any uh, commitments that that any adjustments from that work is not as likely to be as substantial um, as the uh, adjustments from that were made recently. And you'll see that in Jeremy's um, presentation. Um, so it, and it is new, uh, relatively new to the council as opposed to the FRAM model, for example. Um, and uh, I think the SSTT has uh, probably an SSC has some more to weigh in on that. Um, but uh, is less familiar to the council than the FRAM model. And, and what uh, the adjustments that have, may have come out of that uh, component in, with regard to the updating of the threshold. So, so can I just follow up? So um, what I'm trying to understand is whether we're going to have a new threshold for use in 2022 and if so, when will we see, find out what that new threshold is and whether or not it comes into play for our preseason setting, uh, season setting process? Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Um, so, based on the language that is in the FMP, um, that is largely up to the council. Um, so the FMP language reads, if in the um, if in the view of the STT, the council, and the SSC, the threshold uh, requires updating after a technical review, uh, then um, then that would occur. Um, I believe that with regard to that, some additional information may be helpful in answering your question. Um, if if you'll just indulge that, so Jeremy's presentation I think will be very helpful. Um, my quick read of the STT report indicated that that may also provide some additional information directly relevant to your question, um, and that maybe we can circle back on that once we have that information, if, if that would be okay with you. Okay. Anyone else? Oh, uh, Danny. Yeah, that's a Danny. Yeah. 
in that same topic, um, Ms. Bishop, it said in there that that new paper, the Shelton paper was attached and I didn't see it as an attachment. Is there a way uh, we could get a copy to see what the changes are? Yes, we can provide that to Robin um, for distribution. Thank you, Ms. Bishop. I tried to follow the link, but couldn't get access. So that would be helpful. Thank you, Ms. Evanson. My phone is lighting up, so I think it is on its way. <laughs> How's that for service? <laughs> Thank you, Daddy. Okay, further questions for Susan? Okay, not see any hands. Oh, Marcy Remco, Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, good morning, Susan. Thank you uh, for the presentation. Um, I've been trying to follow along um, the discussions that have taken place in the STT and SAS rooms um, since yesterday on the age four Klamath guidance. And I'm hoping that maybe you can just take us um, a little, you, you can help us a little bit here on the floor and maybe summarize the situation with regard to um, whether uh, under the guidance it's either ensure ocean harvest rates do not exceed 16 percent Fishery should be managed using a buffer of 40% on the preseason target ocean harvest rate unless the council and its advisory bodies identify management measures or further model adjustments that the best available information indicates would have the same effect of keeping the postseason estimate of the harvest rate on Klamath H4 at or below 16%. So I know there's been a lot of work going on and I, I appreciate the discussions that have taken place. I know they've been um, <laughs> frantic and difficult and um, there's a lot of technical work to do on this piece, but maybe you can just put this up on where things are at right now. Um, are, are we going to be modeling with the updated model to a goal of 16%? Or, or only 40% of 16%. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yurimko. The consultation standard is 16%, but NEMS is looking at taking additional cautious actions to ensure that that limit is not exceeded again, as it has been in the last several years. Um, and again, there was a lot of work done to ensure that that was not the case. Um, I know that uh, the STT is doing some further looking at adjusting the KOHM model. Um, so the, the uh, consultation standard is still the 16%, but we're looking for additional actions or model adjustments to be taken um, to ensure that that rate is not exceeded. Um, that could be um, some model uh, adjustments uh, to the model adjustments for on them, their own, or it could be a combination of model adjustments and management actions or management actions. But at the end of the day, NIMS will be, will, the, will need to work with the managers so that the information and documentation that's presented indicates that we have a significant certainty of not exceeding that 16% uh, in 2022. So if I may, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, thank you. Um, okay, yes, understood. Thanks, Susan. Um, so you, you talked about the documentation. Um, so I guess, does that mean that you'd be like looking at last year's KOHM and seeing a number of 16% and then this year's KOHM and seeing a number equivalent that it, or I think you know what I'm saying is the comparison with last year's KOHM and the to, to assess if the new model modifications are expected to attain that 40% reduction 
or the 40% of the 16%? In other words, how how do we how at the end of the day are we going to show that we've applied this buffer? Thank you, Mr. Rimko, for the question. Um, my understanding is just having some preliminary discussions with both the STT and um, some of of your very helpful staff is that there's several ways that we might be we might do this. Um, so my intent is to sit down with them this afternoon and go through what they have done so far and what might be planned and to get a sense of um, what the results are, the, uh, the outcomes so far and what else might be needed, if anything. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Susan. Um, I'll look forward to hearing about that in our next step. I understand it's a lot to try to accomplish uh, in a short amount of time. And if um, if we don't have certainty yet, that that makes sense to me. I just, I wanna make sure that um, the expectations are clear um, to the STT, to the SAS, to us, um, so that when we're all said and done, we've accomplished, um, as, as your guidance has indicated, that we are expected to, to stay within that 16% that is required by the biological opinion. So I appreciate the work, I appreciate the goal, and um, just looking forward to learning a little more about the execution. So thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Um, Chris, Chris? Thank, thanks, Mr. Chair. And it's a, it's the same topic, but I just want to make sure I've got it clear. Um, there already has been a model revision, and I understand there may, notwithstanding, there may still be some refinement going on. And my understanding is that model revision was already incorporated as the preseason report one basis for climate impacts. Um, and so Point being, it feels to me, if I understand things correctly, we're already well down the road of incorporating the new model with a shortened time frame that has at least some effect on the buffer discussion. So it's 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 likely to achieve at least some amount of the 40%. And so the question now appears to me to be how much of it and is there more work to do in other arenas? And I don't need the confirmation of how we're gonna do that. I, I heard what you know we just discussed, but. Is that the picture that others are seeing uh, that are familiar with where we're at on this, or am I wrong? Uh, thank you, Mr. Kern. And I would look to uh, California staff as well. Um, uh, my understanding is yes, the, there has been some model adjustments to the KOHM model. Um, I have not had time to familiarize with myself with those, so that's sort of the reference I uh, I talked about, I know there are ongoing discussions among the, the managers as well. So um, I, uh, uh, that are, have, they're substantial. So um, I expect a good conversation when we talk later this afternoon. Um, and I do look forward to, to working with both, uh, both states uh, and the managers in doing that and uh, appreciate the uh, help that has been provided so far. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Further questions for Susan? Okay. No. Oh, Marcy. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I just wanted to move to a, a different topic off the KOHM. I just want to turn back to Sunk Coho. Um, I understand there been there's been quite a bit of progress on this front as well. Um, but maybe Susan, I'm hoping you can clarify for me. Um, when we left the emergency meeting in January, um, I understood that the inputs uh, that would be provided um, by the tribal co-managers would involve uh, a three-year postseason average of the most recent years or close to the most recent years, kind of pending some evaluation of a few outliers um, and that that would be, I, I know there, the information, you know, they're in the process of updating that information and that once the, um, the inland inputs were available, then we would have knowledge of um, 
how much of the 16% constraint um, on the Trinity stocks um, would be left and available for ocean fisheries uh, this this year in 2022. Um, can you just confirm that that's what's happened and that um, maybe you can let us know um, what the expected um, ocean component of that total ER will be for this year? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Yarimko. Um, the the motion as I as adopted that I recall did not speak to a specific year range. Um, it indicated that uh, the um, uh, freshwater inputs, uh, the in-river exploitation rate, population specific inputs would be determined using projections by the Fram model um, and would be provided by the parties. Um, so I don't believe that it, I know that the, that during the work group process and then um, some iterations of the work group report, there had been mention of a three year rolling average as a, an example of what might be um, uh, provided. But in the final motion, as I read it, um, it did not specify a specific year range or a specific approach, only that those projections would be provided by the co-managing agencies. Um, what I would leave it to the, managers or the STT to uh, uh, report out on what the status of those conversations are, but I do understand from talking to both that there's been substantive progress made uh, in getting the necessary inputs to the model to uh, uh, do the model runs and to determine how that, uh, what the outcome is relative to the control rule requirements. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Susan. That that sounds great. I, I too had heard there was quite a bit of progress, so we'll look forward to hearing more from the STP. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Marcy. Further questions? Okay. With that, we'll go to uh, Jeremy Jordy uh, for the PowerPoint presentation. Jeremy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll ask if you can hear me okay. We can. All right, appreciate that. So uh, Jeremy Jordan here with National Marine Fisheries Services Sustainable Fisheries Division, and today I'll be using this PowerPoint to assist with um, explaining our guidance relative to southern resident killer whales this year, like Susan had mentioned. After my presentation is over, I understand it will be added to the briefing book so that it's easily accessible for uh, people to refer back to. So with that, uh, next slide, please. So our, the intent here with this presentation is just to inform everyone today on information that NIMFS is aware of that could be considered in an update to the Chinook Low Abundance Threshold numeric value. Uh, next slide, please. So recall that with Amendment 21, the council set up a strategy within the salmon FMP for addressing uh, effects of council salmon fisheries on southern resident killer whales. This was done by establishing a Chinook abundance threshold in the North Falcon area that would be annually calculated based on preseason forecasted abundance. And if abundance was calculated to be lower than the threshold in a given year, uh, additional management measures spelled out in the FMP would be taken. Uh, the models used to do this, as mentioned earlier, are the Fishery Regulation Assessment Model, FRAM, and what's uh, referred to as the Shelton et al. model or Shelton model. The threshold the council developed uh, was responsive to concern uh, NIMS had for the southern resident killer whales is it was based on a very specific set of years that exhibited various scenarios of low Chinook abundance trends while simultaneously um, taking into account the biology of the southern residents, uh, incorporating several periods of back-to-back -back years in the original calculation and uh, thereby tying it to 
uh, killer whale biology as well as Chinook abundance. Uh, next slide, please. So the work group that the council tasked with assisting them on developing this strategy advised that the numerical value would likely change over time, uh, particularly as the models used in both its development and now its calculation uh, were expected to continue to receive updated information over time. Uh, this type of forward thinking, I think what was termed uh, adaptive management earlier, was captured in the FMP uh, through the amendment, uh, which as also mentioned earlier is contained in section 6.6.8, .6 and I've pulled a screenshot out for this slide. Um, I'm not gonna read this entire screenshot, but reiterate a uh, summation that it describes that if a technical review provides evidence in the view of the STT, SSC, and council that modification of the value is warranted, the council may adopt an updated value. Now this section of the FMP also explains that the North Falcon um, time step one values are to be reported each preseason. Uh, next slide, please. So in earlier floor discussion by Ms. Bishop, you know, the mention that FRAM was one of the two models that are used to annually calculate the thresholds um, adherence. FRAM has been used for quite some time now in the council's preseason process and postseason reporting and has gone through various updates over the years. Uh, it's the model that calculates the pre-fishery abundance in time step one or October one uh, for the North Falcon area using the annual stock abundances. And in 2020, when the threshold was being established, the version of FRAM that was used was version 6.2. Whereas now we understand there is a version 7.1.1 available, which is expected to be used for this year's preseason planning process. Now, those numbers will just be important for remembering in some of the upcoming slides. So next slide, please. Now, again, the other model used here is generally referred to as uh, what we call the Shelton model. We use this model to distribute the fish uh, temporarily and spatially along the coast. This slide depicts the boxes and areas where they are distributed. Apologies if it's small and you're viewing this on a, on a laptop. Um, but the version of the model that was used in developing the original threshold calculation was from a paper published in 2019. We are aware now that a paper was published last year with updates uh, to the Shelton distributions for fall Chinook along the coast. Also, apologies up front, people who couldn't access the paper in the link um, in our guidance letter on page 17. I'm aware that we are trying to get folks a, a copy here shortly if that already hasn't occurred. So um, next slide, please. Given the council's less familiar with the Shelton model as its use in council business is relatively brand new and only for this application, I'll explain a bit about what is new in its update. First, it contains updates to stock distributions that better reflect the expected abundances in the North Falcon area. This matches other sources of data as it as an example, this slide mentions the Columbia River Bright Chinook stock, which is classified as a far north migrating stock, and the update better reflects that pattern, meaning a stock like this would be less likely to be present in the North Falcon area in time step one, because this stock is uh, quite large uh, from the Columbia River. It, it therefore effectively lowers the abundance that would be in the North of Falcon area across the entire data set. That expectation from the update applies both currently and historically, but it doesn't change the considerations for establishing the threshold that I went over earlier. Anticipating, you know, the question of why does an update change the spatial patterns? 
Um, this slide depicts some of the major and important lists of reasons why the Shelton model updates these patterns. The prior version, the 2019 version, used 454 code wire tag groups to represent Chinook stocks, where the new model uses 1,400. This went from 2,100 code wire tag codes in the 2019 version to over 8,000 code wire tag codes in the 2021 version. And the 2021 version also incorporated 20 additional years of code wire tag recovery data. So it's about uh, three times the amount of data. Uh, the update, the updates do not, however, alter the pattern of abundance high and lows, which I'm going to walk through the next few slides as an attempt at an animated way of showing um, this exact situation. So with that, next slide, please. This slide depicts the original calculation using FRAM version 6.2 and the 2019 Shelton model. The years are the y-axis, and time step one north of Falcon Chinook abundance is the x-axis. The dashed line is abundance over time, and the solid line here is the threshold calculation. So I'll let you know you take a look at this for a bit and just show you what happens in a and I would ask if there we go, Sandra. Appreciate that. Now I will show you what happens in a stepwise fashion if updates to Fram and Shelton might be incorporated. Next slide, please. And so I know it's maybe difficult to see the transition, but this slide depicts what would happen to the abundance estimates and the threshold if you just apply a FRAM update from version 6.2 to version 7.1.1. You can see there is little change to the abundance threshold. It slightly increases as on this slide, the orange a solid line is still the abundance over time, and the solid orange line is the uh, estimated new abundance. And you can also see on this slide that the same number of times the threshold is triggered occurs relative to the original depicted by the three red circles in this slide. So now that you see what happens if we were to just apply updates to FRAM in the calculation, the next slide will show us what happens when we add the updates to the Shelton model. I just walked you through a few slides ago. This slide now shows in the gray solid line what happens to the north of Falcon salmon abundances in time step one and what a new threshold would be calculated as uh, by the gray dashed line. Here you get the visual sense that Shelton has pulled all the values down across the data set. But you can see what I was explaining before in depicting these graphs that the patterns of highs and lows don't alter. And most importantly, maybe the instances when the threshold would have been triggered from a retrospective point of view would not change either by the three red circles on the lower part of this slide. Again, um, I guess while I can't see anyone's faces while giving this presentation, I'm still, I guess, expecting folks to be asking yourself, huh, why, why did that happen? Next slide, please. So what this slide depicts are the same changes that occur going from FRAM version 6.2 and Shelton 2019, but across the five spatial boxes that we request be reported during the preseason process. 
The Fram update changes abundances slightly as uh, the first parenthetical on the bottom in the change from the first pie chart to the middle pie chart depicts. But what it does not do is distribute fish. Those stay in their respective spatial boxes um, as seen here by the different slices between pie number one and pie number two uh, being the same. The red arrow points to the north of falcon piece of the pie, which is green. The other pieces are the Salish Sea is the teal slice in the upper right portion. Uh, the Oregon coast is the orange portion. The California coast is the purple portion. And um, the the north, which is areas just all north of the Salish Sea, is the large light blue portion. What you can see here is that the Fram update is actually increasing the abundance overall by an average uh, about 5%. So the pie is actually larger. Then why did the line graph show lower values in just the prior slide when you apply a Shelton update. Well, as you move through these pie charts going um, from left to right, you'll see in the last pie chart that the distributions uh, change the size of the slices. And what that effectively means is that it's moving fish from the north of Falcon and Oregon coast slices to the Salish and north slices. That is why the values in the prior slide shift and hopefully connects the dots for you as to why I said updates to more uh, far northerly migrating stocks uh, made a difference earlier. Another way to think of the prior slides with the line graphs is that they are only showing the abundance patterns for just the green north of falcon slice in each one of these uh, pie charts. Next slide, please. Now, while trying to let this information sink in a little, an important aspect to remember is that the threshold doesn't necessarily by itself, the models that calculate it contain that connection to southern resident um, killer well data, except for the years chosen. And the years that were specifically chosen to establish the threshold provide that connection, as I described earlier in the presentation. In the slides I depicted earlier with the red circles showing the frequency of the threshold being triggered, those use the same exact years that are listed in the FMP for the original thresholds calculation. Updating those years to a different set would not maintain these connections in the consideration of consecutive years, scenarios of abundances the whales might experience. So for this reason, NIMS is recommending to continue to use the exact same seven years when calculating the threshold that are listed in the FMP, uh, which are also listed on this slide. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the last slide in the presentation, uh, which reiterates and captures our guidance that Ms. Bishop went over earlier. Uh, to summarize, there's a process captured within the FMP describing uh, adaptive management to address how modification of the numeric value of the threshold might be updated after review process. Uh, but hopefully to maybe clear things up, I guess, regardless of incorporating updates to the models or not. NIMS is still requesting estimating and reporting the pre-fishing time step one adult Chinook abundance based on 2022 forecast for each of the five spatial areas defined by the work group. And if the 2022 abundance is less than the calculated threshold in the North Falcon area, then the Council should implement the management measures in the FMP that uh, adoption of Amendment 21 incorporated. And with that, I'll stop and ask if there are any questions I might be able to answer. Okay. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, questions for Jeremy on the presentation? Okay. 
I'm not seeing any hands. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Um, I've got a request for a short break. I don't think everybody necessarily got to the bathroom right after closed session. So um, we'll take a 10 minute break and be back here at um, 10.03.
Okay, uh, council members, uh, take their seats, please. We'll get started. I'm herding cats, I tell you. Okay, I think we're ready to go here. On the, we're back on D3, and I'm looking to uh, Joe Oatman and the tribal report. Joe. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. So as the uh, tribal rep representative here to the council, I have uh, one tribal report that I would like to address. So this one will be the supplemental tribal report two the testimony on behalf of the Columbia River Treaty Tribes before the PFMC. At this time, I'd like to uh, invite here to the virtual table, uh, Bruce Jim, representative from Warm Springs and Stuart Ellis, Critic staff. And there may be other uh, commissioners um, online. Uh, so there, there may be others that could be joining them. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. All right. Thank you, Joe. And uh, let's see, are we, uh... Bruce, are you there? Good. Oh. Yeah, uh, good morning. Can you hear us? We, we can, welcome. Great. Okay, all right, go ahead, Bruce. Good morning, members of the council. Uh, once again, we're all together. Uh, my name is Bruce Jim Sr. I'm the chair of the Warm Springs off Reservation Fish and Wildlife Committee and Commissioner with the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. I've been asked <clears throat> to present this statement on behalf of the four Columbia River tribes with uh, federally recognized treaty fishing rights. The Yakima Nation, the Confederated Tribes of Umatilla Reservation, the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, and uh, the Nespers Tribe. Our tribes and bands <clears throat> signed the treaties with the United States in the 1850s in which we specifically reserved the right to hunt and fish and gather food in all our usual and accustomed places. These places include not only areas upstream and of Bonneville Dam, but also areas downstream of Bonneville Dam and even in the Willamette Basin area. Our treaty reserve fishing rights have been adjudicated in the U.S. versus Oregon 
for off reservation fisheries because we have federally recognized fishing rights. We are considered co-managers along with the state and federal managers within the PFMC forum. In the Consul Salmon Fishery Management Plan, it states that one of the objectives is to fulfill obligations for Indian harvest. For example, fulfill obligations to provide for Indian harvest opportunity as provided for in treaties with the United States as mandated by applicable decisions of the federal courts. With respect to the Columbia River Treaty tribes, the Salmon FMP acknowledges that current 2018 to 27 U.S. versus Oregon Management Agreement provides framework for relevant parties, where relevant parties may exercise their sovereign powers in a coordinated and systematic manner in order to protect, rebuild, and enhance Upper Columbia River fish runs while providing harvest for both treaty and non-treaty fisheries. Today marks the 65th anniversary of the flooding of Salala Falls in 1957, when the gates of the Dallas Dam was lowered. For us, the English language does not have words, the words to capture this event. The effect it continues to have on tribal people and tribal culture. Each year we lose more elders who saw, heard, and knew the falls. These elders remember where they were and what they were doing when the falls was flooded. Many people gathered along the hills overlooking the falls to view the flooding. But some people were so devastated they could not bear to leave their homes that day, which was a, a example of my grandfather, who was the chief at that time at Celilo, uh, had gotten me and uh, told me, and uh, we went into the house and stayed in the house because we didn't want to watch, uh, or he didn't want to watch the falls being covered. That's where he lived all his life. But, you know, <clears throat> they, uh, to know the stories of parents and grandparents who shared about this special place. And while it's important to remember this event, it must also be remembered that dam construction in the Columbia Basin, both in the main stem and tributaries, flooded numerous fishing sites, village sites, which displaced many tribal peoples often with little or no compensation for or mitigation. The damage is much wider than simply at Celilo. The government had made many promises over the last many decades for mitigation that there would always be plenty of fish for tribal fisheries. These promises have never been fulfilled. However, and these Dams are only made of concrete, and concrete does not last forever. We look forward to renewed discussions regarding the possible removal of the lower river, lower Snake River dams. <clears throat> Healing the Columbia River will continue will continue to take enormous work by all of us, not only in the dealing with mainstream issues, but also issues in the tributaries. The tribes have done a lot of, a great deal of work in expanding hatchery productions and improving habitat conditions to recover these fish runs. The work that the tribes have done to rebuild these runs is work that should have been done by the people who have done the damage to the fish runs and shouldn't have been the responsibility or burden of the tribes. Regarding this year's ocean fishery proposal, we remind the Council that the forecast of salmon abundance in the ocean fisheries are just that, their forecasts. Unlike the Columbia River forecasts, 
ocean fisheries cannot be adjusted based on actual run sizes of fish. They, be, they depend on the forecast that's been made. Last year, the upriver bright run returned was only 68% of its preseason forecast, and the Columbia River coho abundance was only 52% of forecast. It is not uncommon for runs to return significantly more or less than forecast. And this produces uncertainty in the modeling of ocean fisheries and can, re can result in ocean fisheries having an unexpected impacts on various stocks compared to pre-season models. We continue to urge caution in planning of ocean fisheries. We also remind the Council that under the terms of U.S. versus Oregon Management Agreement, all non-treaty fishery impacts on the upper Columbia, Summer Chinook, and the ocean fisheries south of U.S. Canada borders along with non-treaty fisheries in river fisheries. All count towards a non-treaty harvest limit for this stock. The Colville Tribal Fishery had catches a summer Chinook also count. <clears throat> the Colville Tribal Fishery catches of summer Chinook also count as part of the non treaty harvest. Because of the wide area and time frame in which this harvest occurs, it is important that the states manage fisheries affecting this stock very carefully. We'll be reviewing this fishery modeling as it becomes available and may offer additional comments relative to ocean opinions options later. That concludes my statement for today. And uh, take any questions. Thank you, Bruce, um, for your testimony today. Um, Chris Kerr. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. I didn't have a question, but wanted to thank Bruce, uh, as usual, for the testimony and note that um, may not always be the case, but it seems to be the case that the um, March Council meeting almost always encompasses the anniversary date of the flooding of Celilo. So appreciate you reminding us of that, Bruce, and look forward to seeing you and, and other folks at some point in the near future, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Any questions for, uh, for, for Bruce? Okay. Thank you, Bruce and uh, Stuart for coming here today and uh, I just uh, really appreciate your input and bringing us. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yep. Yeah, remind us about our obligations. So, okay. Um, with that, we'll go to um, the state reports, WDFW and tribal report, I believe, uh, joint report, and uh, I believe Kyle Addix. Kyle? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I'll be referencing agenda item D3E, Supplemental WDFW Tribal Recommendations. As provided for in Amendment 14 and pursuant to rules and procedure, procedures established under US v. Washington, the Washington Department of Fish and, Fish and Wildlife and the affected Puget Sound tribes have established management objectives for Puget Sound Chinook salmon and coho salmon, with the exception of the Mid-Hood Canal Chinook Management Unit. That management objective is the subject of ongoing discussion among the state and tribal co-managers and NOAA. The management objectives applicable to the 2022 regulation setting process based on this year's forecast are presented in the following tables. The management objectives define the maximum impact levels allowed for the 2022 to 23 salmon fisheries and are based on a similar approach and methods as the objectives provided to the council the past several years. For Puget Sound Chinook salmon, the management objectives in Table 1 are part of the proposed harvest management plan developed by the tribes in WDFW that is currently under review by NOAA. The tribes in WDFW expect that fishing considered by the Council for the 2022 to 23 seasons will be consistent with these objectives. For Puget Sound coho salmon primary natural management units, the management objectives in Table 2 are consistent with the 2009 revision of the Puget Sound co-managers comprehensive coho management plan. The Strait of Juan de Fuca and Snohomish management units are currently under rebuilding plans and will be managed accordingly. This includes a minimum escapement target of 55,000 Snohomish coho. While that target escapement level may not be achievable based on the forecasted abundance, it is the expectation that fisheries will be managed to promote escapement towards that level. 
I won't um, try to read through the tables for you as um, Ms. Bishop acknowledged, um, the co-managers did recently complete a 10-year resource management plan that has been submitted for NOAA's review. The intent is to use the objectives from that plan in 2022. The table kind of focuses in on exploitation rate limits for the expected abundances this year. Um, should a escapement or abundance threshold change through preseason planning, the, the, the provisions of the RMP would kick in. Um, and it, it's not a comprehensive table. There are escapement objectives associated with some of these pre-terminal um, Southern US exploitation rates that need to be met um, to have fisheries up to those levels. On the table two, the coho table, again, um, I mentioned we have two of those stocks that are under rebuilding plans. The rebuilding plan for Snow Homish included an increase in the escapement breakpoint from 50,000 to 55,000. So a um, higher escapement needed to trigger a higher exploitation rate ceiling. But the co-managers have been managing fisheries well below the exploitation rate ceiling, really trying to boost escapement back up to 55,000 as quickly as we can. So that um, concludes my report. I'm happy to try to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Kyle. Um, questions for Kyle on the uh, joint report? Oh, uh, Susan, uh, Bishop, Susan. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, just a point of clarification, Kyle, you just referred to the table focuses on exploitation rates sort of objectives and acknowledge that there are escapement objectives associated with some of those stocks. In just looking at the table, um, can I just... Um, confirm that maybe those are the sort of Puyallup, Green River, Lake Washington. Uh, are there any others in that table that that might apply? And those escapement goals are, it sounds like described in the RMP um, that has been provided. Thanks for the question. Um, yes, the, the central Puget Sound units, the Green, the Puyallup and Lake Washington have escapement objectives associated with allowing that 15% pre-terminal Southern US harvest rate. So terminal fisheries would have to be planned to hit those objectives. There, there may be other um, management units where the Skagit Spring, for example, is a 36% total rate. That's assuming that we're above the low abundance thresholds in the plan. If escapement would, were to fall below those low abundance thresholds, there would be a more conservative, conservative southern U.S. fishery response, and, and all of that is in the RMP. Just thank you for, for that response. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Susan. All right. Thank you, Kyle. We'll move down and I uh, see that uh, Candace Morgenstern has a uh, CDFW report, but I guess it would have maybe Marcy first. Marcy? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, nope, I'll just pass it right on over to Candace. Thank you. Okay, very good. Candace? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. My name is Candace Morgenstern. I'm with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And today I'll be reading agenda item D3D, Supplemental CDFW Report 1, March 2022. California Department of Fish and Wildlife recommendation for Sacramento River Falls Chinook escapement objectives for 2022 fishery planning. <clears throat> for the purposes of planning 2022 ocean salmon fishing seasons, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, CDFW, recommends that all three alternatives be developed to achieve an escapement of no less than 180,000 <clears throat> natural and hatchery adult spawners for Sacramento River Fall Chinook, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, SRFC salmon stock. The conservation objective for SRFC, SRFC as described in the Pacific Coast Salmon Fishery Management Plan, sets an escapement goal range of 122,000 to 180,000 adult spawners to provide adequate escapement of natural hatchery production for Sacramento <clears throat> and San Joaquin fall and late fall stocks based on habitat conditions. <clears throat> Salmon Fishery Management Plan, page 21. CDFW believes the maximum of this range should be targeted for the following reasons. One, after being declared overfished, in 2018, due to chronically low spawner abundance, 
the SRFC stock was only recently declared <clears throat> rebuilt during 2020, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> during 2021. In this first season as a rebuilt stock, total spawning escapement totaled 104,483 adult spawners below the 122,000 minimum level of the escapement goal range. Two, the 2021 realized spawning escapement level, 104,483, was approximately 78% of what was projected, 133,913, to reach hatcheries and the natural spawning areas during the pre-season planning process. While pre versus post-season escapement over time is well correlated, figure one, table one, the pattern of realized escapement falling below pre-season expectations has persisted for several years. Three, over the longer time period, 2006 through 2021, SRFC returns have failed to meet the minimum of the goal range in nine of the last 16 years. Pre one, table B one. In 2022, more assurance is needed that the minimum goal will be attained. Four, since 2010, looking at the relationship between preseason escapement forecast and the returns, although the relationship is strong, the forecast consistently underprojects the resulting escapement. Applying this relationship might suggest that to achieve a return of 122,000 adult returns, a preseason escapement projection of 197,352 adults should be targeted. Figure one. Five. Given that drought is, an, is expected to prevail through 2022, CCIEA Team Report 1, March 2022, H2A, and the role that persistent drought played in SRFC's past overfish determination, June 2019, G1 Attachment 2, targeting a higher abundance this year will help buffer against the longer term effects of drought on the abundance and productivity of the stock. Six, in its annual guidance to the council, the National Marine Fisheries Service requested that alternatives be developed to achieve an escapement at the upper end of the conservation objective range, March 2022, D3B. However, an exact numerical value was not specified. The 2022, the 2022 SRFC forecast exceeded or exceeds the 2021 forecast by approximately 125,000 fish. While this is encouraging news, as a matter of policy, CDFW recommends that <clears throat> most of this surplus be set aside for escapement rather than harvest for the reasons enumerated above. Figure one, preseason projected versus postseason actual escapement for SRFC 2010 through 2021. This figure shows that although there is a strong correlation between preseason projected escapement and realized returns, the postseason value often falls short of preseason project projections. According to the best fit line, 197,352 adult spawners would need to be targeted in order to reach the minimum spawner escapement goal of 122,000 adults. Table one, preseason projected versus postseason actual escapement for SRFC 2010 through 2021. And this table documents preseason versus postseason performance of the SRFC abundance forecast and spawner escapement estimates. For the time series shown, we have seen a trend in overestimating both the preseason abundance and the preseason projected escapement. And that concludes my report. Okay, thank you, Candace. Uh, questions for Candace on the uh, California report? Okay, not seeing any. I will turn to um, Chris Kern of Oregon. You're good? Okay. All right. With that, we'll go to the uh, management teams and AV reports, and we'll start but we'll start off with the um, uh, Supplemental Trial Report 1, uh, Colville, um, and Jared Erickson. Jared. Good morning. Can you hear me? We can. Allow me to... You're good to go on this end, at least you were.
<clears throat> you're, you're muted now, Jared. I think you're muted on your end, Jared. What do you think? Okay. Um, maybe we'll uh, we'll pause uh, with uh, on Jared and uh, go to. We'll go to the uh, SDT report and uh, John Kerry. So Jared, we'll come back to you. Hey, John? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I just want to check to make sure I'm coming through loud enough here. You are. Fantastic. Uh, well, thank you very much and good morning, council members. My name is John Kerry and I'll be reading from agenda item D3E, supplemental STT report one, the salmon technical team report on potential updates to Southern resident killer whale should the prey abundance threshold. In their 2022 guidance letter on the agenda, under agenda item D3B, Supplemental Ninth Report 1, the National Marine Fisheries Service provided guidance regarding ESA-listed southern resident killer whales. As part of this guidance, NIMS indicated that since the adoption of Amendment 21 of the Pacific Coast Salmon Fishery Management Plan in 2020, there have been updates to both the Chinook Fishery Regulation Assessment Model and the Shelton Model 20, uh, sorry, 2019 Ocean Distribution Model. Outputs from each of these models are combined to produce region-specific estimates of pre-fishing Chinook abundance per the methods described in the ad hoc SRKW work group's risk assessment, which in turn were used to derive the threshold for the North of Falcon area that went into effect under Amendment 21 of the FMP. In 2020, when, the, when Amendment 21 of the FMP was adopted, it was acknowledged that there'd likely be future changes to the configurations of both Chinook Fram and the Shelton et al. ocean distribution model. This sentiment is captured in section 668 of the FMP, which indicates that these types of changes, once identified as best scientific information available per technical review of the STT, the SSC, and the Council, may alter the numeric value of the pre-fishing Chinook abundance threshold in the north of Falcon area. Below here, we provide a summary of the recent changes to both Chinook Fram and the Shelton et al. ocean distribution model. So as regards to the Chinook Fram updates, uh, in conducting the analyses contained within their risk assessment, the ad hoc SRKW work group used postseason information for 1992 through 2016 that was derived using round 6.2 of the Chinook Fram base period calibration, which was completed in October 2018. In September 2021, Washington State and Tribal Co-Manager Technical Staff produced a revised base period calibration that also included an expanded postseason model run time series, adding 2017 and 2018 to the existing time series. The updates that were incorporated into the new base period calibration can best be classified as data changes aimed at refining the existing calibration. In addition, there was a small correction that modified the way fishery expansions were calculated during the base period calibration originally calculated on an annual basis, they're now calculated on a time step specific basis. Listed below are the notable updates that are most likely to have affected the starting cohort sizes of FRAM model stocks relevant to computing estimates of ocean of region specific pre-fishing Chinook abundances. Note, however, that there were other refi refinements and corrections associated with this update that are not listed here. So the regional mark information system uh, otherwise known as ARMIS, was requeried for relevant coded wire tag information that contribute to the base period in order to ensure that there are any recent changes were accounted for. Inputs were updated to reflect improved estimates of um, catches in Canadian sport fisheries and improved representation of Snake River Fall Chinook age specific terminal returns. And um, additionally, escapement expansions were also incorporated to account for inner dam loss of Columbia River stocks that originate upstream of Bonneville Dam. The STT understands that the Washington co-managers have conducted extensive review of this updated uh, configuration of the model, which is referred to as round 7.1.1, and they've agreed to its use for 2022 preseason planning. 
In concert with this and with the understanding that the changes incorporated in this update are best characterized as updates to existing data sets, the STT also intends on using round 711 of the Chinook Fram base period calibration for all 2022 preseason modeling tasks and will review components of the update prior to the April Council meeting. The STT appreciates the continued efforts of co-manager technical staff to refine and improve the Chinook Fram base period. With regards to the Shelton et al. Ocean Distribution Model updates, improvements were made to the Shelton et al. Ocean Distribution Model that were peer-reviewed and published in Shelton et al. 2021. Highlights of these changes include the following. Uh, there was expanded coded wire tag data where the updated model used approximately three to four times more coded wire tags and represented about 20 years of more contemporary data. The stock stratification within the model was increased uh, from 12 stock groupings to 16 stock groupings, where specifically the upper Columbia stock group was split into an upriver bright and a snake river component. The Puget Sound and Strait of Georgia stock groups were split into northern and southern components and a select area bright Columbia River stock was added. The spatial stratification of the model was also refined where uh, the central Oregon and southern Oregon regions were combined and a Juan de Fuca region was added. Lastly, a temperature variable was incorporated into the model, which allowed for annual deviations from average stock specific distributions as a function of sea surface temperature. Now, given less familiarity with this model within the STT, there has not been sufficient time to evaluate these changes and determine what level of review may be required, specifically whether methodology review is warranted. So lastly, uh, we have a section on effects to the North of Falcon pre-fishing abundances, abundance threshold and considerations for 2022 preseason planning. With the implementation of round 711 of the Chinook Fram base period, the STT would like to note that proceeding with the numerical threshold of 966,000 as identified in the FMP would result in a disconnect between the threshold and the preseason abundance estimates, as the former will have been derived using Fram round 62 cohort sizes, while the latter will be derived using Fram round 711 cohort sizes. Estimates of pre-fishing Chinook abundance based on 2022 forecasts will be presented for each of the five spatial areas when the STT reports on initial modeling assignments under agenda item D4, at which point the estimate of the North of Falcon area can be, uh, the estimate of abundance in the North, North of Falcon area can be assessed against the threshold. Until then, the STT cannot provide quantitative estimates of pre-season Chinook abundances, however, Preliminary indications are that 2022 projected abundance in the North of Falcon area will be sufficiently above the current threshold. And that concludes our statement. Thanks. Okay, th thank you, John. Uh, questions uh, for John on the STT report? Kyle Addix, Kyle? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you, John, um, for that summary, particularly for the, the FRAM corrections and updates that have occurred over the, the past year and since the Southern Resident Killer Whale Work Group did their work. Um, I believe some of the members of the FRAM base period work group were working on a letter to the STT that that kind of summarized all this, but probably in a little more detail. Do you know if, if that letter was completed and sent to the STT? Uh, it, it, there's obviously been discussion of this, just wondering if that ever happened. Uh, thank you, Mr. Addix. I, I don't believe the STT did formally receive that letter yet. Um, I do. I am aware of it um, in its development, but I don't know if it was actually sent yet. Um, thank you, Kyle. Uh, Merrick? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, and uh, thank you, John, for this very informative report. Um, in your report, the last sentence references um, the projected abundance will be sufficiently above the current threshold. And I'm, I'm hoping that you can uh, speak to a couple of things. One is um, an overarching question that I have as to whether the recalculation here um, in, in any way alerts us to a short-term conservation need that we would need to address here. And two, could you elaborate on what you mean by sufficiently above the current threshold? <clears throat> Yes, thank you, Mr. Burden. Um, 
I can try to elaborate a little bit, although uh, uh, when it comes to updated thresholds, I would just like to acknowledge that the SDT has not yet at this point had the opportunity to verify uh, or ca you know, calculate on our own the, the values that were with contained within uh, Mr. Jordan's presentation. But um, speaking personally and based on my understanding of things, um, those, those recalculated thresholds look to be in the right uh, realm of where they should be. Um, when it comes to the, the, um, the language at the end of the STT statement, I would note that there are still a number of forecasts that are outstanding, um, and obviously the final numbers would come through uh, the modeling assessments that the STT will complete in the near future here. Um, so we can't say for certain, but it, it does look like, and, and acknowledging that the fishery management alternatives don't generally affect the pre-fishing abundances. Uh, what we can see based on the forecasts we have in hand at this point, it does look like um, the north of Falcon abundance using just the forecast that we have at this point will be um, greater than the threshold. Uh, I don't know the numbers for sure. I don't want to you know, report them before we have a chance. But what I'm trying to say is that even without including the forecasts that are still outstanding, which include uh, the Oregon coastal forecasts uh, and the um, Canadian forecasts, so Fraser River, Strait of Georgia, and West Coast Vancouver Island, uh, we appear to be above the threshold without those even included. So um, we would expect it to only go up from there once we have those. I hope that clarifies a little bit and I can, I can elaborate more if needed. Thank you, John. Yes. Eric? Thank you, John. That that answers my question. So, um, Chris Kern. Chris. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, John, I'm just looking at one of the items within the update to Shelton that caught my eye, um, based on some discussions we've been having this week already about about uh, model performance, specifically for South of Falcon fisheries. And the note is the um, incorporation of a temperature variable um, to try and encompass annual deviations from distributions. Um, and while the team is extremely busy right now and will be for the next month or more, I'm just curious if there's a potential that that could go on the team's radar. Um, and maybe this is a better question for uh, Dr. O'Farrell, but um, to see if there's some value in looking into that down the road um, for potential incorporation into some of our models. It'd be a big lift, but um, it is an active discussion right now. So I just thought I'd flag that. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Kern. Um, I, I will, would just note that, you know, the, as kind of noted in the statement, the STT is not, there aren't any, any co-authors from that paper on the STT. So we would likely, you know, um, need some time to kind of digest the paper and potentially reach out to some of the co-authors as well, if, if that were to occur. Thanks, John. Uh, Kyle Attix. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, recognizing, John, that the STT hasn't tried to, to recalculate the threshold, is it safe to say it would be a relatively simple task to look back at the postseason information using the new version of FRAM 711 and recalculate that threshold using the same years that the, um, the work group used in their original documents. Thanks, Mr. Addicts. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair statement. I, I don't think it would take much work. In fact, the work is probably already done, but would just need to be reviewed through the STT itself. Okay. Thank you, Kyle. Further questions? Um, Susan Bishop. Susan. Thank you, Mr. Vice I'll defer to Merrick if uh, he has a follow on question. Uh, um, th thank you, Ms. Bishop. I was actually going to um, change uh, course a little bit. So if your question is along these lines, go ahead. Otherwise, I'm happy to keep going. Thank you, Mr. Burden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I was just curious, John, again, thank you for the report. And maybe this is following on Kyle's question. Um, in Mr. Jording's presentation, he sort of um, he presented um, several different uh, results of implementing various combinations of the uh, Shelton update and the FRAM update. Um, 
And I think you had mentioned that those looked, you know, based on what you knew and without STT uh, looking at it more closely, uh, relatively, uh, or, or you thought that they looked good um, and accurate. Um, so uh, based on what you know of the current forecasted uh, pre-fishing abundance, um, would you be able to provide more specificity as to what that level of abundance is at this time or be willing to um, potentially uh, report back if uh, that was assigned uh, and it sounds like it might not be a, a significant task? Um, thanks, Ms. Bishop. I just um, want to make sure I'm, I'm tracking correctly with your question. Um, you looking for more insight into what the 2022 north of Falcon abundance would be um, given the variety of scenarios that were in Mr. Jordan's presentation. So for example, um, is the is the abundance, let's see here, relative to um, a threshold that was translated using just the updated FRAM versus a threshold that was translated using both the updated FRAM and the updated Shelton ocean distributions? Uh, yes. Okay, so I'm sorry, I just wanna make sure I was clearly understanding that. Um, yeah, I, I think that um, as noted in Mr. Jordan's presentation, the, um, the, the effect of the change to um, updating just the FRAM um, was very small and the abundances that are projected uh, likely would be sufficiently above both um, a threshold using you know, the existing threshold and a threshold that was updated um, to account for the new FRAM. And when it comes to incorporating the Shelton, um, the Shelton Ocean distribution updates as well, um, I think we would be in a similar boat, although I, I think, um, in that case, we might be relying slightly more on some of those uh, ex, uh, some of those forecasts that we don't have yet. Um, but but I, I also don't expect that there would be a, an issue um, of being below the threshold with those. Thank you, Mr. Carey. Thank you, Susan. Um, Merrick. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, I, I'm actually going to look for Robin, look to Robin for some help here. Um, but first, a uh, question uh, to you, John. So um, in, in your, uh, in the team's statement here, you talk first about the Chinook Fram updates and um, those updates are characterized as, let me see if I have this right, um, updates to existing data sets and the SDT intends on using the, that round 7.1 of the Chinook Fram model uh, at this point. Uh, the Shelton model is described uh, differently um, and that because of the lack of familiarity, the SDT hasn't had sufficient time to evaluate these changes. And so um, I guess the question for you, John, is uh, whether I, I have my understanding right, is that the team intends to use the Fram model, but at this point has not been able to, to utilize the Shelton model and, and uh, does not have uh, uh, plans to do so in the uh, very near future. If I if I have that right, then uh, and if you could verify that, that'd be great. Um, if I do have that right, I guess I would turn to uh, Robin here to help us understand how we would resolve that issue going forward. And I believe uh, there is language in the FMP that speaks to this that I would hope Robin could speak to. So, um, John, first, do I have that right? And if not, could you clarify? If I do, Robin, could I ask you to speak to it? Um, thank you, Mr. Byrne. Yeah, I, I think you have it right. Um, I would think I would just point out the distinction between using the updated FRAM, uh, which is required for all the salmon assessments that are, you know, of North of Falcon specifically um, for Chinook. Um, where the, the distinction that where where there is a distinction is with the implementation of the updated Shelton distribution parameters. Um, that applies only to calculating the abundance with uh, for um, or the Chinook abundance as relative to killer whale prey availability. Um, and I think what we just want to be be clear on is that the the threshold we're using is in alignment with the methods we're using to predict the preseason abundance so that there isn't a mismatch there. And 
I hope I answered that question correctly, but that, that there, the team does have a slight, a little bit of a lack of familiarity and hasn't quite had enough time to review um, those changes that went into the Shelton abundance, uh, Shelton distributions. Um, and I suppose we can't quite comment at this point whether further review would be needed. Does that help? Yes, thank you, John. Thanks. Yeah, Robin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Burden. Um, for the methodology review and um, the series of events that uh, go into that, um, typically we have a methodology review on the agenda for April, the STT, the SSC, and the model evaluation work group will look at topics that uh, need uh, review or they feel their candidate items, things that have changed, things they want to take a closer look at. We discussed that in April with the council and the council will provide uh, guidance on uh, which of the candidate topics have merit and perhaps time workload, all that, and ask the, um, the advisory bodies to move forward with those candidate items, do any work that they can between April and September and report back on the status of those topics. So we could return in September and let the council know that we were able to do work or not able to do the work or ready to go um, for further discussion on any methods. And um, then we come back in November and bring those um, final uh, topics for the methodology review to the council. So under uh, council operating procedure 15, there is a method for, well, there is protocol for a methodology review um, this uh, may be a good fit for a deeper dive into the Shelton review, um, although it may or may not um, technically uh, be a methodology review, it still may be a good pathway forward for the council to uh, use to take that closer look at the Shelton model that the STT is discussing. And that answers your question, Farad? Yes, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you for that, uh, Robin. Further questions for the STT? Okay, thank you, John. Um, and now we'll go back to the uh, Colville tribe, uh, Tribal Report, and uh, I believe that uh, Jared Erickson is uh, online now. Jared? Yeah, can you guys hear me now? We can. All right, I apologize for that. It froze right as I unmuted it, then it kept freezing every time I tried to get back on, so I downloaded the app on my phone, and now it seems to be working, so... Um, well, appreciate the, you guys' time. I'm Jared Erickson. I'm our Natural Resource and Fisheries Chairman for the Colville Confederated Tribes and our PFMC delegate. Um, you may remember our past chairman, Rodney Costin, um, and our current chairman, Andy Joseph Jr., is a new chairman, and he's down at the Slilo Falls event that one of the elders talked about earlier. Um, so I'll start off by thanking the council for giving me this time. Um, the importance of salmon to the Colville Confederated the Confederate Tribes of the Culver Reservation, CTCR, and the Upper Columbia region cannot be overstated. The CTCR have participated in many salmon recovery and management forums, are actively engaged in salmon restoration actions, and have, have commented on a variety of venues about the importance of the fisheries and how salmon occupy a central role in the lives of the tribal members. Salmon fisheries also form a key part of regional culture, history, identity, and provide tremendous economic benefits to the Pacific Northwest region. CTCR includes 12 tribes and approximately 10,000 enrolled members. Um, the, Colville Confeder the Colville Indian Reservation is located at the terminus of an adrenous salmon migration on the Columbia River in north central Washington. Our waters include both healthy runs of summer fall Chinook and sockeye salmon, as well as ESA listed stocks of spring Chinook salmon and steelhead trout. The salmon runs that used to support our subsistence and cultural needs were nearly lost and are currently a fraction of what they were due in part to the construction and operation of the Chief Joseph and Grand Coulee Dams. Many salmon runs have decreased significantly over the last several years and it's becoming clear that something needs to change. The number of fish available to all the groups and individuals who use this resource needs to increase. One way to do this is increase the amount of habitat available for spawning by expanding fish distribution to currently blocked areas. In the past, we pre presented information about the salmon reintroduction to the blocked area upstream of Chief Joseph and Grand Coulee Dams to your council, the Salmon Advisory Subpanel, and the Habitat Committee. 
the PFMC issued a letter to support a letter of support in March 2021, wherein, wherein you indicated an interest in hearing more about the, this effort as it progressed. The CTCR and our partners at the Upper Columbia United Tribes have made a considerable progress in the development of the Phase Two implementation plan, and would like to know. Um, excuse me. We'd like to know, like to share information about the progress with you at a future meeting in 2022. Um, please let us know with PFMC which PFMC meeting would work best for, for, for providing that information. Current salmon fisheries for CTCR are constricted to a very limited area in the Wenatchee River at the trail race, trail race of Chief Joseph Dam and the, in the Okanagan River. Summer Chinook and sockeye salmon compri comprise the majority of our harvests, and in recent years, our harvest has improved from a few hundred fish to a few thousand fish each year for our tribal membership. However, this does still not meet the culture or subsistent needs of the CTCR. We do not have a commercial salmon harvest because the basic ceremonial and subsistent needs of our tribes are not fulfilled by contemporary salmon runs. The low returns of spring Chinook in 2021 limited the opening of a fishery on our reservation. The forecast for 2022 is no better. When there is little to no harvest, the spring Chinook for the CTCR is critical it is critical impairment to our ceremonies in subsistence. The lack of spring Chinook also elevates the importance of summer Chinook to our people. The 2022 forecast for the Upper Columbia summer Chinook is 57,500, which is very similar to the actual returns for 2021 and the average returns over the last 20 years. As a result, the ocean harvesting model modeling are not yet available. We cannot calculate the range of potential CTCs CR harvest allocations based on the 2022 preseason harvest forecast at this time. We anticipate that CTCR harvest allocation will be approximately 3,000 summer Chinook, which will not meet the needs of our 10,000 members. Additionally, the 2021 returns were approximately 20% lower than the preseason forecast. And if it occurs in 2022, the spawning escapement and harvest opportunities in the upper Columbia region will be substantially decreased. Therefore, we urge you to proceed with caution and take a conservative approach when developing and selecting an ocean harvest option for the PFMC fisheries. The CTCR appreciates the opportunity to provide our perspective to the PFMC, and we respectfully request the opportunity to share this information firsthand by providing virtual testimony to you today. Um, hopefully in the future, I'll be able to be in person um, but I, I appreciate your guys' time for letting me uh, provide a testimony. I also would like to state for our Upper Columbia United Tribes, um, a lot of our, our uh, tribes in the Upper Columbia have been without salmon to 80 to 100 years, depending on location. Um, I know none of them are here to speak for themselves today, but I wanted to uh, hit on that point and, um, and the need for representation for executive order tribes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jared. Um, questions for Jared on uh, on the uh, his tribal report. Okay, not seeing any. Um, as far as um, when you would like to present, maybe to the council, I'd turn to uh, uh, Executive Director uh, Mer uh, Merrick Burden here for uh, some guidance on that for you. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, uh, and thank you for uh, your very informative report. Um, yes, in regards to the phase two implementation plan that you referenced, um, you know, my staff and I would be happy to uh, connect with you and, and discuss when to best bring that to a uh, future meeting agenda, if that uh, is okay with the rest of the council. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. Just let us know and uh, we can definitely be available anytime. <clears throat> okay. Well, thank you, Jared. Um, next up is the SAS member, um, SAS report, and um, they're all masks, so I'll let them identify themselves uh, as they uh, when they come up. So, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, we are glad to be here and we'd like to extend our thanks to the council and to the staff that made it possible for us to be here in person. As you'll see over the next three days, we are going to be facing a significant challenge in meeting the various guidance and requirements we have with salmon, but we'll do our very best. So as we traditionally do, we'll begin with commercial and we'll start in Washington. We have Ryan Johnson, uh, I hope online to present the Washington alternative. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council. 
I'll read the uh, alternative one from the commercial troll management tables. North of Falcon, the overall non-Indian tack of 65,000 Chinook, 210,000 marked coho. That results in a commercial troll tack of 32,500 Chinook and 33,600 marked coho. A trade may be considered in the April meeting. Overall Chinook tax may be reduced or adjusted to meet ESA, FMP, and North of Falcon requirements. <clears throat> I'll go ahead and go across the page to alternative two with a tax of 60,000 Chinook, 185,000 marked coho. Troll tax of 30,000 Chinook and 29,600 marked coho with this similar same trade language and FMP requirements. Alternative three will be a tack of 55,000 Chinook, 160,000 marked coho, a commercial troll tack of 27,500 Chinook and 25,600 coho with again, the same trade and FMP language. <clears throat> Alternative one in the springtime from the US Canada border to Cape Falcon, May 1 through 11, and in the area between the border and the Queets River, landing and possession limit of 100 Chinook per the open period, and also 100 Chinook between Ledbetter and Falcon. May 12 through the early of June 29, or 21,500 Chinook, no more than 7,210 between Canada and the Queets, no more than 5,790 between Ledbetter and Falcon. Open seven days per week. Um, landing a possessed and limit between the between Canada and the Queets would be 75 Chinook per week on a Thursday to Wednesday week, and the same 75 Chinook between Ledbetter and Falcon on the Thursday week, Thursday to Wednesday week. All salmon except coho. Chinook minimum size is 27 inches. When it is estimated that approximately 50% of the overall Chinook or any Chinook subarea guideline has been landed, in-season action may be considered to ensure that guidelines are not exceeded. In 2023, season will open May 1, consistent with all pre-council review at the March and or April 2023 meetings. Alternative two for the spring, May 1 through 15, see 2021 management measures, which are subject to in-season action and 2022 season described below. May 16, 16 through the early of June 29th, 15,000 Chinook, no more than 5,030 between the Canadian border and Queets River, no more than 4,040 between Ledbetter and Falcon, open seven days a week in the area between Canada and the Queets, possession limit and landing limit is 60 Chinook for the Thursday to Wednesday week. And it's the same 60 limit between Ledbetter and Falcon. The remainder of that cell is the same language as alternative one. We'll move to alternative three, May 1 through 15. Uh, this is the same C2021 measures subject to, you know, in-season action and the 2022 season below. May 16th through the early of June 29th, or 16,500 Chinook, no more than 5,540 between Canada and the Queets. No more than 4,440 between Ledbetter and Falcon. This alternative will be open five days a week on a Friday to Tuesday open period. There's a landing and possession limit of 50 Chinook between the Canadian border and Queets River and also between Ledbetter and Falcon. And the remainder of that cell is also the same as alternative one. The <clears throat> summer season alternative one July 1 through the early of September 30th, or 11,000 Chinook, or 33,600 coho. Open seven days per week, all salmon minimum size, limit of 27 inches, coho minimum size of Chinook minimum of 27, coho of 16 inches, and the coho must be marked. A landing and possession limit of 150 marked coho per week on a Thursday to Wednesday week. There's the same 50% uh, trigger language. Uh, vessels may not land fish east of the CQ River or east of the Astoria Megala Bridge. In alternative two, July 1 through September 30th or 15,000 Chinook, 29,600 Coho. 
uh, landing possession limit of a uh, hundred mark coho per landing week, Thursday to Wednesday. Alternative three, July 1 through September 30, or 11,000 Chinook, 25,600 coho. This alternative is open five days per week, Friday to Tuesday, with a landing of possession limit of 50 mark coho for the open period, Friday to Tuesday. In 2022, vessels may not land any species of fish east of Port Angeles. For deliveries east of the CQ River, vessels must call before crossing the Bonello Tatouche line with total catch aboard destination and approximate time of their delivery. In 2023, vessels may not land any species of fish east of the CQ River. And this um, last box on the page has our uh, normal closure areas and call in requirements um, when moving between areas. And that concludes the North of Falcon alternatives. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Rich? Good morning, council members, council staff. Look, my name is Mark Newell for Oregon SAS. I'll read the uh, options for Oregon. From Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain, March 15th to August 28th, and September 1st to October 31st. Open seven days a week, all salmon except co, except as described below. Chinook minimum size limit of 28 inches, total length. All vessels fishing in the area must land salmon in the state of Oregon. Here restrictions and definitions. Beginning September 1st, no more than 100 Chinook allowed per vessel per landing. July 1st to the earlier of August 28th, 20,000 mark coho, all salmon, all retained coho must be marked with a healed adipose fin clip, no more than 25 coho per vessel per week. All coho must be landed to a one-to-one -one ratio with Chinook that are being landed at that same time. Co minimum size limit of 16 inches total length Chinook minimum size limit of 20 inches, 28 inches total length. All vessels fishing in the area must land their salmon in the state of Oregon. In 2023, the season will open March 15th for all salmon except coho. Chinook minimum size limit of 28 inches total length. Gear restrictions, same as 2022. This opening could be modified following council review at its March 20. 23 meeting. Alternative two, Cape Falcon to Hecata Bank Line, March 15th through May 14th, May 23rd through May 31st, June 2nd through June 7th, and June 20th through June 25th, July 1st through Jul July 6th, and July 10th, Jul through July 15th, August 1st through August 10th, and September 1 through October 31st, and the same landing limits as Alternative 1. Beginning September, no more than 75 Chinook allowed per vessel per landing week. July through earlier of August 10th, or Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain, a quota of 10,000 Mark Coho no more than 50 coho per vessel per open period. Alternative three, Cape Falcon to the Hecata Bank Line, March 15th to May 14th, May 23rd through May 31st, June 1st through the 30th, July 5th through the 31st, August 1st through the 10th, September 1st through October 31st, same as alternative one, as far as days of the week. Beginning September 1st, no more than 75 Chinook allowed per vessel per landing week. July 5th through the earlier of August 10th, Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain, a quota of 10,000 mark coho, and no more than 20 coho per vessel per week. Moving down, An alternative two, Hecata Bank Line hum, to Humbug Mountain. May 1st through the 14th, May 23rd through the 31st, June 2nd through the 7th, 
and 20th through the 25th, July 1st through the 6th, 10th through the 15th, August 1st through the 10th, September 1st through October 31st. Beginning September, no more than 75 Chinook allowed, Chinook allowed per vessel per landing week, Thursday through Wednesday. July 1st through the earlier of the August 10th, Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain, I quote of 10,000 mark quota. Alternative three, heck of the bank line to Humbug Mountain. May 1st through May 14th, May 23rd through May 31st, August 1st through August 10th, September 1st through October 31st, and same um, alternatives as alternative two or same rules. Uh, August 1st through earlier of August 10th in Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain, I quote of 10,000 Mark Coho and no more than 20 coho per vessel per week. Okay, from Humbug Mountain to the California border. March 15th to May 31st, June 1st through the end of June or June 30th, or earlier of a 800 Chinook quota, July 1st through the 31st, or earlier of a 500 Chinook quota, August 1st through the 28th, or earlier of a 500 Chinook quota, open seven days a week, all salmon except coho, Chinook minimum size limit 28 inches, June 1st through August 28th, weekly landing and possession limit of 50 Chinook per vessel per week. Any remaining portion of Chinook quota may be transferred in season to an impact neutral basis to the next open quota period. All vessels in that area during June, July, and August must land deliver all salmon within this area or into Port Orford within 24 hours of any clo closure of this fishery and prior to fishing outside of this area. Alternative two, Humbug Mountain to Oregon, California border. March 15th to April 30th, June 1st to the 30th or earlier of an 800 Chinook quota, July 1st to the 31st or, or earlier of a 500 Chinook quota. As far as days of the week, same as alternative one, July 1st to July 31st, weekly landing limit and possession limit of 50 Chinook per week and the quotas will be transferred the same as alternative one. Alternative three, Humbug Mountain to Oregon, California border. March 15th to May 14th, May 31st, May, excuse me, May 23rd to May 31st, June 1st to the 30th or earlier of an 800 Chinook quota, July 1st to the 31st or the earlier of a 500 Chinook quota, uh, the days per week are same as alternative one and June to July weekly landing landing and possession limit of 50 Chinook per week. And uh, the quotas can be transferred the same as alternative one. And I believe that is all my options. Are there any questions? Thanks, Mark. All right. Good morning, Council. Um, my name is George Bradshaw. I'll be reading in the California alternatives. Um, I'm the California SAS troll rep. Um, we will begin in the California KMZ, the California Oregon border to hum or Humboldt South Jetty. Alternative one will be closed. However, we'll have uh, information here for potential openers of next year. In 2023, the season will open May 1st through the earlier of May 31st or a 3,000 Chinook quota. Chinook minimum size limit 27 inches, landing possession limit of 20 Chinook per day, uh, all salmon except coho. Uh, it could be rolled over into the next open period and the fish must be uh, landed in within the area within 24 hours of any closure. Um, this opening could be modified following council review in March or April of 2023. Alternative two is also closed and alternative three 
for the same zone um, is all also closed. We'll move south into the Fort Bragg zone from latitude 4010 to Point Arena. Um, alternative one is June 1 through 7, July 1 through 12, August 1 through 12, and September 1 through 30. Open seven days per week, all salmon except coho. Um, minimum size limit of 27 inches. All salmon must be landed in California, north of Point Arena. In 2023, the season will open April 16th and all for all salmon except coho, minimum size limit of 27 inches. Um, this opening could be modified following council review in March of 2023. Uh, moving over to alternative two in the same Fort Bragg zone, um, June 1 through 10, July 1 through 8, August 1 through 12, September 1 through 30. Uh, same landing limits and stuff apply from alternative one. Moving over to alternative three in the Fort Bragg cell, it will be September 1 through 30 with the same landing requirements as the others. And moving down to the San Francisco cell, Point Arena to Pigeon Point. Um, the dates are for alternative one is June 1 through 7, July 1 through 12, August 1 through 12, September 1 through 30. Open seven days a week, all salmon except coho. Chinook minimum size limit, 27 inches. Um, through August, then 26 inches thereafter. All salmon must be landed in California during September. All salmon must be landed south of Point Arena. In 2023, the season will open May 1 for all salmon except coho, minimum size limit, 27 inches. Uh, the opening could be modified following council review in March or April of 2023 meetings. Um, in the same cell, but Point Reyes to Point San Pedro, the fall a target area zone, there will be opening dates of October 3 through 7 and October 10 through 14. Open five days a week, all salmon except coho, minimum size limit of 26 inches. Uh, all salmon in this area must be landed between Point Arena and Pigeon Point. Now we'll move over to alternative two, uh, the same San Francisco cell, June 1 through 10, July 1 through 8. August 1 through 12, September 1 through 30, um, same landing limits and the same uh, fall area target zone as alternative one. And moving over into alternative three for the San Francisco cell, June 1 through 10, July 1 through 10, August 1 through 10, September 1 through 30, open seven days a week, all salmon except coho. Uh, however, there'll be a minimum size limit of 27 inches in this alternative going to or through August and then 26 inches thereafter. Um, the same uh, fall area target zone as the other two options. And moving farther south down into uh, Pigeon Point to the U.S.-Mexico border for alternative one, we have May 1 through 12. May 20 through 27, June 1 through 7, July 1 through 12, and August 1 through 12. Open seven days a week. All salmon except coho, minimum size limit of 27 inches. All salmon must be landed in the state of California. In 2023, the season will open May 1 for all salmon except coho, uh, minimum size limit 27 inches. And this opening could be modified following council review in its March or April. 2023 meetings. Um, alternative two for the same uh, Monterey cell is May 1 through 12, May 20 to 27, June 1 through 10, July 1 through 8. Uh, same landing limits and restrictions apply as alternative one. And moving over into alternative three, uh, the same cell Monterey, May 1 through 12, May 20 to 27, June 1 through 10, 
July 1 through 10 and August 1 through 10, open seven days a week, all seven except coho. The minimum size limit will be 28 inches and alternative three, uh, all salmon must be landed in the state of California. That finishes California troll. Thank you, Georgia. Okay, if you have no questions, we'll bring up okay. the recreational people. And okay, cool. Kyle? Sorry, I have a question. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I had a couple questions too on the we'll patrol alternatives. Go ahead, please. So the first one I think is pretty simple. It's for the um, north of Cape Falcon fishery and the, the header table on page two where it lists on number two under each alternative, it lists the non-Indian commercial troll TACs. And for alternatives one and two, it says marked coho. It does not say that for alternative three. I wanted to confirm that that should be 25,600 marked coho in alternative three. Thank you for the question. Yes, that is the in intent that should say marked Coho. Thanks, Ryan. Mr. Vice Chair, my second question is a, a little more complicated. Um, last year, I believe, was our first year under the sort of new management regulatory calendar that starts on May 15th. Alternative one in the troll package has a, a slightly different season structure for May 1st through 15th. You'll note that alternatives two and three just reference the 2021 management measures, which are already in place and that we anticipate we may have to modify the landing limits by in-season option, in-season action before the fishery starts. But alternative one has a slightly different season structure and that it typically we operate on a Thursday through Wednesday landing week. And with May 1st hitting on, a, I believe it's a Monday this year, that would make for a really short initial landing week. So I believe the idea here from the SAS is to lengthen that landing week into an 11 day period for that first open period in May. But that period's already in place from the rules the council adopted last spring. So I, I just wanted to flag that, that we'll need to have some discussion and see if this is something that we could do by in-season action, if that's what we intend to do, how we how we put it into the document. But I, I think that captures the intent. Um, and Ryan, please correct me if, if I'm characterizing it wrong. No, that was, that was correct. It's lar largely just the way the calendar falls this year. Okay. So we'll just need some discussion with Noah and, and figure out if, if this is something we can do before we settle on final alternatives at the end of the week. Okay, very good. Thank you, Kyle. Any other questions for the commercial side? Robin? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to confirm with George on uh, a size limit for um, Let's see, it's page nine of 14 for the San Francisco cell, alternative three. Um, written down, I put in 28 inches and then going to 26 in August. You said 27, so I just want to make sure I get it right on our next version, if you could confirm one way or the other. Uh, the way that it's written is correct. It's 28 inches through August going to 26 inches thereafter. Thank you. That helps a lot. Okay. Okay, no more questions. And with that, I guess, Richard, I'll turn you over I to you. Bring up our, um, rec our recreational people. We're going to begin again in Washington with Dave Johnson. Okay. Uh, and then we'll move to Mike Sorensen and myself for Oregon and James Stone for California. Good morning, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the council. For the record, my name is Dave Johnson. I am the Washington Recreational Representative for SAS. Overall non-Indian TAC of 65,000 Chinook in alternative one and 210,000 coho marked with the healed adipose fin with a recreational TAC of 32,500 Chinook and 176,400 marked coho. All retained coho must be marked. 
For alternative two, the overall non-Indian tack of 60,000 Chinook and 185,000 coho marked with the heeled adipose fin with a recreational tack of three or 30,000 Chinook and 155,400 marked coho. All retained coho must be marked. In alternative three, the overall non-Indian tack of 55,000 Chinook and 160,000 marked coho with the heeled adipose fin with the recreational tack of 27,500 Chinook, 134,000 400 marked coho, all coho must be marked with a heeled adipose fin. I'll start in the north from the U.S.-Canada border to Cape Alava, Nia Bay sub-area. Alternative one, June 18th through earlier of September 30th, or 18,350 marked coho sub-area quota with a sub-area guideline of 7,350 Chinook. Open seven days a week, all salmon except no chum beginning August 1st, two salmon per day, all coho must be marked with a healed adipose fin. Beginning August 1st, Chinook non-retention east of the Benilla Tatouche line during council managed ocean fisheries. See gear restrictions and definitions, C2, C3. In-season management may be used to sustain season length and keep harvest within the overall Chinook and coho recreational tax for north of Cape Falcon. In alternative two, June 25th through earlier in September 30th, or 16,160 marked coho sub-area quota with a sub-area guideline of 6,790 Chinook. Same as alternative one for all the rest. In alternative three, June 18th to earlier of September 18th, or 13,980 marked coho sub-area quota with a sub-area guideline of 6,220 Chinook. And all the rest would be the same as alternative one. Moving to the south, Cape Alava to the Queets River or the La Push sub-area, alternative one, June 18th through earlier of September 30th, or 4,590 marked coho sub-area quota with a sub-area guideline of 12,000 or 1,250 Chinook. Open seven days per week. All salmon except no chum beginning August 1st. Two salmon per day. All coho must be marked with the healed adipose fin. In-season management may be used to sustain season length and keep harvest within the overall Chinook and Coho recreational tax for North of Cape Falcon. October 1 through earlier of October 9, or 100 Chinook quota in the area north of 47 North, 47.5 North latitude and south of the 48 line, North latitude. Open seven days per week, Chinook only, one Chinook per day. Moving over to alternative two, June 25th or earlier of September 30th or 4,040 marked coho sub-area quota with a sub-area guideline of 1,240 Chinook. And same as alternative one for the rest of it. Moving over to alternative three, June 18th through earlier September 18th, or 3,490 marked coho sub-area quota with a sub-area guideline of 1,140 Chinook, same as area one. Moving to the south of the Queets River to Ledbetter Point, Westport sub-area, June 18th through earlier September 30th, or 65,260 marked coho sub-area quota with a sub-area guideline of 14,530 Chinook. Open seven days per week, all salmon, two salmon per day, no more than one of which may be a Chinook. All coho must be marked with the heeled adipose fin. Chinook minimum size limit of 22 inches total length. See gear restrictions and definitions C2, C3. Grays Harbor control zone closed beginning August 8th. In season management may be used to sustain season length and keep harvest within overall Chinook and coho recreational tax for North of Cape Falcon C5. For alternative two for Westport sub area, June 25th through earlier in September 30th, 
or 57,500 mark coho subarea quota with a subarea guideline of 13,410 Chinook and same as alternative one for the rest. Moving over to alternative three, June 26th through earlier of September 18th or 49,730 marked coho subarea quota with a subarea guideline of 12,290 Chinook open five days per week, Sunday through Thursday, all salmon, two salmon per day, no more than one of which may be a Chinook. All coho must be marked with a heeled adipose fin, Chinook minimum size limit, 22 inches. Moving south to Ledbetter Point, Cape Falcon, otherwise known as the Columbia Sub River or Columbia River Sub Area, June 18th through earlier September 30th, or 88,200 marked coho subarea quota with a subarea guideline of 9,270 Chinook. Open seven days per week, all salmon, two salmon per day, no more than one of which may be a Chinook. All coho must be marked with a heeled adipose fin clip. Chinook minimum size limit, 22 inches. Columbia Control Zone C4 in-season management may be used to sustain season length and keep harvest within the overall Chinook and Coho recreational tax north of Cape Falcon C5. Alternative two, June 25th through earlier of September 30th or 77,700 marked Coho subarea quota with the subarea guideline of 8,560 Chinook and same as alternative one. Alternative three for Columbia River sub area is June 26th through earlier of September 18th or 67,200 marked coho sub area quota with a sub area guideline of 7,850 Chinook and same as alternative one. And that concludes my report for North of Falcon. Thank you, Dave. I guess, uh, Mike? Uh, good morning, Vice Chair, Council Members, Mike Sorensen, uh, Oregon SAS Charter Rep. I'll be reading from uh, page 19 and page 20. Cape Falcon to Humbug Mar Mountain, March 15th to August 31st, except as provided below during the all season marked selective fishery and the non selective coho fishery. Open seven days per week, all salmon except coho, two fish per day, Chinook minimum size limit, 24 inches, total length, sea gear restrictions. In 2023, the season will open March 15th for all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size limit, 24 in total length. And uh, the same restrictions has in 2022. This opening could be modified following the council review at its March 2023 meeting. And alternative two and alternative three are the same. Moving on to page 20. Alternative one, Cape Falcon to the Oregon, California border. All salmon mark select coho fishery June 18th through the earlier of August 28th or 120 thousand mark coho quota open seven days per week all salmon two salmon per day all retained coho must have them marked with a heeled adipose fin clip see minimum size limits and see gear restrictions any remaining of the mark select coho quota may be transferred in season on an impact neutral basis to the non-select coho quota from Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain. Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain, non-mark select coho fishery, September 3rd through the earlier of September 30th, or 30,000 non-mark select coho. Open uh, days may be modified in season, open seven days per week, all salmon, two salmon per day, see minimum size limits and gear restrictions. Alternative two, Cape Falcon to the Oregon, California border. All salmon mark select coho fishery June 25th through the earlier of August 21st or 110,000 mark quo quota. 
uh, same uh, alternatives or, in, in a, or same uh, definitions in alternative one. Uh, Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain, non-select coho fishery September 6th through the earlier of September 30th or 25,000 non-mark select coho open seven days a week and days may be modified and the same as alternative one. Moving on to alternative three, Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain, all salmon mark select coho fishery, June 25th through the earlier of August 21st or 100,000 mark coho. And the same things as alternative one, moving down to Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain for a non-select uh, coho fishery, September 10th through the earlier of September 30th or 20,000 non-mark select coho open seven days a week and they may be modified. For the um, Humbug Mountain to Oregon, California border of the Oregon KMZ, May 21 through 31, June 18th to August 21. Open seven days per week, all salmon except coho, except as listed above for the Mark Select Coho Fishery from Cape Falcon to the Oregon California border, June 18th through August 28th. Two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size 24 inches total length. Alternative two. May 16th to July 27th, and the same language about the coho season. Alternative three, May 28th to August 6th. And this should read open seven days per week, all salmon except coho period. Thanks, Rich. James. Thank you, Vice Chair, and good morning, Council Members. My name is James Stone, and I am the California SAS Sport Representative. I will be reading from the SAS Supplement Report 1, starting on page 21 and 22. We will start in the north from the Oregon-California border to latitude line 4010. Season and alternative one will open on May 1st to May 15th and May 16th to September 5th. Open seven days a week. All salmon except coho, two salmon per day. Chinook minimum size limit of 20 inches. Total length, see gear restrictions and definitions. The Klamath Control Zone is closed in August. See California State Regulations for additional closures adjacent to the Smith, Eel, and Klamath Rivers. In 2023, the season opens May 1st for all salmon except coho, two salmon per day. Chinook minimum size limit of 20 inches total length and the same gear restrictions as 2022. This opening could be modified following council review at its March or April 2023 meeting. In alternative two, for the California KMZ from Oregon, California border to latitude line 4010, alternative two reads May 1st through May 15th, May 16th through May 31st, July 1st through July 4th, and August 1st through August 31st. The language is the same as alternative one. Moving over to alternative three for the California KMZ, Oregon, California border to latitude 4010. Alternative three reads May 1st to May 15th, May 16th to May 31st, August 1st to August 31st. Open seven days per week, all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size limit of 24 inches total length, see gear restrictions and definitions. The other language is the same as alternative one. <clears throat> Moving to the south, latitude line 4010 to Point Arena, the Fort Bragg sector. We will start alternative one with the dates of April 2nd to May 15th and May 16th to November 13th. Open seven days per week, all salmon except coho, two salmon per day. Chinook minimum size of 20 inches total length, see gear restrictions and definitions. In 2023, the season opens April 1st for all salmon except coho, two salmon per day. Chinook minimum size limit of 20 inches total length and the same gear restrictions as in 2022. This opening could be modified following council review at its March 2023 meeting. Moving over to alternative two for Fort Bragg, latitude line 4010 to Port Arena. Alternative two reads, April 2nd to May 15th, May 16th to July 4th, and July 22nd to October 31st. And all language is the same as alternative one. 
Moving over to alternative three in the Fort Bragg sector, it reads June 1st to September 30th. Open seven days per week, all salmon except coho, two salmon per day. Chinook minimum size limit of 24 inches total length. See gear restrictions and definitions. And the language for 2023 is the same as alternative one. Moving to page 22 and moving further south to the San Francisco sector from Point Arena to Pigeon Point. We will start with alternative one and it reads April 2nd to May 15th. Open seven days a week, all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size limit of 24 inches total length, see gear restrictions and definitions. May 16th to November 13th, open seven days per week, all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size limit of 20 inches total length, see gear restrictions and definitions. In 2023, the season opens April 1st, for all salmon except coho, two salmon per day, Chinook minimum size limit of 24 inches total length, and the same gear restrictions as in 2022. This opening could be modified following council review at its March 2023 meeting. Moving over to alternative two, from Point Arena to Pigeon Point, San Francisco sector. Alternative two reads, April 2nd to May 15th, same as alternative one, and July 1st to October 31st, same as alternative one. And the language for 2023 is the same as alternative one. Moving over to Point Arena to Pigeon Point, San Francisco sector, alternative three. It reads April 2nd to April 30th and June 20th to September 30th. Open seven days per week, all salmon except coho, two salmon per day. Chinook minimum size limit of 24 inches total length, see gear restrictions and definitions. And the language for 2023 is the same as alternative one. Moving further south to our final sector, Pigeon Point, to the U.S.-Mexico border, or otherwise known as the Monterey sector. Alternative one reads, April 2nd to May 15th, open seven days per week. All salmon except coho, two salmon per day. Chinook minimum size limit of 24 inches total length. See gear restrictions and definitions. And May 16th to October 2nd, open seven days per week. All salmon except coho, two salmon per day. Chinook minimum size limit of 20 inches total length. See gear restrictions and definitions. In 2023, the season opens April 1st for all salmon except coho, two salmon per day. Chinook minimum size limit of 24 inches and the same gear restrictions as in 2022. This opening could be modified following council review at its March 2023 meeting. Moving over to alternative two from Pigeon Point to the U.S.-Mexico border, Monterey sector. Alternative two reads April 2nd to May 15th and May 16th to October 2nd. Open seven days per week. All salmon except coho, two salmon per day. Chinook minimum size limit of 24 inches total length. See gear restrictions and definitions. And the language for 2023 is the same as alternative one. Moving over to the final alternative, alternative three from Pigeon Point to US-Mexico border, Monterey sector. Alternative three reads April 2nd to May 15th, same as alternative one, and May 16th to October 2nd, same as alternative one. And the language for the 2023 is the same as alternative one. And that completes my report. Okay, thank you, James. Um, questions on the uh, recreational management alternatives? Uh, Chris Kern. Thanks, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Just a quick question for Mike to clarify. When you were reading through, I think you said, sorry, let me get to it, um, page, 19, I think you may have said March 15th through August 31st when it says October 31st, Do you just get you to clarify on the record? Yes, it should be October 31st. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, thanks Chris. Um, anyone else? Okay, I think we're good, thank you gentlemen. What do you think? Maybe we should get through them. Okay. All right. I think that uh, 
that takes us to a public comment. And we have, I believe, five or six cards. I'd like to get through that before we break for lunch. I think it'd be wise. We are running a little behind. And so um, and with that, I see we have uh, <coughs> Steve Lavaletta followed by Tom Matouche. Steve, are you there? Steve? Oh. Okay, I'm not, uh, I don't see. Steve's not there, so maybe we'll come back to him. Maybe we'll go to uh, Tom Matouche. Tom? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Civic Fishery Management Council, Department of Fish and Wildlife staff, others in attendance, both in person and virtually. I'm a San Mateo County elected official to the San Mateo County Harbor District. At the end of this term, I'll have served uh, 10 years uh, setting direction and policy for the Harbor District. San Mateo County Harbor District is a special district in San Mateo County under harbors and navigation code. <clears throat> we have two facilities in the county, one at Oyster Point Marina, one at uh, Pillar Point. We cover about a thousand slips and we have a $10 million budget. We're an enterprise district. We get about 55% of our uh, funding from taxes, 45% is enterprise. The enterprise side is rent, percentage rent, slip rent, lease fees, and launch fees. Last year, salmon season was very poor for recreational anglers. Recreational anglers had to travel 20 miles south to fish below 3711, and that body of fish did not last long at all. Fortunately for the Harbor District and the public, commercial salmon fishermen above 3711 had some excellent days our commercial fishermen have the option to sell their from their boats in the Harbor District, which is extremely well received by the public. When salmon opened June 26th, anglers had to run 20 miles north as salmon had essentially left the waters off Half Moon Bay. Historically, when salmon is good off Half Moon Bay, the parking lot is full, trucks and trailers line Highway 1 on both sides, of the highway and there's cars and trucks parked uh, in El Granada on residential streets. People that I've talked to or some of the constituents have said anglers would like to see a first Saturday in April below 3711 and open above 3711 the sa third Saturday in April. This is important to slip holders and vessel launches in April and May by early June, there's usually good numbers of two-year-old fish off of Pacifica and the Gulf of the Farallons. On behalf of recreational slip holders and trailer boaters from near and far who come to Pillar Point to launch, please understand how important April, May, and June are to Half Moon Bay and the San Mateo County Harbor District. <clears throat> Thank you, I'm open for questions. Thank you, Tom. Questions for Tom? Okay, all right, um, next up. Let's see, let's go to uh, Steve Lavaletta. Steve, are you there? Okay, Steve isn't there, so we'll go to uh, Wilson Thompson. Wilson. All right, can you hear me Wilson, now? we don't hear you. How about, how about now? Can you hear me? We do now. Perfect. Right. Cool. Uh, anyway, my name is Wilson Thompson. I'm from Southern Oregon. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for letting public comment and everything and, and all the work that you guys do and everything. Uh, normally, I bring this up to ODFW before it gets to this point, but I missed that meeting. So I would like to basically just say for most of us here in Southern Oregon, we like salmon fishing and uh most of us supply our families with it um there's a few things happened in 2021 but uh obviously out of control but some of them weren't mainly the salmon seasons being cut down drastically 
So we had almost no fishing time due to the way it was set up and the weather that we had all summer. Um, and the uh, fish basically not being where they historically normally were. So I just basically like to say that uh, we need to readdress that. Uh, I was looking at this year's proposals, which is actually better in my opinion than last year's. Um, as much as I'd actually like to have it open all year long, along with uh, the majority of the people that I've talked to uh, on the South Coast and and a uh, little bit in Northern uh, California, is we'd rather have an open season. And as much as we don't like to say it, we would rather have it open all year with a weekly trip limit. Um, we already deal with trip limits in the fall. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's an option. Um, the other basic issue I had was uh, the way it was split up because last year it was pretty much the sport fishing, which I have nothing against sport fishing. I love sport fishing. And it was part, in my opinion, if it's open for one, it should be open for the other. Everybody should have the equal right to go out and catch their fish, whether it be commercial or sport. Um, there's plenty of room out there. There's plenty of ocean. There's, I mean, there's, there's lots of room. There's no reason why everybody should be fighting over days that they get versus other days that other people get. So <clears throat> that is my basic spiel for today. Okay. Thank you, Wilson. Thank you. Uh, questions for Wilson on his testimony. Okay. Next look to uh, Werner Wilson. Werner? Hi, could you hear me? We can. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you, Council, for considering my comments. My name is Werner Wilson, and I'm Senior Oceans Campaigner for Friends of the Earth US. I'm part of the Chilgeon Tribe in Bristol Bay, Alaska, and a commercial sports and subsistence salmon fisher. My area has consistently had one of the strongest Chinook runs in the world. But we are concerned because the stocks are going down, even though we think we are doing what we can to reduce the impacts. I would like to continue to encourage the PFMC to coordinate with NIMPS and the North Pacific Fishery Management Council on this issue, as well as state regulatory agencies and the Pacific Salmon Commission. I think there are too many jurisdictions that are handling, handling the issue of salmon management and not doing enough to look at the overall picture to reduce salmon fisheries impacts especially to the endangered southern resident killer whale. This is not just related to fisheries issues, but other things that are affecting salmon, such as habitat destruction, as well as bycatch in fisheries like the Pacific whiting fishery, pollock fishery in Alaska, shipping pollution in the ocean. It causes me to believe we need reform with the Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries Conservation Act that created this body. Internationally, I would encourage continued cooperation with Russia and other nations of the North Pacific, given the recent geopolitical situation in Ukraine. I saw that NOAA is part of an international team studying salmon in the North Pacific, and I hope this doesn't end or get diminished because of the war. We need to ensure continued cooperation between the US and Russia on issues in the North Pacific and the Arctic. Members of the Arctic Council, as well as the US envoy to the Arctic, James DeHart, recently said we still have to work together here in the North Pacific to help benefit our salmon populations. One concern I have is that hatcheries from all of all North Pacific countries are causing increased ocean food competition for salmon amidst climate change, and the fish are not only getting smaller, which I've observed as a commercial fisherman, as we are witnessing in Bristol Bay, but in some populations they are heavily depleted, like in the Chignik area. <laughs> Overall, I think U.S. domestic efforts to reduce harm to salmon and killer whales is broken because of the overwhelming bureaucratic processes that int intend to do good, but are just not working. I say that as being involved in the ad hoc salmon group that this body set up a few years ago and implemented uh, corresponding fisheries regulations, but we are still seeing depleted runs, so something is not working. Given the dire situation, this body seriously needs to consider stronger measures to reduce directed impacts as well as salmon bycatch. As I've said, I'm in Western Alaska and the North Pacific Fishery Management Council doesn't even allow directed salmon fisheries beyond three miles here. This allows state of Alaska managers to properly understand the health of the stocks returning to each river. We know the salmon returns in Bristol Bay 
where I go commercial fishing have what managers call a portfolio effect. Not every river will do good each year based on many different factors such as freshwater and marine habitat fluctuations and fisheries issues. But other stocks in other parts of the bay will do better, which stabilizes the bay wide run. Without proper genetic stock identification in ocean fisheries, we won't know how fisheries impacts a specific run to a specific watershed. So I encourage diligent genetic stock identification and a strong fisheries observer program in both directed fisheries and in other fisheries that have salmon bycatch. This should be coast wide. I would also encourage mandatory time and area closures as needed with the threshold set by gen required genetic stock of origin information. If the council will not consider a ban on salmon taken beyond state waters. Further, the FRAM needs to consider fish taken in other jurisdictions if it doesn't already. There needs to be more coordination in NOAA fisheries about how both Alaska and West Coast fisheries are impact the, impacting the overall population of salmon and the southern resident killer whales. It doesn't make sense for NOAA to try to restrict fishing in one region or one jurisdiction without reducing imp direct impacts from other regions, like in the eastern part of Alaska that takes a lot of king salmon, that genetic reports so would otherwise be heading towards Pacific Northwest and West Coast rivers. Those fish may have helped feed the endangered killer whales. We need to understand this in the name to try protecting the food resource for the southern resident killer whale, as well as to protect tribal treaty salmon fisheries, which include subsistence port, sports and commercial fishing. Thank you for your time and I look forward to seeing how this body will come up with the proposed regulations and to continue to be part of the process. I'll take any questions. Thank you, Werner. Uh, questions for Werner on his testimony? Okay, seeing none. Thanks, Werner. Next up will be Julie Teal Simmons. Julie. Thank you, Chair, Council members and staff. My name is Julie Teal Simmons. I'm a senior attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity's Oceans Program. I wanted to raise some questions and concerns related to Southern Resident Killer Whales specifically. And I wanted to thank Ms. Bishop and Mr. Jording for their very helpful comments and presentations. Um, as they noted, Amendment 21 to the FMP states that if the annual forecast is fewer than approximately 966,000 Chinook salmon, there would be management responses that would be implemented through this ocean salmon fisheries management regulations process. Uh, I definitely need to closely review the briefing book materials, but I would appreciate written clarification from staff or the council at some point about whether and what protective measures are expected to be implemented for Southern residents this coming year and why or why not. Uh, it sounds like this is still a work in progress and maybe coming tomorrow or in the coming, in the coming days. Um, Mr. Jordan's slides seem to indicate that the abundance level was getting close to the abundance threshold last year or the last year displayed on one of his slides that I saw, which ended in 2018, but the STT presentation indicated that management measures will likely not be triggered. So I'd really appreciate clarity on that. Um, relatedly, I had a few additional questions about the Shelton data, wondering if they are used at some point or incorporated, they seem to significantly lower the abundance estimates. And am I right then in understanding that the abundance threshold would also then be adjusted by the same factor? But it doesn't sound like there's any plan to analyze the relationship between these lower levels and southern resident killer whale population dynamics or viability metrics. Also, it appeared to me that the latest Shelton data shows fewer uh, Chinook north of Falcon or at least a smaller piece of the pie in that area. And I would like to hear from staff about what that change in distribution means for Southern, southern residents. Um, it was harder to follow the STT presentation without seeing the slides and materials referenced, but again, I'll review the documents in the briefing book. Um, I'm also interested in hearing more at some point or being directed to an existing explanation of how the mismatch of salmon forecasts with actual abundance levels, which was raised by several speakers today, how that might relate to or should affect the orca, sam orca salmon abundance threshold um, and threshold for management measures. It seems like the margin of error in forecasting um, or the error, you know, the, the correction should also counsel for a bigger buffer and a, and a higher salmon threshold for the benefit of orcas. And then more generally, I'd like to express our continued concern that Amendment 21 doesn't go far enough to comply with environmental mandates or to help recover this dwindling population of orcas 
We really appreciate all the hard work that the Southern Resident Killer Whale Workgroup completed, and we're very, very happy to see acknowledgement of the relationship between salmon stocks and orca demographics in front of this council. But we are concerned that the lack of a perfect predictive model is keeping the council and also NOAA from doing what's required to maintain and recover the Southern residents. They're, as we all know, hovering on the brink of extinction. And it's in everyone's interest to protect and recover the salmon on which orcas depend. But we literally are gonna lose our chance to save this population if we don't make their survival a top priority. So for example, the Council of NOAA should have recommended and adopted a more protective abundance threshold and management responses based on data from years when Southern residents did not exhibit nutritional stress. As you all know, the threshold that was adopted um, was the mean of the lowest seven years evaluated, and we just don't think that's going to support um, or orca recovery. Uh, furthermore, we're very concerned about the Council and NOAA's failure to thoroughly assess the direct, indirect, and cumulative impacts of th these fisheries, but also other fisheries, including those with salmon bycatch on the endangered orcas in light of other synergistic threats facing the population. And while NOAA and the Council have not analyzed the impacts of the fisheries together, I do note that the Amendment 21 decision documents state that any measures this council takes to help orcas could be offset because, quote, fishery impacts on salmon could increase in northern fisheries in Canada and Alaska if the West Coast ocean salmon fisheries catch levels are reduced. So it really is one big system that should be looked at comprehensively by the fishery management councils and NOAA at a more granular, granular level than just the treaty level. Uh, I also just wanted to flag that scientists, including Lacey et al. 2017, suggested that in order for the orca population to reach the recovery target, which is a 2.3% growth rate, acoustic disturbance to these orcas has to be cut in half, and the Chinook abundance would need to be increased by 15%. So every little bit counts for these orcas, including the amount of catch that these fisheries authorize. Uh, in the interest of time, and thank you for the generous allocation, I saw that my timer was set at 10 minutes, but we will put our concerns into written comments for the council before the April 5th deadline. And I just wanted to flag just a couple more things here today. Um, we, we do not agree with the council and NOAA's continued reliance on hatchery fish to understate the impacts of fisheries and other threats to orcas. We consider the risks that hatchery fish pose to wild salmon water quality in the environment and also their inferior value to orcas and the increasing climate threats hatcheries themselves are facing to be really critical pieces of this puzzle. And we should not be over relying on hatcheries to save us. Um, we also think that it's problematic that NOAA and the council have relied on an assumption that the range of salmon abundances that we've experienced over the past 25 years is likely representative of the range we're gonna see in the future. And that's at, that was in the environmental assessment completed on Amendment 21. It's really unclear to me how this assumption can be used in light of the worsening climate and ocean conditions and threats we're all living through. The reality is that changing climate conditions and an increasing human population are having massive effects on the marine environment and, and are likely to very severely affect killer whales and their salmon prey moving forward. So I think that assumption is unfounded and needs to be revisited. Um, thank you so much for the time today. It's really great to hear from you all, and I've appreciated all the presentations. I wish we could see you. I wish you all would put on your video, but um, in closing, I would just ask that you please resolve any uncertainty in your forecasting and decision making in favor of salmon and orcas. And please, I just want to emphasize what an earlier speaker said, please use your authorities to support and hasten removal of the lower Snake River dams. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Julie. Uh, questions for Julie on her testimony? Um, Merrick Burton. Merrick? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Simmons, for your testimony. Uh, not a question so much from me as um, just, uh, just an acknowledgement of your questions and to acknowledge that we are still in the middle of a, of a work in process. So I would encourage you to uh, stay stay tuned to our our uh, our processes here, and um, and uh, with the hopes that they'll, as we move forward, this the uh, the results of this meeting will begin to answer your questions, and if not, uh, please come back um, and uh, 
let us know what else you have. Thank That's you all. so much. Thank you, Merrick. Okay. Um, next up would be uh, Ben Etienne-Nap. Ben? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the council. I'm Ben Entiknap representing Oceana. I appreciate the dedicated time to talk with you about Southern resident killer whales and Chinook salmon fisheries. This is a very important ecosystem based consideration. Um, I think it's commendable that this is before you now as you uh, develop catch levels for ocean uh, Chinook fisheries. As you know, Southern resident killer whales are critically endangered. They're one of the agency's nine species in the spotlight, meaning they're of the most highly at risk of extinction. And there are currently only 73 whales in the population, which is lower than when Amendment 21 to the Pacific Coast Salmon FMP was adopted. Under current threat levels, including the current average Chinook salmon abundance levels, Southern resident killer whales are highly likely to become functionally extinct at some point in the next 100 years. So there was a, a recent birth in JPOD, which is very exciting. Um, however, that's tempered with the loss of two pregnancies. And that, that loss of, of pregnancies is consistent with past research showing high levels of miscarriages linked to nutritional stress. Uh, and we have previously testified to the council that the Chinook abundance threshold adopted is too low and the management response is too little to provide Southern resident killer whales uh, to provide for their foraging needs. The population is not improving and nowhere near meeting its recovery goals. So now is not the time to lower the Southern resident killer whale abundance threshold or the Chinook, the Chinook abundance threshold in the salmon FMP for Southern resident killer whales. The ink is really barely dry uh, on the FMP amendment and we're concerned the first step then would be to lower it. The revised threshold as presented in Mr. Jording's presentation and, and I'm speaking to both the updates to the FRAM and the Shelton models appear to result in a very significant change, lowering the threshold by roughly 40%. Um, if anything, that this should warrant a review of the fishing effects risk assessment that led to the development of the current threshold. It's possible based on the, the combined model changes, there were far fewer Chinook north of Falcon than previously thought. This can mean exploitation rates were even higher than in what was analyzed. And there may be increased significance between periods of low Chinook abundance and declining southern resident killer whale, uh, the southern resident killer whale population. So I just want to urge caution here. Please don't rush to lower the threshold without taking a comprehensive look at the effects to southern resident killer whales and a more informed understanding of the underlying relationships between Chinook abundance north of Falcon and southern resident vital rates. Again, thank you for this opportunity, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, questions for Ben on this testimony? Not see any? Okay, and uh, with that, we'll go to Steve Lavaletta to see if he's uh, there. Steve. And Steve isn't there. So that will include uh, public comment which are taking us to council action, which is gonna happen after we eat. So, yes. so let's do an, um, an hour lunch. Let's round it up. Um, we're back here at say 110 and we'll do uh, council action then. So very good.
Okay, welcome back. We've uh, finished up um, public comment on uh, D3, and uh, we're going to open up the uh, floor for uh, discussion. And uh, Kyle Lennox, Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I had some some thoughts going into the day on the the southern resident killer whale threshold. The presentations we heard from Mr. Jording and Mr. Carey, um, I think, solidified those. I I asked some questions, but kind of held my my ideas for council discussion. So we heard from the STT that the FRAM model has been updated to round 7.11. Um, that's what the Washington co-managers are planning to use for preseason planning this year. That's what the STT will be using for modeling with the assignment we send them out of here today with. Um, they will presumably go calculate an, an abundance for comparison to a threshold that uses that round 711 model once they have all the forecasts they, they need to do so. If they don't have all those forecasts yet, so they haven't calculated that number. It would make sense to me um, to give guidance to the STT to go recalculate the abundance threshold using those past years that were identified in the in the in the plan and in the work group products uh, using round 711, just updating those past abundance, uh, up abundances in past years and recalculating that average to come up with a new threshold that would be more directly comparable to the abundance they'll, they'll calculate using this year's forecast. Um, the Shelton model is a little more complicated. It doesn't directly affect our, our salmon preseason planning like the FRAM model does. I think that's something that we need to look at. It seems that would make sense as a, something to do in the in the off cycle to spend a little more time on. I don't know if that means a methodology methodology review topic or something else, but perhaps we could ask the, the STT and the SSC to think about that between now and April and figure out what what looking at that piece of the modeling for the killer whale threshold looks like. So that's my suggestion is that the council give the guidance to the STT to recalculate the threshold using FRAM version 7.11. Okay, Okay. Kyle, thank you. I look around the room, I see people in agreement with that. So very good. So, okay. Um, Susan Bishop, Susan. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Uh, Vice Chair. So, Kyle, can I, I may have just missed that last piece um, in terms of after the STT comes back and reports their findings, um, what the what the next steps were in terms of moving it forward, or we would we, we consider that in April? So, I I don't know that it um, that it matters when we circle back to it. I I'm I believe based on the preliminary modeling that using either threshold using the old base period or the new base period abundances will be above that threshold this year so we have a little time to think about that but to me it, it, it'd be a disconnect if we were comparing the threshold calculated in the old version of the model to abundances calculated in the new version of the model Susan? Okay. Uh, thank you mr addicts um, I was, I was, I think, focused on the longer term, and this may be the, not the right place for it, maybe a little further along in the discussion, but um, speaking to the FMP language and sort of the broader review and timing of that review relative to next year, um, if, if you had spoken to that um, or if that's going to be part of the subsequent discussion. Thanks for the question. I think that would be part of the subsequent discussion as we figure out a plan for the Shelton model portion of the analysis and just don't know what the timing of all that looks like um, for future years. Okay, very good. Thank you, Susan. Kyle, uh, anyone else? Okay. So then I guess I would look for, nope, I see no hands, I look forward to a motion. Someone has that? Let's see, Kyle? So I, I don't have a motion relative to the killer whale portion. I was hoping that would just be guidance to the STT. If we're on to, to motions, I think California had a motion. Okay, I, there, there she is, Marcy. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I, I wasn't sure if we were starting with council discussion. Um, 
but I do have uh, one motion prepared whenever we're ready. Well, um, I'm not seeing any hands and we are behind and I think that would be, uh, it'd be perfect timing. All righty. Um, with that, Sandra or Chris, thank you. I move that the council direct the STT to develop alternatives to achieve an escapement of not less than 180,000 natural and hatchery adult spawners for the Sacramento Fall Chinook salmon stock as recommended in agenda item D3D, supplemental CDFW report one. Okay, thank you, Marcy. Does the language on the screen accurately reflect your motion? Yes, it does. Okay, look for a second. Seconded by Chris Kern. Uh, okay, Marcy, please speak to your motion. Yeah, thank you, um, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, first, want to acknowledge the uh, guidance offered by uh, Ms. Bishop earlier uh, in our session uh, and the discussion in the guidance letter on Sacramento Fall Run Chinook Salmon and the need for um, consideration of the larger picture, even though the stock is rebuilt. Um, we cannot and should not ignore that uh, the spawner abundance has fell below the escapement floor of uh, the minimum escapement floor of 122,000, um, which is the FMP objective. And that's been in the last five of seven years. The uh, exploitation rates, meanwhile, have been substantially higher than what was forecast. Um, I appreciated the guidance letter discussing that point and showing us um, how high the, the postseason exploitation rate has been since 2015, um, anywhere from 52 to 68% a year, and in fact, 68% uh, was the exploitation rate postseason in three of the last seven years. Um, meanwhile, um, as we've discussed uh, some in our salmon discussion so far, and we'll discuss further um, later in the week in our ecosystem discussion, um, the situation with the Central Valley and the drought is um, not improving. Um, we're in, you know, continuing to face um, dire situation in the uh, in river habitat and with um, temperatures and flows and um, lack of snowpack and um, the conditions have certainly continued to deteriorate and there's really not any relief in sight. Um, the decision on the escapement goal. Uh, really is a council risk call. And noting in the CDFW report the continued uh, failure to attain the goal um, and the continued predictions uh, that the spawning escapement will be a certain amount and then we continue to fall short year after year. Um, we feel it's imperative that we do more this year to ensure that we meet that goal of 122,000, that minimum goal. And you might remember uh, in the CDFW report presented earlier today, uh, looking at the relationship of the preseason projection versus the actual postseason escapement over time, um, in order to meet that minimum goal, um, the relationship suggests that we really should be targeting a number uh, closer to 200,000 um, rather than 122. So um, following from that also, I think I would note that you um, might have uh, come across some public comment in the record. Um, there were a number of individuals suggesting that we consider a goal of 200,000 fish um, or 225,000 fish or even higher. Um, we do have an established escapement goal range. I'm mindful of that. Um, 122 to 180,000 fish is the goal range. Um, the guidance letter uh, recommends that we target an escapement uh, goal or requires that we target an escapement goal 
um, at the upper end of that goal range. And um, for the reasons uh, previously stated, um, we'd like to recommend that the STT tart um, or the SAS not um, prepare alternatives that fall below a targeted escapement of 180,000 naturally and hatchery adults. Um, with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Marcy. Um, Chris Kern. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. And, and um, I should have caught this before I made the second, but I wonder if we need to, if this motion has got the language that captures what we actually want to do since it's asking the STT to develop the alternatives and that's not normally how we would phrase that. I should have caught that, but I think we would normally say the SAS and the state's staff or something like that. I maybe am asking council staff if we need to, if we are not capturing what we want, which is to have the 180 be a driver for the rest of the alternatives being developed, should we have maybe rephrased that? Okay. Uh, Robin. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Kern. I believe you could adjust the language a little bit. I think everybody understands uh, the topic, but you could either change it to have STT use a conservation objective of 180 for this uh, 2022 season development, or change it to say that SAS develops alternatives intended to achieve an escapement of 180 or less. Chris? Uh, and thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Procedurally, uh, maker of motion and second, I'm not sure that either Marcy or I have the option to make that modification if the council wants to do so. The uh, seconder can make a, an amendment. The, pri the primary author can't. <clears throat> well, well, there you go, Chris. Uh, thank you. Uh, Robin, could I ask you to repeat the second alternative you just threw out a moment ago? The second alternative would be to replace the STT with SAS. So have the SAS develop alternatives intended to achieve the escapement of 180. Okay. Thank you. If that's the case, then I'd prepare to make a motion to amend. Okay. Uh, I would amend the motion to, uh, I move that the council direct the SAS to develop alternatives intended to achieve, and leave the remainder the same. It also would be the insertion of the word intended before the word to alternatives intended to. In front of a uh, two. Apologies, the other two in the in the sentence. Develop alternatives intended to. Right after alternatives, right there. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Chris, is that language on the screen accurately reflect your um, amendment? Yes. Okay, look for a second. Second by uh, Chris Swinson. Okay, um, I guess you want to speak to that or like, you, like you spoke to it, maybe Chris? No, thank you. Uh, just making sure we're, we've got the language clear so we know who's doing what. 
Very good. And I think this helps do that. Okay. Discussion? Uh, Phil Anderson, Phil? Uh, well, I don't want to prolong this, but um, it seems to me we want the STT to work with the SAS or conversely have the SA SAS work with the STT to do what we're asking rather than placing the burden entirely on one or the other. This is a partnership. It takes both of those entities to to make this, to, to produce what you're asking. And that would be my only comment on the motion it, to amend. Okay. Phil, did you have your hand up and I just missed it earlier? Okay. The pin, my penance. <laughs> okay. Um, Chris. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. So at this point, I think I'm stuck with retracting the motion and letting somebody else amend it to reflect an addition or clarification per what Mr. Anderson just said. You have an amendment on the floor, I believe, that needs to be taken care of first. Okay. Either withdraw it or vote on it. You withdraw it. I'll withdraw the amendment. Um, I think the second is appropriate. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. We'll consider the minute withdrawn. <clears throat> and with that, do we have a yeah. a new amendment to the motion? Yeah. Uh, Marcy Rumko. Marcy? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. If it's easier, I'd be willing to withdraw the main motion as well to supply the clarifying language. Oh. Okay, um, can do it. let's do that. And then uh, the second that motion also. Okay, thank you, Chris. Okay. So, um, Marcy, I see your hands back up. Yes. So why okay. don't we do it this way? I will read aloud. Okay. I move the council to Sorry, I move that the council direct the development of alternatives to achieve an escapement of not less than 180,000 natural and hatchery adult spawners for the Sacramento Fall Chinook salmon stock as recommended in agenda item D3D supplemental CDFW report one. Okay, thank you, Marcy. That, uh, wait, wait, wait. I made a mistake. And After the word two alternatives to achieve and an intended escapement. Sorry, an intended escapement of not less. There we go. Okay. Is that language accurate to your Yes, mind? it is. Thank you. Okay. With that, for a second. Second by Chris Kern. Thank you, Chris. Okay, Marcy, back to you. I'm going to speak to your motion. Uh, just to reiterate um, the need and that this is a council risk call that's consistent with the content in the guidance letter and puts a, a fine point on the guidance. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Marcy. Okay. Discussion? Um, Chair Grolnick, Mark? <clears throat> Thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger. Um, I, I guess um, I have some concerns with the motion. I'll support it, but I do have some concerns. Uh, the last, we have historically not made <clears throat> Uh, the escapement that we planned for. Um, the last four years, the forecast of the Sacramento index is actually pretty good. Uh, two up, two down, and we've made changes to the uh, Sacramento index model <clears throat> to take into account changes that have, we've observed 
And so I, I think that you can't look at the abundance calculation and the abundance forecast as faulty, at least for the last several years. What we have seen though, is that harvest, which is a different model, has uh, not performed that well. And I know that changes are being made to the harvest model to try to compensate for that. And so whether those changes will fully address the, what we've seen the last few years, we don't know. So it does pay to be conservative here. It does pay to increase the, um, the targeted escapement. I'm not sure that with changes that are being made to the harvest model, together with changes made over the last several years to the forecast model, whether um, we really need to go to 180,000. At this point, this, we're early in the salmon process here. So let's, let's see what it looks like. It, it may not even be the constraint can, given the climate issues we have. Also, um, we're in a drought. And uh, a lot of these fish that come back aren't going to spawn anyway because the water temperatures are not going to be adequate. Um, it still pays to increase escapement because we've not seen sufficient uh, opportunities for fishermen in the river. So we do need to escape, increase escapement to, uh, you know, for them, if nothing else. But um, I'm not sure if changes to the harvest model plus the 180,000, uh, we may we may be, uh, I, I'm not sure that the, in combination, those are both justified. I will note that for the concerns we have for H4 Klamath, the National Marine Fisheries Service has given us alternatives to either adjust the model or to include a buffer, either or, or maybe a combination. Um, and I don't see why such an approach would not be appropriate here where we're changing the harvest model and, um, and increasing the escapement somewhat. Nonetheless, let's, <clears throat> I'm gonna vote for the motion, but, uh, cause we're early in the process, but that's a concern that I have. Thank you, Mark. Anyone else? Okay. Okay, I'll call for the question. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion passes unanimously. So, okay. Further discussion? Motions? Oh. Kyle Addix, Kyle? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I do have a motion. I move that the council adopt for STT compilation and analysis the proposed initial salmon management alternatives for the 2022 non-Indian ocean fisheries as developed by the Salmon Advisory Subpanel and described in agenda item D3E, Supplemental SAS Report 1, March 10th, 2022, with the following modification. On page two, north of Cape Falcon, alternative three, number two, non-Indian commercial troll TAC 27,500 Chinook and 25,600 marked coho. Is the language on the screen accurate? Yes. Second by Phil Anderson. Thank you, Phil. Hey, Kyle, please speak to your motion. So the modification is just the, the clarification I asked about during the SAS presentation that those that was supposed to be marked coho. Um, thanks to the SAS for all their work uh, leading up to this. I think we have good alternatives on the on the table to get us started this week. It just also, it was good to see some of the SAS faces in person this time instead of just um, over the virtual meeting. So look forward to seeing more of you in April. Thank you. Um, discussion? Okay. Seeing none. Um, Call for the question. All those in favor, say goodbye by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Um, Joe? 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I do have a motion to offer up to the table. Please, Sandra, if you could. I guess the ether is slow today, so hopefully Sanjay will get up here pretty quick. Hi, Mr. Vice Chair. I, I, I believe the motion was provided. Um, if not, I can maybe just walk through it verbally. Sure. So Sandra, if you're ready. So I move the council adopt for STT analysis, the following initial treaty troll salmon management measures. Uh, the following initial treaty troll Salmon management measures. Alternative one. Fifty thousand Chinook and sixty two thousand Coho. Alternative two. Forty thousand Chinook and fifty two thousand Coho. Alternative three thirty thousand Chinook and forty two thousand Coho. Next sentence. I'll provide some narrative for those numbers. So this will read as follows. The alternatives consist of a May 1 hyphen to June 30. Chinook hyphen directed fishery and a July one hyphen September fifteen all hyphen species fishery period. The Chinook quota should be evenly split between the two time periods. That is my motion, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Joe. Is that language accurate? The screen? It does, Mr. Vice Chair. Very good. Second? Second by Kyle Attucks. Thank you, Kyle. Joe, please speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Kyle, for the second. So what the tribes are proposing uh, here is uh, moderate increases um, based on more optimistic forecast uh, for 2022 and the need to continue rebuilding stocks declared overfished while also trying to accommodate the tree right to half of the harvestable surplus passing through the Asian custom areas. 
the tribes estimate that these levels will meet the management objectives of the stocks of concern, as well as international obligations, uh, recognizing if non-tribal fisheries have similar proportional increases uh, relative to last year. So I do wanna uh, thank the uh, work that the tribes put into this uh, the past day or so to, to get this motion. Um, appreciate um, being able to get this in a form that we got it today. Thank you. Very good, thank you, Joe. Okay, discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing none, um, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passed unanimously. Very good. Thank you, Joe. Um, Chris Kern, Chris? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I, I think uh, we also had a note in the sit sum that uh, maybe any in season actions uh, could be flagged. And uh, I don't, I'm not ready to do them now, but within the next day or so, I anticipate Oregon will need to do some in-season action on our March 15th openers that are currently on the book from last year. Uh, specifically, I think all of our alternatives um, uh, have the one one of the cells that is currently ready to be opened under last year's rule as proposed to be closed during the March to April timeframe. So we'll need to make a modification soon. Very good, thank you, Chris. Anyone else? Okay. Um, Eric, yeah. uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, maybe just to circle back quickly and uh, clarify Mr. Attic's um, guidance on the southern resident killer whale issue. Um, just to make sure we're all on the same page, my understanding of uh, where Mr. Attic was headed would uh, lead me and my staff to, to bring this back on our agenda on our agenda for April to begin that conversation over the Sheldon model and how to best uh, consider it and begin incorporating that into our process. Is that consistent with your guidance, Mr. Attix? I think so, and unless someone sees a need to take it up during council discussion at some point later this week, um, I think talking about it in April, deciding if it fits into methodology review or something else makes sense. Susan? Uh, just a point of clarification, um, he, there had been guidance to the SS, STT to uh, calculate the, the threshold under the new, the updated FRAM model. Um, I, I think it uh, would be useful, I may have missed something, for them to report back this week on what that would be, maybe under D4. Um, and I'm, I can't recall if that's what Mr. Addix had suggested or not. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Certainly, if, if they can do that by the time we're back for D4 tomorrow, that makes perfect sense. Okay, very good. Anyone else? So, Robin, how are we doing here? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I was making a list. So, um, you've done an awesome job. We've heard uh, some really good testimony and good input uh, as we move into start kicking off our 2022 salmon season, salmon setting season process. Um, we heard that we'll use a, a Sacramento Fall Chinook uh, escapement objective of at least 180,000. Uh, the guidance is to, to use the FRAM 7.1 and the STT can report back on how uh, that falls relative to the uh, current uh, killer well threshold. We'll use the SAS alternatives provided in D3 with the modification on page two. So that will give us our uh, sport and commercial uh, fisheries. And we heard from the tribes uh, for their three alternatives uh, for the spring and summer seasons coming up. And we'll have some in-season actions on the horizon. And um, just once again, for the uh, killer whale topic, we'll um, go a little bit more in depth in April to find out the best path forward to um, look at that uh, threshold. Um, the other thing on my note was that we did hear from the Colville. Um, perhaps this will uh, go into workload planning, but they'd like to 
um, uh, have some time uh, with the council uh, regarding phase two. Yeah, I, I apologize. I, I missed Marcy's hand up being up there. So uh, forgive me before he closes out. Um, uh, Marcy. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Yeah, I just had a few other um, overarching remarks regarding the guidance letter and the initial crack at the SAS alternatives pertaining to uh, Klamath Falls Um Mr. Gorelnik uh, got into it a little bit, but I just want to um, highlight how important uh, the discussions coming this afternoon will be. Uh, we heard from Ms. Bishop that um, they'll be getting together with uh, STT staff um, to work through the model updates and to assure that um, one or other modifications that will be made to the model um, will suffice to meet the intended guidance NIMS has provided us uh, in the letter. Uh, we we must take steps to assure that we don't exceed the 16% uh, allowable impact rate on age four Klamath. Um, Susan described it well, but I just want to reference um, the table two and the uh, pre versus post season uh, relationship and the significant overage that we've had above 16% these last four years. And uh, Mark described some shortcomings in the harvest model and Susan explained that we made updates to the harvest model last year that we were pretty sure were going to get us where we needed to be. Um, and lo and behold, um, they did not. And I, I would be remiss if I did not point out that um, commercial fishery performance in 2021 um, vastly exceeded the expectations. Um, and so even though the model updates were made, uh, unfortunately, we once again missed our uh, required objective uh, on postseason review. And yes, we had an outstanding commercial season, um, but um, unfortunately, um, it's come at the expense of exceeding this very important um, objective. So I appreciate the work that's being done to make sure that we get the assurance uh, that the modeling will get us where we need to go and the modeling being the, the KOHM um, to get us on track this year. Um, I will note though that in the, in the SAS packages, the initial SAS packages, it's, it's, it's quite clear um, how significant a constraint this is gonna be on particularly the Northern California commercial fisheries, which are most likely to encounter those age four adults. Um, just the initial runs show um, significant um, loss of time uh, in in the north coast of California, uh, which is laid out um, in the uh, initial alternatives provided to us here. So looking forward to more, but um, I just want to highlight how important this discussion is, and um, it is going to be a significant constraint to fisheries in the north. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Okay. Robin, back to you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I think I went through my spiel. So I think with all of that, uh, you've concluded your work under agenda item D3. Oh, very good, thank you. Uh, and with that, uh, we're gonna start off with uh, G1. And so we'll take a little time here to switch people out of the seats. And um, I'll call on Carrie here shortly to kick us off. So just uh, we'll pause for a, a few minutes for that to happen. I think I'm good. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I'm ready when you are. We're still shuffling here in the uh, the non-virtual world, but uh, we're almost there, Carrie.
Oh, okay, uh, Carrie, I think we've hit critical mass and uh, please start us off. Great, sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. This is agenda item G1, habitat issues. The Habitat Committee met this week on Tuesday and Wednesday, March 8th and 9th to discuss marine planning, ecosystem matters, climate dam removal, and several other habitat related topics. A um, couple of things to note is that based on the council's direction from November um, to have the Habitat Committee continue tracking the Nordic Aqua Farms environmental impact review um, uh, and to prepare a letter when that EIR became available, the Habitat Committee did that and developed a uh, comment letter, which was then sent via the council's quick response procedure. Um, the, at the time, I wrote the situation summary, we, the letter hadn't been sent, and that's reflected here in the situation summary, but it has been, um, and it's on our correspondence website, um, if anyone wants to go look at that. Um, and uh, it's also in your briefing book materials uh, as attachment one. Um, the other uh, attachment in your materials is the Humboldt uh, quick response letter, um, which was also sent uh, very recently. Um, those are the only other materials other than uh, agenda item G1A, Supplemental HC Report 1. Um, after this overview, we will turn to Corey Green to read that. Uh, Lance Hebden is on the sit sum, but Corey will be reading the Habitat Committee Report. Um, then we would move on. I don't think there are any other um, reports, comments from management entities and advisory bodies. And I don't think there's public comment. And then we go to the council action, which is to consider the Habitat Committee report and recommendations. So that's the overview. And if there are no questions, then we can have Corey read the HC report. Very good. Thank you, uh, Kerry. Uh, questions for Kerry on his overview? Oop. Ryan Wolf, right? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And my apologies, Kerry, for um, not coordinating with you beforehand. I just wanted to note I have a very brief uh, NIMS report just to give after the HC report. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Okay, no questions for Kerry. Um, with that, we'll uh, we'll have um, Corey Green and the uh, Habitat Committee report. Corey, is the mic check? Can you hear me? You're good. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the council. I'm reading agenda item G1A, Supplemental Habitat Report 1. This is the Habitat Committee Report on Habitat Issues. And so there's several attachments. Uh, the Pacific Fishery Management Council's Habitat Committee developed comments on the Nordic Farms Environmental Impact Report for the proposed land-based Atlantic Salmon Farm on Humboldt County, California. And that's agenda item G1, supplemental attachment one. The council submitted those comments in February 2022 through the quick response procedure. The Habitat Committee also provided comments on the Humboldt Wind Energy Area, environmental assessment, agenda item G2, supplemental attachment two, and the Morro Bay. Oh, yeah. All council letters can be found on the website in the correspondence, as um, Carrie said. Uh, moving on, there's several items related to the Klamath Dam. The Klamath seems to be pretty popular and uh, busy with respect to habitat and salmon issues. First is the Klamath Dam License Surrender and Removal Draft EIS. On February 26, 2022, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, issued its draft environmental impact assessment statement for hydropower license surrender and decommissioning for the Lower Klamath Project and Klamath Hydroelectric Project, which represents the next important step toward Klamath Dam removal and river restoration. Since at least 2006, when the current 50-year FERC license for these dams expired, the council has encouraged FERC to decommission these aging facilities in order to restore a natural flow regime to the Klamath River and provide access to crucial salmon spawning and rearing habitat that is now blocked behind impassable dams. Restoring the anadromous salmon runs of the Klamath is also of vital importance to West Coast ocean salmon fisheries. The HC is pleased to report that the DEIS finds that removal of the lower Klamath Dam would increase salmon habitat availability 
restore a more natural flow regime, restore more natural seasonal water temperature variation, protect better protect water quality, and reduce the likelihood of fish disease, all of which would have a significant long-term benefit for fall run Chinook salmon, spring run Chinook salmon, and Endangered Species Act listed Southern Oregon, Northern California coast coho salmon. In anticipation of the DEIS, the Council previously tasked the HC with preparing a comment letter for the Council on this action. The HC is in the process of doing so and will provide a draft comment letter in the April Supplemental Briefing Book ahead of FERC's April 18th public comment deadline. The HC intends to convey the Council's desire that FERC expedite its approval of the plan submitted by Pacific Corps and the Klamath River Renewal Corporation for license transfer and removal of the four lower Klamath dams, i.e. Iron Gate, Copco 1 and 2, and J.C. Boyle, and will provide any technical recommendations as necessary. Additional Klamath concerns independent of the dam removal EIS. The Klamath dam removal will solve many but not all problems for salmon in the Klamath Basin. The Council should remain aware of these additional salmon-related Klamath Basin issues that are outside the scope of the Klamath Dam License Surrender and Removal EIS process. The first is the long-standing Upper Klamath Basin water conflicts. Several years of severe drought have exacerbated long-simmering Klamath Basin water conflicts, recently brought to a head by the Klamath Irrigation District obtaining an Oregon court order requiring the Oregon Water Resource De Department to forbid the Federal Bureau of Reclamation from conveying Upper Klamath Lake stored waters downriver to meet minimum water obligations for ESA listed Klamath Coho and downriver tribal salmon fisheries. These salmon water disputes have now been consolidated and submitted to the U.S. Federal District Court of Northern California in the case Yurok Tribe PCFFA et al. versus Bureau of Reclamation et al. And that's the case number in parentheses. With an expedited briefing schedule to resolve the conflict between federal and state jurisdictions before the 2023 irrigation season. The outcome of the, this case may have major in-river flow implications for restoring depressed Klamath River Chinook salmon fisheries as well as protecting Sonk Coho. The additional issues, ancillary salmon passage problems triggered by the dam with Klamath Dam removals. There are several urgent projects to improve salmon passage above where the dams now are to speed their recolonization after dam removal. The Klamath Hydropower Settlement Agreement calls for Pacific Corps' small remaining purely flow regulation Kino Dam in Oregon to be transferred to the Bureau of Reclamation, have fish ladders installed, and continue as a flow regulation dam. There are also efforts to install fish screens at Straits Drain, which is an open Oregon inflow canal for returning irrigation flows back to the Klamath River. Bureau of Reclamation is fast-tracking both of these projects in light of eminent Klamath dam removals. The HC plans to track this issue for the Council. The Council may want to develop written comments and recommendations on these efforts in the near future. And finally, Klamath related, addressing long-term Klamath Basin salmon habitat restoration needs. Many watershed habitat restoration efforts will also be needed to reverse salmon habitat damage done in the basin over the past hundred years. To address these needs, the Klamath Basin Integrated Fisheries Restoration and Monitoring Plan is intended to structure a basin-wide long-term fisheries habitat restoration platform. This plan will use the best available science with an adaptive management framework to develop basin scale goals and objectives for the restoration and monitoring of fisheries within the Klamath Basin. The Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission is the lead entity for this planning effort. And you can see more information at uh, PSMFC's website. Phase four of this comprehensive Klamath Basin wide planning document was released for public comment on February 17th, 2022 with comments back due back to the uh, PFMSC team by April 15th, 2022. No council comments are needed at present, but may be in the near future. So maybe I should pause if there are any questions about the Klamath related issues. 
Uh, questions for uh, Corey? Okay, Corey, uh, you're good. All right. Um, next is a benthic habitat assessment in the Rockfish Conservation Area of Oregon. This year, Oregon and Department of Fish and Wildlife's habit Marine Habitat Team, along with Oregon State University collaborators Waldo Wakefield and Claire Reimers, will continue a multi-year effort to examine benthic habitats and communities within the newly opened Bottom Trawl RCA. The study focuses on a swath of the seafloor west and north of Hecata Bank. The initial phase of the project, initiated in 2019, is a baseline characterization of the benthic habitats, fish and invertebrate communities, and biogeochemical properties of seafloor sediment where no bottom trawling occurred for the duration of the 18-year RCA closure. The collaboration has benefited from ongoing input from the fishery, fishing industry on the spatial and temperature temporal resumption of bottom trawling. Anticipated subsequent phases over the long term will revisit baseline areas to assess changes in communities and seafloor condition. This information will provide the foundation for assessment of potential changes in community structure, habitat condition, and biogeochemical cycling that may result from a resumption of bottom trawling activity in the region. In complementary projects funded by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Fisheries Bycatch Reduction Engineering Program, researchers from the PSMFC and OSU are focusing on trawl gear designs that reduce seafloor contact of trawl doors, sweeps, and potentially foot ropes, termed semi-pelagic trawling. Next on the list is Oregon's new private forest accord. A new multi-stakeholder agreement greatly improves Oregon's Forest Practices Act riparian protection standards to improve the management of 10 million acres of private forest to better protect at-risk fish and wildlife and water quality. It sets the stage for a habitat conservation plan to be developed similar to the statewide HCP for private forest lands already in place in Washington state. A lawsuit threat and several competing initiative battles resulted in Oregon Governor Kate Brown calling together a coalition of timber companies, environmental and fishing groups to work out an agreement. After almost a year of work, an agreement was reached. These provisions were just enacted into law and will now begin and work will now begin to draft the HCP. The accord includes adaptive management, climate change adaptation, and new guidance on how beavers are managed. Glenn Spain and PCFFA were involved in these negotiations. Um, there's a new report on forage fish research gaps, a new report entitled Critical Research Needs for Forage Fish Within Inner Shelf Marine Ecosystems was written by scientists at OSU and ODFW. The paper focused on forages forage fishes in the nearshore environment and identifies research gaps at the population, community, and ecosystem levels. This may help inform the Council's research and data needs work. You can see the report at uh, the Fisheries Journal website. And then finally, we have Habitat Committee Transitions. Hans Hebden, chair of the HC for the past four years of his six-year appointment, is leaving the HC as he continues in his new position with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game as Bureau Chief of Fisheries. Myself, Dr. Corey Green with Northwest Fisheries Science Center, NIMPS, will assume the role of interim HC chair beginning at this meeting, actually beginning of as, yet, as of yesterday. And uh, finally, Randy Thurston, who has been on the HC for six years, will be retiring. Director Siswind, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife is nominating Laura Brown as the department's representative on the Habitat Committee. Laura joined the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife as their restoration and coordination manager for the Lower Columbia River Estuary in 2020 and works with Columbia River Basin Policy and Science Leadership to develop, implement, and manage large-scale aquatic restoration efforts throughout the Lower Columbia River. Laura will replace Randy Thurston in June. Thank you, and I welcome any questions. Thank you, Corey, for a very complete report. Uh, questions for uh, Corey on uh, the HC report? Oh, um, Maggie Summer, Maggie. Thanks very much, Vice Chair. I don't have a question. Thank you, Chris. Uh, no question, but I wanted to thank the Habitat Committee for um, 
including information on the benthic habitat assessment in the Troll Rockfish RCA off of Oregon. I think that's a tremendously important uh, project. We hope that it will inform uh, our understanding of uh, trawling impacts on the seabed and recovery uh, and inform the council in its consideration of habitat uh, and fishery issues in the future. We are very excited to be um, conducting that project and looking forward to sharing information with the council as we go through what we hope will be a, a long-term project and really appreciate the um, industry participation. So um, thanks again to the Habitat, Habitat Committee for uh, including that in your report, as well as a uh, note on the, um, the research going on uh, with folks from the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission and OSU focusing on, on trawl gear designs uh, uh, intended to reduce seafloor contact. Again, uh, I think it's, it's great for the council to hear about those. Um, and the forage fish research gap paper. So thanks to the committee for that information. Thank you, Maggie. Anyone else? What's that? Uh, Marcy, Marcy Rumko. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I'll continue with the thanks. Um, I really appreciate the HC's uh, acknowledgement of our assignment uh, regarding the Klamath Dan removal letter now that the DEIS has been released. Uh, this is definitely a very high priority project and we probably have quite a bit to say and um, just want to acknowledge um, the uh, situation that we'll actually be able to review the letter um, in the advanced briefing book for April. So I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, I know there's uh, work already in progress on this letter and um, I know it'll be another high quality product from the Habitat Committee. So I really appreciate the effort on this one. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Um, Maggie. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, and thanks, I'll follow on Marcy's comment. Uh, you just reminded me that I had noted the April 18th public comment deadline. Uh, and there's uh, such a, uh, there's a very quick turnaround for council approval of that letter. So. It seems like it will be important for Habitat Committee members to coordinate with their agency and tribal staff on the draft prior to submitting it to the briefing book as much as possible to help expedite the, the review and approval process so that we can get that done. Thank Thanks. you, Maggie. Okay. Seeing no further hands. Thank you, Corey. And with that, uh, that takes care of our... Uh, reports and I don't see any, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself again, all right, Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I do have a very brief uh, NIMS report for the management entities. Um, and I got to thinking of this when I read the last part of the Habitat Committee's report on transitions uh, and just wanted to update the council. I'm sure you're most of you remember and aware that John Stadler, who was our longstanding representative on the Habitat Committee, retired a little over a year ago. Um, we have had a rotation of acting EFH coordinators, um, uh, Eric Chavez, Matt Goldsworthy, Gretchen Hanshu, and now Brian Mew, who have engaged and, and still maintained at least the NIMS presence on the Habitat Committee. I am pleased to announce <clears throat> that we have just received the certificates so the job announcement closed. Uh, for a permanent replacement, we are in the process of setting up interviews for a permanent EFH, new EFH coordinator uh, that will uh, again take over the NIMS uh, seat or put forward for the NIMS seat for this committee. And I also wanted to update that there is a slight change with that position because of our merger. That position used to sit in one of our area offices in the West Coast region. Uh, now we will be moving that position to my division, to the Sustainable Fisheries Division, and it will be in our operations and policy branch reporting to Ms. Kelly Ames. Uh, so just wanted to update the council on that, that we are very close. I know you've seen us having a rotation there, but we were very close to having a permanent uh, EFH coordinator at the region and in Sustainable Fisheries Division. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, thank you, Ryan. Okay. So open the floor for comments, discussion on the habitat or the on this issue. Is it item, I should say? Well, Carrie? 
Are you there? I am here and um, looking for hands, listening for voices, uh, not seeing any. So um, as I mentioned, you didn't have uh, an action to take, but um, I, I think that you got some good information from the Habitat Committee. I agree, it's always um, enlightening and helpful to read the Habitat Committee uh, report. One quick thing of note, um, a couple of you picked up on this, Maggie and Marcy, about the uh, April 18th deadline for that Klamath Dam Removal EIS comment letter. The, the HC did discuss that at length and looked at the calendar and, and saw the timing. Um, they're not sure that they could get a draft letter in time for the advanced briefing book for April, but um, you know because there's uh, some layers of clearance that needs to happen, um, but they are aware that it needs to be uh, available um, in sufficient time in advance of you know council deliberation before everyone starts diving into April council meeting business. So anyway, they're uh, aware of it, working on it, and um, you should be you should expect to see that proposed letter, um, you know, at some point, either advanced or supplemental briefing book for April. Um, I just wanted to mention that. And there's no other questions. I think that concludes your business for this agenda item. Very good. Thank you, uh, Kerry. And with that, I will pass the gavel back to Chair Grolick. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair Pettinger. And we will move on to Ground fish, uh, agenda item E2, Pacific Whiting Utilization Final Action. And I will turn to Brett to kick us off here. Hey, good, af good afternoon, council members. I also have my partner in crime here, Jesse Dorpinghouse. Her and I are gonna tag team this agenda item. So this is agenda item E2, Pacific Whiting utilization final action. So I'll give a quick overview of the uh, agenda here and then um, we can turn, I can ask for questions there and then we can turn to Jesse to do a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so we're at uh, final action. You know, this is a long time coming. We've been working on this for quite some time. And uh, in September, you adopted a range of alternatives and some preliminary preferred alternatives for public review. And then now the council's here to select their final preferred alternatives um, you know, we provide a attachment one, that's the full analysis um, that supports a FPA action. Um, we've had a lot of good uh, input from the industry, of course, developing this action, a lot of support from National Marine Fisheries Service, and uh, definitely some support from uh, said contractor, now uh, permanent staff, Jesse. So I really want to appreciate, show my appreciation for everybody contributing to this and getting this uh, hopefully across the finish line. Uh, we also have, of course, in the briefing book, a GMT report and a GAP report. And then there is some public comment uh, there in the uh, briefing book and also some folks signed up. Um, like I said, we would just like to give you a quick overview uh, on the action via the PowerPoint, some things where we've come from and a little bit about uh, what has changed in the briefing uh, materials under attachment one since September and give you a little bit of information on uh, the conclusions of the analyses and then uh, look to uh, go to the management entities and public comment. Uh, your council action, of course, is to adopt the final preferred alternative as appropriate. So um, I would just turn to the chair then and see if there's any questions of me and, uh, and then we could just move to Jesse and her PowerPoint. All right, thank you, Brett. Let me see if there are any questions on the overview. And not seeing any hands, uh, welcome Jesse. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, oh, I am unable to share my screen. Sorry about that. All right, our technical whizzes will. Uh, here we now. go. <laughs> uh, and then let me switch that. Okay, are you seeing my screen in the right version of it? I believe we are. Okay, perfect. Not my notes. That's what we're looking for. So um, as Brett said, we are here today for Pacific Widening Utilization Final Action. Just wanted to highlight, again, Brett said this has been a long time coming, and I just wanted to kind of highlight some key dates on, on where we've come from to, to get to this point. So 
This initial issues were actually identified way back in 2016 through the catch share review process. And in October 2018, um, the majority of the mothership industry actually met on a variety of these issues and brought back a uh, report regarding issues and potential solutions. Um, over the next few years, uh, this was put on the uh, groundfish workload prioritization list. And in June 2020, industry got to um, produce a report um, with a consensus range of alternatives that included at the time five potential management measures. In March 2020, in March 2021, the council adopted a final purpose and need and a range of alternatives for public review. And I did wanna do a quick reminder of that purpose and need. So this action is needed because the mothership sector of the Pacific Coast Groundfish Trawl Catch Share Program is under attaining its allocations for whiting and has experienced lower average attainment than the other non-tribal whiting sectors since the start of the Trawl Catch Share Program, particularly since 2017. The purpose of this action is to identify and revise regulations that may be unnecessarily constraining in order to provide increased operational flexibility in the Pacific whiting fishery and increase the mothership sector's ability to utilize its whiting allocation while maintaining fair and equitable access to Pacific whiting by all sectors of the program. As Brez mentioned in September, the council adopted its final ROA and selected PPA for four separate items. And here we are today on council action to adopt a final preferred alternative or alternatives as appropriate. So just a quick reminder, um, I wanted to give a high level overview of each whiting sector's key management measures. Um, Y'all have seen the slide before in our, our past presentation, but I think it's a, a good reminder just to get um, the key management measures understood. So um, for more details, you can see our scoping document from last March or read the informational report submitted by the co-ops annually. So starting with the mothership sector, they've operated as a co-op since 2011. There are six MS permits and 34 mothership catcher vessel endorsed permits. Um, they operate as a pool system, which very simply means that over the season, there are five pools in which vessels can fish. Whiting and bycatch species are then apportioned across those pools based on the vessel declaration. There are three accumulation limits for the mothership sector. One is the processing limit, and then there are there is a catch limit and a CHA or catch history assignment accumulation limit. For the catcher processor sector, they've operated as a co-op since 1997. There are 10 CP endorsed permits, and there are no accumulation limits for the sector unless the co-op were to not form in a year, and then there would be a permit ownership limit. For the shoreside whiting fishery, this sector actually is within our broader shore-based IFQ program. So all catch, whether whiting or bycatch, has to be covered by quota pounds. There are two accumulation limits, one being the quota share control limit, which for whiting is 10%. And then there's an annual vessel limit of 15% for whiting. I did want to note there's also a voluntary co-op um, that about two-thirds of whiting vessels participate in for the shoreside whiting fishery. So prior to getting into the analysis of the alternatives, I wanted to review one last slide that you've seen before. The purpose and need identifies that the mothership sector is under attaining its allocations for whiting and has experienced lower than average attainment than other non-tribal whiting sectors since the start of the trawl catch share program, particularly since 2017. Specifically, oh, there we go. Specifically, the mothership sector has under attained their 2017 to 2021 post reapportionment allocations by over 45% or a 55% attainment, compared to the CP sector at 89% and the shoreside IFQ sector at 85%. 
However, it's important to consider the attainment trends in concert with recent tax or total allowable catch. As taxes increase, the ability for each sector to capture that growth has varied. Now, even if we look at pre-pandemic conditions, comparing 2014 to 2016, the percent change in catch in 2017 to 2019 for the shoreside and CP sectors was greater than the allocation growth, while the mothership sector's percent change in catch was less than the change in allocation. And while there are several factors that appear to be contributing to this underattainment for the mothership sector, one I did wanna highlight is that some mothership, vessel, mothership catcher vessels have been unable to deliver for a season or multiple seasons. Given that the base of attachment one was a September 2021 analysis, we wanted to highlight the changes that have occurred since that time. So in the document, there is um, additional considerations of minor reporting requirements related to the season start date, updated, updated information relative to impacts to salmon exploitation rates from moving the season start date, further discussion on changes to the mothership processor cap and the excessive shares consideration, update on the 2021 MSCP permit transfer emergency rule, there's additional information in the synergy analysis of the council's PPA. And then um, at the end of the document, you'll note our draft RIR and MSA and FMP considerations. Now, a few of these I'm gonna go over in detail in my presentation today, but of course would be happy to answer any questions. So our first issue today is on the season start date. Currently, the primary whiting season start date north of 4030 is May 15th. The council selected alternative one as the PPA, which would move the season start date to May 1st, with annual co-op applications and SMPs, or salmon mitigation plans, due 45 days prior to the season start date. In development of the document for final action, NIMS and council staff determined that there was an administrative issue with respect to alternative one under the season start day alternative. Specifically, the clause about moving the deadline for SMPs and co-op applications to 45 days prior to the new May 1 start date. Currently, there are other reporting requirements tied to March 31st, which is 45 days prior to the current season start date which includes the annual co-op reports, postseason S&P reports, and the deadline for declaring into the MS co-op or non-co-op fishery. If the council confirms the PPA as the FPA, the council should consider aligning all of these dates to 45 days prior to the new season start date, which would be March 17th. So I wanted to go over some of the impacts of the PPA. Moving the season start date is likely to increase attainment of Pacific whiting and particularly for the mothership sector. It would likely increase economic benefits to the fleets and the coastal communities. For non-whiting ground fish impacts, overall they may decrease due to a shift in effort to the earlier time period. Oh, sorry. And for salmon impacts in particular, because that was definitely one of the largest concerns with moving of the season start date, um, salmon impacts are expected to be in those estimated in the 2017 biological opinion. Appendices A through C pre present a comprehensive analysis of potential effects of moving the season start date on overall salmon take and ESC level impacts. Even if the bycatch from May 1 through 14 were additive, the overall estimates are conservative and still within those estimated within the biop. It's likely that impacts will not be additive though, as the shift in effort to earlier in the season where bycatch rates may be lower. So overall, no reinitiation is thought to be required. Moving on to the mothership obligation deadline. So currently 
um, mothership catcher vessel endorsed LEP owners must obligate to a mothership processor um, to which they would deliver to in the following year by November 30th. Under alternative one, which the council selected as the PPA, that obligation would be removed from regulation. Impacts of the PPA, um, this would be likely to remove some administrative burden to industry and to NIMS, and may have an indirect benefit of giving mothership catcher vessels security and finding a platform without having to obligate under the current season. Next, moving on to the mothership processing cap. So the mothership processing cap is the amount of the mothership allocation that an entity can process. There were three action alternatives um, within the range of alternatives, no action being 45%, and then the alternatives being 65, 85, and then removal of the processor cap from regulation, um, the latter of which the council chose as their PPA. Now, given the amount of discussion in September on this issue, I did want to spend a few extra minutes discussing the implications of the PPA. So in September, some of the main conclusions that came out of the PPA were that the processing cap was intended to prohibit consolidation as it would take at least three entities to process the entire allocation. Based on public records, it appears as though there have been no consolidation of permit ownership. Two entities own two mothership permits each, and two companies own a single permit each, with no changes over time. Even with the processing limit in place for over a decade, there has still not been enough markets for some mothership catcher vessels to deliver catch for a season or seasons even with five or more mothership vessels participating in most years. Additionally, the data suggests that there are no current constraints on the processing limit, as there has only been six occurrences, which are considered entity year combinations, where there have been more than 20% processing attributed to a person or a company. However, what is not considered in that analysis is that the processing limit is not a limit on the amount obligated, but is the amount actually processed and therefore may affect business planning. For example, an entity that has 43% of the allocation committed to it from mothership catcher vessels may not be willing to take on another vessel associated with more than 2% as they would potentially have to choose which vessel not to take catch from if all deliveries occurred. Additionally, future tax and other fishing opportunities may impact historic trends. The level of the tax would affect the overall amount of hake that an entity could process. In recent years, the tax has been at a historic high and in fact higher what was analyzed under Amendment 20. But recent stock assessments have shown lower recruitment, suggesting the TAC could start to decline. With an opportunity for a mothership vessel to stay down and process hake for the entire season, and polyp seasons continuing to be the priority, this increases the risk that an entity could reach the processing limit. Overall, the impacts to processors and mothership catcher vessels under the action alternatives and the PPA will ultimately just depend on the distribution of whiting processing. One of the biggest considerations the council discussion had in September was does the PPA or any of the other action alternatives meet the definition of excessive shares under national standard four? After September, staff did a considerable amount of looking into the regulations. And while on the outside, yes, one could argue that 100% of anything could be defined as an excessive share, because it is the entire share, the definition of an allocation or assignment of fishing privileges, which is what NS4 looks at, is defined as a direct and deliberate distribution of the opportunity to participate in the fishery among identifiable discrete user groups or individuals. So while the action alternatives may allow an entity to process the majority or 
all of the mothership allocations, it does not affect the opportunity to participate. The ability to participate remains unchanged as the mothership sector will remain a closed class of permits. Therefore, there does not appear to be an issue regarding excessive shares. Now, while there might not be a concern of excessive shares as defined under National Standard 4, the Council still might want to consider what the impacts of the PPA are on the fleet. And in particular, what would happen if an entity was able to process the entire allocation under the PPA? So likely, this isn't logistically possible. And this was actually noted in Amendment 20 when considering the processing cap. Um, as it would likely not be uh, possible unless it was an extremely low tack for that year. It also doesn't guarantee that a processor would have the mothership catcher vessels to deliver. Finally, as of 2021, two thirds of mothership catcher vessel permits are thought to be independently owned, which suggests that they might have bargaining power with the processors. And a final note on the issue of broader control of the whiting market, there are still uh, is competition from other owners across other whiting sectors and whitefish fisheries. So while the PPA could allow for more extensive control across the entire whiting sector, that would be a broader issue for consideration outside of this package. The mothership sector would also still be held to all other accumulation limits, which would be the 20% CHA ownership limit and a 30% harvest limit for mothership catcher vessels. And our last issue today is mothership's uh, catcher, special, catcher processor permit transfer. So currently, a vessel cannot be registered to a mothership permit and a CP permit in the same calendar year. Under the PPA, a vessel could be registered to both an MS permit and a CP permit in the same calendar year an unlimited amount of times. Now on alternative one that was selected as the PPA, um, I did wanna call attention to uh, one thing that staff noted in September and that there were differences in the way that this alternative was described in informational report four and the way the emergency rule in 2020 and 2021 was implemented. And the original alternative proposed by the GAP, only one permit could be registered to a vessel at a time. The emergency rule, though, allowed uh, permits to be registered simultaneously. There was no direct guidance given in September from the council, so we're looking for um, some specification of this method or to leave it to NIMPS to implement the most efficient way. In terms of impacts of the PPA, um, processor capacity for the mothership sector could incre increase, potentially allowing for more delivery opportunities for mothership catcher vessels that have not been able to deliver catch. There could be consolidation across sectors, although as we noted earlier, there hasn't been a lot of cons consolidation in terms of ownership of permits. One thing to consider is that typical CP vessels may be able to outcompete typical mothership vessels for MSCV deliveries, as mothership operations are typically more costly. And finally, in terms of equity of opportunity, all current CPs could act as motherships, but only half of motherships could be CPs. However, as was described in industry in March, and I believe in the upcoming gap statement, it's not likely for a typical MS vessel to go operate as a CP, and there have also been few, if any, latent CP permits available. So again, the council action before you today is to adopt a final preferred alternative or alternatives as appropriate. And I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Jesse, for that presentation. Uh, probably answered a lot of questions people may have, but I probably raised a few as well. So let me look and see if there are any questions. 
Corey. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Jesse and, and Brett, for the analysis. Um, a lot, lot of good uh, materials in there. A um, lot of, lot of effort. I, I have a question, I guess, um, that I'll, I'll start by asking on on, on slide twenty, and um, it has to do with, with your. I'm, I'm, I saw this in your analysis, and I'm, I'm having a little trouble following um, the logic and. and I guess I guess I have a different interpretation of how you would go through National Standard Four, but my question I'm not I don't want to get into that, but my question is really about what the analysis says in terms of what the fishery looks like in terms of uh, if consolidation happens. Your next slide kind of gets into what if is entity theoretically process the entire allocation, but. Um, just, I'll just start trying to give context to the question by the analysis does a good job of capturing the original intent of the processing cap. Um, the way it worked in my mind back in, and still works now is that the permit, like you said, the class is closed to the mothership processing uh, permits. That is what I would think of as the allocation that 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 is um, at least it's probably interpretable, but within the spirit of what National Standard Four and the guidelines mean by an allocation. So then, if it's an allocation, that standard tells us to con to consider um, measures to to prevent excessive shares, and that's what the cap was intended as a measure to to as one measure at least to prevent excessive shares. So the question that we have before us today is, is really, you know, we're, we're balancing the purpose and need of, of looking to increase, uh, you know, the uh, utilization in the sector while worrying about the effect of, um, of relaxing the cap in terms of consolidation. So I guess I just am marking a, a, a maybe a, a different viewpoint there on, on, on what the intent was and how this, this, this frames up. But is there a part of the analysis, and I think you mentioned a couple places you could point us to, like where you discuss what what the fishery might look like if consolidation were to happen, um, like how like if there's just one vessel out there, how many catcher vessels is it able to service? Um, I know it's complicated because of the uh, you know as the tax go up and down, it, that differs. But um, yeah, just so that long way of asking. Um, is is there? I, I don't know if I saw that exactly in the um, analysis, but your takeaway, your synthesis of what you would, if you're understanding my question, how you would you would describe the analysis as helping us. You know, I think it was a question of what the fishery would look like if if it really consolidated. Mr. Chair, Mr. Niles, I I'm going to try. I think to answer the question. Um, to the degree that I can. Um, yeah, I think, I guess, responding to the interpretation, yeah, I guess that's that's not, I guess, the page that we had been on or had kind of been raised um, previously during council discussions in terms of what we were looking at for National Standard 4. Um, so I, I haven't thought about it that way, to be honest. Um, in terms of, I yeah, I think I agree that the permit, the closed class of permits, as I kind of summed up on this slide, like that's your opportunity to participate, like that's your allocation. So that's why NS4 wouldn't apply to this case, but I, I do recognize like where your interpretation is coming from. So I haven't been able to think that through. Um, in terms of what would happen if a single processor were to um, process the entire allocation, um, it is definitely spread throughout sections. I'm like scrolling through the document as we talk here, 3.2.3 and 3.2.4. Um, I do not, I can tell you, I do not have a specific number of mothership catcher vessels that could deliver to a platform at any given time. Um, but 
you know, I think the Amendment 20 analysis and based on all of my conversations with industries, like it would be in, incredibly difficult for one mothership to take on all landings from all catcher vessels, but I would definitely, uh, like industry would be able to provide you with more, maybe more context around specific numbers possibly. Um, I just don't have that information. Um, but but 3.2 and 3.3.2.3 and 3.2.4, um, in addition to some of our past documents, um, do have a discussion on that. Um, and I can definitely take a, a further look in, I know we're on final action and council discussion, but I can I can try to search through and find specific examples at a break. Corey, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Jesse. I threw a lot at, at you there, and that was a great answer. So um, thank you for tracking what I was what I was asking. There. I appreciate it. Uh, Vice Chair Pettinger. Thank you, Chair Gerolnik. Uh, Jesse. Um, I'm kind of curious to deal with this excessive share consideration to mothership uh, participation. Did you inquire from the NOAA GC about what would happen if one company tried to acquire all six mothership permits and basically close the class and eliminate co competition? Did uh, was that ever whether that was uh, what they're did you ever get a take from them what that might look like and whether they'd okay okay that or not? Because it doesn't seem to me like they would. Because um, that's really the issue here, I think, to me, is is that um, as long as you've got multiple owners but willing to participate in the buying fish, uh, uh, that, they shouldn't take care of that issue, I would think. But did you, uh, did you inquire in your analysis? Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, um, no, not specifically because the uh, permit ownership, there has not been a discussion of permit ownership limits, but I would turn you to uh, NOAA GC sitting around the table or virtually um, to, to get feedback on that question, but we did not specifically look at that. Okay, thank you. I guess we could do that in general discussion after the fact, so thank you. Further questions? Maggie. Thanks, Chair Grelnick. Thank you for the report, Jesse. Um, question on slide 21, please. Thanks. In thinking about your, your uh, bullet that describes on the issue of broader control of the whiting market, there's still competition from other whiting sectors and whitefish fisheries. Is that relevant if, if we are considering, uh, you know, the value of competition, for example, in terms of price setting for deliveries from mothership catcher vessels within the sector who may not have an opportunity to participate in other fisheries? I'm not sure I see this as as relevant. Am, am I missing something? Mr. Chair, Ms. Summers. So uh, this was actually going back to, and, and apologies, this definitely was not clear on my part. So back in September, we kind of raised this question of, is the council concerned about excessive shares of the mothership sector? Or are you concerned more on this broader concept of somebody having more ex excessive control of the whiting market and the white, like in, in that broader term? So um, this was just kind of a, a nod to that piece. And um, so I apologize for not making the linkage there. Um, we just kind of wanted to raise the flag that if there was that concern um, that by increasing the processing limit that a company could theoretically, right, um, process the entire mothership allocation, you know, process, um, if they had CP permits, they could process the majority of the CP allocation and then whatever they, there's no processing cap in terms of the shoreside allocation, like, it would that be of a concern to the council? And, and we were just noting that 
if there is that kind of concern that it wouldn't um, doesn't need to take place in this package, like that should be looked at at a more holistic level. Um, and the GNTs actually brought that up when we were considering 21-4 a few years ago. Thank you. Further questions? Ryan Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think based on that, it didn't look like there was questions still. So I actually just had a comment. I wanted to thank Jesse for the presentation. Um, I wanted to, as this is final action here, acknowledge all of the work uh, that she and the rest of council staff have put in to this analysis and the, and the thoroughness and completeness of it. Uh, I genuinely appreciate it, not just to inform uh, our council action today, but also believe that this will facilitate a very straightforward rulemaking and timely implementation process and wanted to acknowledge that and thank them. All right, thanks for those comments. And not seeing any other hands, I'll thank Jesse, but of course you're not going very far away because we may need you during council discussion. So now we'll go to our management team and advisory body reports. Uh, Whitney Roberts for the ground fish management team. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, hopefully my audio works a little better today. Um, I, my name is Whitney Roberts and I'll be reading agenda item E2A, supplemental G2, GMT report one on ground fish management re team report on the Pacific whiting utilization final action. The ground fish management team reviewed the materials in the advanced briefing book, including the updated analytical document and received a briefing from Ms. Jessie Dorpinghouse and Mr. Brett Weedoff of Pacific Fishery Management Council staff. The GMT commented on the issue of Pacific whiting and specifically mothership utilization during the September 2020, March 2021 and September 2021 council meetings. At the September 2021 meeting, the council selected the following items as preliminary preferred alternatives. Whiting season start date alternative one, which is May 1 annual cooperative applications and salmon mitigation plans due 45 days prior to the season start date. Number two, mothership processor obligation. Alternative one, remove mothership processor obligation from regulation. Number three, mothership processor cap, which is alternative three, remove mothership processor cap from regulation. And number four, mothership processor and catcher processor permit transfer which is alternative one, a vessel can be registered to a mothership permit and a catcher processor permit in the same calendar year, including sub-option C, unlimited transfers. The GMT discussed each item in detail at the September 2021 council meeting and concludes that the analysis to date supports selecting the PPA as final preferred alternative for all four of the items listed above. Therefore, the GMT recommends doing so. The GMT is supportive of any alternatives that provide flexibility to the fleet to fully attain their allocation according to the purpose and need of this item. Regarding the mothership processor cap, the analysis indicates that the guidance under National Standard 4 to avoid excessive shares does not apply in this case given that the alternative to remove the processor cap would not alter the opportunity to participate in the fishery or to harvest Pacific whiting. The GMT agrees with this conclusion and that the analysis supports selecting the PPA as FPA. Further, if the council chooses to diverge from the chosen PPA, the council should provide strong rationale for needing to maintain a processor cap and regulation. That concludes the GMT report and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Whitney, and your audio was excellent. Thank you. Are there any questions on the GMT report? Thank you, Whitney. Uh, we have one other report. It's from the Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel. Jeff Lackey and Ruth Christensen, and welcome Ruth to the council family. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll be reading from agenda item E2A, Supplemental Gap Report, Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel Report on Pacific Whiting Utilization. Uh, the Ground Fish Advisory Panel received an overview of this agenda item from Mr. Brett Weedoff and Ms. Jesse Dorpinos. Pacific Fishery Council um, staff and a presentation of the analytical document for Pacific Whiting Utilization Final Action. The GAP wishes to acknowledge and thank the authors for their hard work in providing very useful information and analysis to inform final council action, as well as information contained in the draft analysis presented to the council at the September 2021 meeting. Uh, the GAP believes the in, that the information contained in the analytical document combined with the adopted purpose and need statement 
meets the requirements for the council to make an informed decision for selecting a final preferred alternative for the four elements contained in the analysis. The GAP recommends that the council adopt as its final preferred alternatives the preliminary preferred alternatives adopted in September 2021, uh, highlighted in bold in the statement. Note that a small modification has been made to alternative one under the widening season start date to address administrative deadlines. And so then below are the four, uh, the four items. Um, I will read the bolded items that are the, uh, uh, the final preferred alternatives. So for one, the widening season start date uh, for all widening sectors uh, as the FPA recommendation alternative one uh, with the additional note that uh, for to move all administrative deadlines associated with season start date to 45 days prior to the season start date. And for the second item, mothership processor obligation, uh, selection of alternative one, remove mothership processor obligation from regulation. Item three, mothership processor cap, uh, selection of alternative three, remove mothership processor cap from regulation. Uh, item four, mothership processor and catcher processor permit transfer. Alternative one, a vessel can be registered to a mothership permit and a CP permit in the same calendar year. Uh, sub option C, unlimited transfers. So then the next section is the gap rationale for support of the FPAs. The gap notes that the FPAs being recommended reflect years of hard work between each of the widening sectors to achieve industry-wide agreement as a means to facilitate council action. The GAP thanks participation from each of the sectors for the years of hard work they've put into this issue. An important outcome of this action will be to improve flexibility within the mothership sector to support increasing harvest and utilization. This will provide increased economic benefit to harvesters and processors. In addition to incorporating by reference the rationale contained in the GAP's September 2021 statement on this agenda item, the GAP would like to specifically highlight the following as the primary points of consideration that have occurred since September. Uh, one, for widening season start date. Moving the start of the widening season from to May 1st for all widening sectors will provide significant improvements in mothership sector utilization because it would allow an additional 15 days for widening operations and maintain parity and season structure for all widening sectors. As highlighted in the staff presentation, there are several administrative deadlines for the widening cooperatives associated with the season start date outside of the annual cooperative application and salmon mitigation plans as currently listed. National Marine Fisheries Service and Council staff suggest moving all of the deadlines to 45 days prior to the new season start date, i.e. March 17th, for consistency. The GAP supports this change in, as is reflected in revised alternative one in our report. Additionally, as clarified, as clearly detailed in the analytical document, changing the season start date to May 1 is unlikely to increase Chinook salmon incidental catch in all sectors ab above the widened fishery bycatch threshold of 11,000 fish. Moreover, overall impacts are likely to be well within those described in the 2017 biological opinion and consistent with management measures that govern um, incidental salmon harvest in the ground fish fisheries. It is also important to highlight as described in the analysis that projected Chinook impacts are precautionary, i.e. biased high, and based on projections where at sea sectors maximize effort beginning on May 1st when it is more likely that effort at the start of the season will follow the typical pattern of vessels entering the fishery over the course of the final two weeks, not all at once. Uh, the second section, mothership obligation. The GAP recommends removal of the mothership processor obligation deadline as selection of alternative one at the FPA. The analysis outlines the origin of the requirement when the amendment 20 was developed in the and the stated reason of providing some certainty to both the mothership processing companies and the mothership CVs when annually organizing the widening mothership cooperative harvest um, and business plans for the upcoming year. 
as the Amendment 20 catch share program has matured over the past decade, participants believe this obligation deadline requirement of November 1st of the previous year really has no benefit to either the mothership processing companies or to the mothership CV fleet owners. Rather, it could limit the flexibility of a CV wanting to deliver to another mothership vessel or company if it had obligated to a different company. As noted in the analysis, the widening mothership CVs currently obligate the catch through private agreements and indirectly within the mothership cooperative agreement. The processor obligation is a unique feature of the fishery that does not occur in other fisheries, and the GAP, GAP agrees that this could instead be best handled through private arrangements between CVs and processor. There is also a NIMS cost saving, saving benefit with the elimination of the MS processor obligation in that NIMS would not need to track the annual obligations of the MS CVs nor receive the annual obligation applications from CV owners. Third, mothership processor cap. The original intent of the 45% processing cap expressed at the time of the Amendment 20 discussions was to ensure that at least three MS processing companies participated in the fishery so the MSCV fleet had multiple markets to choose from to deliver their cooperative amounts. Removing the current 45% cap on the processing by individual MS company will provide flexibility when conditions of the fishery might warrant that one of the current MS processing companies will process more than 45% of the sector's harvest amount. While the original intent was to ensure that at least three entities participate, in reality, the cap does nothing to ensure participation. However, it could serve to limit participation if a CV was prevented from delivering to an MS processor that had capped out. The gap appreciates staff clarification that removing the MS processor cap from regulation will not result in excessive shares in violation of the Magnuson-Stevens Act, National Standard 4, since this change will not affect opportunity to participate in the fishery. Item 4, MS processor and CP permit transfer. Since the pool of available at sea whiting processors is limited to the current MS and CP participants, the most likely entrant to the MS sector, if a traditional MS vessel is not able to participate, would be a vessel that participates as a CP via registration to an MS permit. This recommended change would allow a vessel that has been a CP to enter the MS sector by becoming registered to an MS permit in the same calendar year and allow a vessel that has been registered to an MS permit to enter the CP sector by becoming a registered to a CP permit in the same calendar year. Permit transferability would provide a means to increase availability of MS platforms available to take deliveries from CVs, thereby increasing MS sector utilization while maintaining the sector structure that is shoreside MS and CP that is foundational to the non-tribal whiting fishery. Allowing an unlimited number of transfers provides the fleet with the most flexibility to support increased MS sector utilization. Over time, the number of participants in the MS and CP sector can change within the closed class of each sector because of shipyard schedules, other operational necessities, and the widening total allowable catch. In some years, it is likely that a limitation on transfers would result in a vessel not entering the MS sector as that vessel would not be able to exit the sector and participate as a CP. Thus, a transfer limitation could be counterproductive to the purpose of the action. Regarding the question of whether MS and CP permits can be simultaneously registered to one vessel that is stacked, the GAP suggests the Council consider the merits of allowing this to occur. While the GAP does not have a strong opinion on whether MS and CP permits can be registered simultaneously to one vessel, we highlight that simultaneous registration appears consistent with the purpose and need of this action because it would ease the administrative constraints that hinder utilization in the MS sector. While operational aspects of switching between CP and MS modes could contain the utility of stack permits, for example, because of the time it takes to change crew and deck configurations, 
the added flexibility could be beneficial in more swiftly getting MS platforms on the grounds for MSCV deliveries and would reduce the administrative burden on industry and NIMPS because permit transfer transfers would be reduced. And then in the section here, there's a section of gap recommendations, and they are the same as read earlier under the uh, FPAs. And that concludes the report. Thank you very much, Jeff. Are there questions uh, from the council on the gap report? Uh, Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, page three of your report under uh, the MS processor cap section. Um, when you're talking about, uh, in reality, the cap does nothing to ensure participation. However, it could serve to limit participation if a CV was prevented from delivering to an MS processor that had capped out. I just want to be clear, you're talking that it would limit participation on the part of the CVs. Yes. Okay. And, well, I guess it could limit increased participation on the part of the mothership. As well. Yes. Got it. Thank you very much. All right, thank you for the question. Any further questions on the GAP report? All right, thanks very much, Jeff. Uh, that concludes our reports and takes us to public comment. So we'll take a moment to get that up on the screen here. Uh, we have five uh, folks who have signed up. So we'll take them in the order on the screen. Werner Wilson, welcome Mr. Wilson. All right, we'll come back. Uh, Brent Payne. Brent? Yes, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and, uh, and members of the Pacific Council. My name is Brent Payne. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, good, good afternoon, Brent. Yeah, uh, so United Catch Boats represents the interest of 13 of the mothership permit holders. Um, just want to give you a little bit of, uh, of a, um, a background of the mothership sector. So UCB supports the PPA that the council approved at your last fall meeting, and we urge you to take final action at this meeting on this action and, and finish it up. Uh, the council has been working on this for, I don't know, five or six years. And um, uh, although um, um, there, there are four elements in here, I think they will, they will work towards uh, the benefit of, of getting more fish out of the water. Really appreciate the uh, analysis that council staff has done on this. I think they've given you a very good understanding of what might happen if these changes are implemented shortly. Uh, just to give you an idea of the mothership sector, currently roughly between 15 to 20 vessels at any given time are fishing in the mothership sector when the fishery starts off. We have a, a kind of a, a bimodal fishery. You know, it starts in May finishes up, most of the boats go north to fish Pollock for the bee season during the summer months, and then some of the fleet comes back and, and does the, the fall cleanup fishery. Um, give you an example, the UCB vessels that participate in this fishery are the Arctic Fury, Mark One, Pacific Fury, the Traveler, Western Dawn, Pacific Challenger, Mir Malak, um, the Sea Storm, uh, Sea Dawn. So those are the real active vessels that are active in, in the United Catch Boats organization that are in the mothership sector. Um, they deliver to, to there's six active, per, well, there's six permits in the mothership sector that six platforms that could be out there. They are held in ownership by four companies. So PPLP owns two of them, the Excellence and the Phoenix. Arctic Storm owns two of the permits. That's the Arctic Forward and the Arctic Storm. American Seafoods has one vessel, well, one permit. They usually use the Ocean Rover that can change it, it, it from year to year. And the Golden Alaska company owns the Golden Alaska. So there are uh, really four active companies, six possible vessels, but at any given time over the recent years, we really only have seen about four vessels buying fish from, from about 20 boats. That's what we're talking about here. So um, 
So it, it, in, in terms of the season start date, we recommend that you move the season forward by two, two weeks to May 1st. You know, we originally asked that you look at the, moving it even further earlier in the year and, the, you know, 30 days forward, but that was dropped because of concerns about Chinook bycatch. Really appreciate the gaps comments and the, the analysis that shows that they, they really don't see any additional uh, increase in, in Chinook salmon encounter rates if you've moved the season forward by, by two weeks. So we support that. In terms of getting rid of the obligation, that really is an artifact of the original Amendment 20. And it, as the analysis points out and the gap statement points out, it's really an um, uh, uh, arcane artifact. It doesn't do any good. We have private contracts that, that govern the, the uh, ob, you know, how, what vessels are going to fish for what particular market on a given basis. In terms of the, the processor cap, that, that's been the kind of the big issue this week. You know, UCB's position is on unlimited cap. We, we don't have fears of consolidation at this time. Could it happen? Yes, it could happen. You know, we're seeing an awful lot of consolidation in the Bering Sea pollock fishery now. You know, hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent acquiring vessels and consolidation. Would that happen in the mothership whiting sector? You know, given the companies that are involved here right now in this day and age, I don't see it as a concern, but yeah, it might happen. Um, but I, I can't guarantee anything at this point. The only thing I know is that every year, the whiting mothership sector has some sort of new thing that pops up and we need the flexibility to address those problems. And so that's what this package of amendments does is gives the fleet a little bit more flexibility to try and get more fish out of the water. And, and lastly, the, the permit, um, you know, being able to have a, a, a CP and a, and, a, and a mothership permit transfer in any, any given year. We support the, the PPA on that one as well. It gives the, the company that has you know, catcher processors and, and mothership permit a little bit more flexibility to, to put more uh, vessel time out on the water for, in the mothership mode. So um, I think I'll stop my comments, Mr. Chairman, at, at that state. I mean, the, I don't know if this is the panacea this is going to fix the mothership sector. I, I don't think it necessarily is. There are still some, some bigger issues here involved in the structure of this rationalization program for the mothership sector. That, uh, But it's, it's going to go a long way to getting uh, us a little bit closer to the, the shoreside sector and the catcher processor sector in terms of utilization. So uh, uh, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop right now and leave you five minutes. Thank you very much, Brent. Are there questions of Brent? Uh, Corey. Thanks, Brent, and thanks for being here. Um, also, I, I want to, first of all, my question is going to narrow in, but I want to echo much of what you said about uh, all the hard work from folks and, and especially from, from industry in, in bringing this, this package um, forward and, and do also um, so, uh, but my question is on, as you know, we've, we've had uh, some opportunity to talk. The one question, at least for, from my mind, is, is, is on this, um, the processing cap. So I just want to maybe pull out what you said there in conclusion and ask you maybe to elaborate, if you would, a little bit more. What I heard you say was, you know, consolidation's happening in the North Pacific. In the pollock fishery, it, it's maybe not as much uh, a risk down here. You don't you don't have a, a real fear. Um, yeah, but the the trade off, it, you know, your 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 the trade off there in terms of helping with utilization is is that unexpected things happen in this fishery, and then the cap might have some potential to to um, keep keep you all from um, adapting to those unusual circumstances. But I guess I just to frame the question. I just I want to like what what is the difference in your mind between? To, uh, I see uh, while well, I can see raising the cap to address some of those issues. But just can you again explain the advantage of of something like a higher cap? We have a sixty five percent and an eighty percent or in the range of alternatives here and taking it off completely. But what's the difference between sixty five percent and and taking it off in your mind when we haven't seen? Um, the current cap, at least, it be hit uh, yet. Yeah. Uh, through the chair, thank you, uh, Corey. Um, well, I guess, so the, the first thing that was kind of a shaker was when the excellence in the Phoenix merged, I don't know how many years ago, eight or nine. 
you know, that took two companies that each had the 45% cap and now they, which could have been, you know, 70% and that forced them to be under the 45%. So the Phoenix Excellence, those two platforms have to stay under 45%. And, and that's the one company that did stop fishing or buying fish because they reached the 45% cap at one time after that merger. Secondly, you know, the, the Arctic Storm Arctic Fjord is also a two vessel, two permit company that also falls under the 45 percent cap so that's a, could be a possibly constraining for those two companies um the gold alaska they, they never even come close to 45 percent because they just aren't you know they have a couple vessels that deliver to them so that's not a big concern and then american always has one permit um that's the current status quo um so what could happen in the future the difference between 60 and 100 and no cap that's your kind of your question um you know, 60s is good. 60s is in the right direction. <laughs> I, I don't know if, I mean, 60 would result in just requiring two, two separate platforms to be out there, two separate companies. Um, I think we're going to need more than one company out there. I mean, the goal of, you know, of, 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 of my members is to get as many platforms out there as possible buying fish so we can get the fish out of the water. Um, you know, like I said, when I started about the, the characteristics of the fishery, there, there are, on, on average, on the low end, 15 vessels fishing in the mothership sector. And on the high end, you might see, 20, on average, it's 17 to 20 vessels in any given one of our, our fishing pools. So that means, you know, you need, you need more, uh, platforms out there, processor platforms out there that can buy fish from 17 to 20 individual vessels during the, the, the peak of the season. One vessel's not going to cut it. You're going to need three to four vessels out there for us to have a utilized fishery. So I don't know, um, Gory, if that answers your question or not. Um, there's not much difference between 60 and unlimited, to tell you the truth, to answer your question directly. Corey? Yeah, thank you, Brent. Thank you for uh, understanding my not well-articulated question. That was, that was really helpful. All right, are there further questions of Brent? Oh, Mr. Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Brent, for the excellent testimony. And I just had one question for you. What, what into the spectrum of relating to whiting allocation does the, ca the cap affect most when the, when the allocation is low, stock is low, or when it's high? And, and would it be better to have a higher limit on the lower end or on the higher end? Hmm. Yeah, through the chair, uh, Mr. Mr. So yes, uh, relative to, to current conditions, we've had very high, high uh, widening TACs. Uh, I think it, it, it would be more of a concern when the, the tax get, get quite a bit lower. Um, so that would be a, be a, a bigger concern. Um, uh, when the tax get lower, you know, for example, the Golden Alaska makes a decision that they just say it's really not worth it. We're not going to go. So they drop out completely. So that drops you down to, to three companies with the five permits. And then the, the, the companies that have multiple permits, well, they say, um, well, we're just going to drop it down to one vessel out there instead of two. So, for example, the Phoenix might not go, but the Excellence will go, or the Americans, you know, U.S. or uh, Arctic Storm will just say we're just going to put the storm out there and not the fjord. Um, so, and that's when the uh, you know the the, the hey TAC get, get, gets in a lower amount. So it's more of a concern when the when the biomass is lower. Thank you, Brent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, any further questions? Maggie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for the testimony, Brent. Um, in your experience, does the number of companies with mothership platforms buying fish on the grounds in, in any season, any pool, have any effect on price paid for that fish to catcher vessels? Through the chair, Maggie, could you ask that question again? Uh, I, I'm trying to think about, is it is a question about the different seasonal aspects of price or when you talk about pools or, or could you just rephrase your question, please? Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Brent, I'm sorry for the lack of clarity. 
does the number of motherships, does the number of companies with motherships buying fish affect the price? Do, do catcher vessels, does competition among more yeah, Ms. companies? Ms. Summers, I, I, sure, I understand your question. Um, Thank you. So is, if, if we, I guess the question is, if there's more platforms out there, more individual companies, does, does, is, is, is the competition such that, that the price, ex vessel price might go up? You know, I, I got to say, I'm not involved in pricing. That's not, uh, UCB is not a negotiating 501c type of organization. But I would speculate, <laughs> speculate, I might get, <laughs> might get a phone call after I say this answer, though. But uh, I don't think it does, Ms. Summers. I, I don't think it, it does. Thank you, Brent. Further questions of Brent? Thank you very much, Brent. Yep, thanks very much for, for listening to my comments. Sure, and we've been at this uh, a little over two hours, so we're going to take a 10-minute break here. I have 318, we're back at 328. We'll finish up public comment and move on to council action.
If everyone could please uh, make their way back. short a few council members here we'll give them another minute to come back and then we'll get started here So, and Vanderhoeven, you're next. So, we're going to get started here in a moment. All right, welcome, Anne. Um, thank you. Sound check, Mr. Chair. Loud and clear. Great, thank you so much, um, Mr. Chair, council members. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comment today. My name is Ann Vanderhoven with Arctic Storm Management Group. I also submitted written comments that are posted in your online portal. Um, Arctic Storm has two um, mothership vessels with um, we also have one catcher vessel that participates in both the mothership and shoreside sectors. I'd like to thank you for keeping this package moving. It's been a long time coming, but I think we've got some great consensus positions coming out of this um, meeting. And I'd like to especially thank staff. I think you have an excellent analysis in front of you that considers um, a full range of alternatives um, and supports adopting the PPA you selected in September for your final preferred alternative at this meeting. I'm going to focus my comments today on the processor processing cap element. Um, there are plenty of permits out there and there's nothing in this action that eliminates those permits. The problem boils down to those existing permits are not being used. For whatever reason, other companies are choosing to bypass mother shipping in the whiting fishery. And that's left several catcher vessels unable to secure a market for their fish. Any of those existing mothership permits can re-enter the fishery at any time. Raising the cap is not going to motivate a company that's not already choosing to participate to start participating now. And while the analysis is clear that the current cap has not been constraining for companies yet, a company like ours is unable to take on additional catcher vessels and provide that market because when fishing is good, if we're overcommitted, um, when we would, it, 
we would be put in the untenable position at some point mid-season where we would have to pick and choose which catcher vessels to cut off. That's not going to get additional fish out of the water or make the sector function any better. In a low tack year or fishing is really good and fast, like we've seen sometimes, a cap at 65 or 85 percent would likely just put us right back in the same situation we're trying to fix with this action. It's pie, right? And so are you talking about a Costco pie or a normal size pie? And that's going to influence how many boats you can take on. Um, and so with our new build coming online, we anticipate being able to spend more time in the spring whiting fishery before going to Alaska for the Pollock bee season. That means um, that makes it even more important to a company like ours that's already committed to participating in the mothership whiting fishery to be able to take on additional catcher vessels. I don't think it can be said enough that the catcher vessels are asking for relief here and have stated their position that they are comfortable with no processing cap in the mothership sector, nor can it be said enough that this is the only processing cap in the fishery. We strongly encourage you to adopt the PPA for final action at this meeting. You've been discussing ways to make the, sec the sector and fishery function better for several years, and the elements in this package will help do that. I thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Anne. Are there questions of Anne on her public testimony? Thank you very much, Anne. And from Ann to Heather Mann. Welcome, Heather. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, council members. My name is Heather Mann. I'm here on behalf of the Midwater Trawlers Cooperative. MTC represents 30 trawl catcher vessels. They're home ported from Brookings, Oregon, up to Kodiak, Alaska. 25 of our members fish whiting, and some MTC members are the vessels that you've heard about in the past that have left some or all of their mothership allocations in the water uh, for one or even more seasons. Uh, before I address this particular topic, I do wanna thank the council for your many past actions to support the whiting fishery in general. They have not gone unnoticed and it is much appreciated. So we started on this, correct, uh, this current path in 2017, so almost six years ago. Well, actually, I guess we started down this road even before that with the five-year review for the trawl ITQ program. Several boat owners testified at a field hearing in Newport about the lack of processing markets in the mothership sector and being at the mercy of a closed class of processors. We were then encouraged to drop this issue from the follow-on actions that came out of the review. Agreeing to do that was probably our first mistake. Fast forward, and there continued to be seasons where some vessels left some or all of their quota in the water. The boat owners and captains of these vessels have testified in front of you many times. Some even believe they were retaliated against for doing so. A subset of us, uh, United Catcher Boats, MTC, and Sarah Nayani, when she was with the Arctic Storm, we worked together and brought this issue back to the council with some possible solutions. But you all directed us to go back to the mothership industry and find some consensus positions if possible. We held a mothership wide meeting outside the council process, took a lot of time and energy to pull it off. The processors enjoy a closed class and we're not willing to give much. So we walked away with only a few solutions that the processors would agree to, but we had industry wide consensus. And that was a really good start. We reported the findings back to the council and the council prioritized getting something on the agenda in the future. Workload got in the way and we were bumped. Then the other whiting sectors got involved and they said what they would agree to, what they wouldn't agree to. So the issue went from improving the mothership sector to including all three whiting sectors. And I think it's important to note that MTC members are highly dependent, not just on the mothership sector, but the shoreside fishery as well. Uh, anything that we contemplated for changes to the mothership sector, we are always thinking about the shoreside sector. Regardless, um, things got watered down even further. And then we capitulated to the state of California on the at-sea processing south of the Oregon-California border. 
even though it's totally legal to fish south of the border, our processor can't follow us. We know now that directed salmon fisheries actually discard far more fish annually than the whiting sector interacts with. But now to expand that opportunity, we have to plead our case that this item should be prioritized over all the other very important items on the docket, and then hope the council will support an EFP to allow this type of activity to occur. So the solutions continued to dwindle. Next, we further acquiesced to our salmon colleagues who had concerns about starting the Hake fishery a month earlier and what that might mean for salmon. So we narrowed our solutions even more by eliminating two additional weeks off the preferred start date. So now we have a package, six years in the making, ready for final action. The reality is that the mothership sector has all the burden of being fully rationalized, but not all the benefits. It really is one of the most difficult fisheries to participate in, in terms of managing the pools. It's at the mercy of the closed class of processors uh, and their participa participation in the Pollock fishery, which as people know is a billion dollar fishery, B, billion. Uh, catcher vessels in the mothership sector have to pay sea state and we pay for cooperative management since cost recovery was implemented in 2014 the mothership catcher vessels have paid 1.5 million to the agency for management of the fishery the catcher vessels are responsible for paying 100 percent monitoring and these vessels also pay toward the buyback loan 5.5 uh, million to date and recall that the buyback was the first step uh, to reducing trial capacity, which made the ITQ program even possible in the first place. And we still owe $11 million. The mothership sector has never performed as it was intended for the independent catcher vessel. There's something wrong when a fisherman who earned his history through years of hard work, there's something wrong when he cannot find a market to take that fish. Some have said, well, the non-whiting fishermen can't deliver all the history that they've earned. And that may be true, but it's not the same. Shoreside participants have opportunities that don't exist at sea, whether that's buying or selling quota or even a processor expanding their activities uh, or even a new one coming in. We don't have those luxuries in the mothership sector. We have six permits owned by four companies. And look, we're not talking just a million pounds here and there left in the water. We're talking over 25 million pounds for one vessel alone. And that vessel then had to go out and lease shoreside quota to keep the boat working. Next, COVID shined a really bright light at what wasn't working in the sector. The council and NIMS passed emergency rules to encourage a mothership platform to be a mothership platform. <laughs> and not focus on CP fishing first. If that role had not been implemented, three more catcher vessels would have been without a market. Can I blame them for those decisions? If I'm honest with myself, no, not really. They're working to maximize their business plans just as we are. And the current structure allows the processors to do that, but not really the independent catcher vessel. The CVs have come to the table for the last six years trying to make the fishery better. Independent mothership catcher vessels are literally at the bottom of the food chain. The changes being considered today may result in some improvements to the sector, but it will be far from a game changer. And it requires a lot of things to fall into place, like having mothership platforms on the grounds and ready to go on May 1st, like having platforms willing to process during the summer months. There's nothing in this package that requires those things. There's nothing in this package that requires or encourages competition. And anything currently in the program designed to encourage competition has failed. So I have many friends and colleagues that are in the mothership sector. Don't interpret my comments as anti-processor. Those of you who know me know full well that I worked for shoreside processors for more than 14 years but I think that allows me to bring a unique perspective to the discussion. The ultimate fix here may be absorbing the mothership sector into the ITQ program, granting the mothership processors a certain percentage of quota, then fishermen could deliver shoreside or at sea across the two sectors. 
Now that would create some competition, but that's not what we are looking at today. We are looking at four options. Two are mostly housekeeping, the other two, the earlier start date and the processing cap. That's all we have right now after six years to try to provide a small level of relief to the mothership catch of vessels, that's it. So finally, MTC supports the GMT and GAP statements. The analysis is well done and solidly supports the four PPAs from September to FPAs now. And I hope the council considers the hard work to reach consensus on these four options. Again, thank you to the council for your work on whiting sector as a whole. Whiting is so important to our coastal communities and we're under so many different threats. Now, offshore wind development, you know, the Oregon call areas, uh, hundreds of millions of pounds of sustainable whiting has been harvested from there. And it's not just us. I believe all fishermen and processors across sectors and gears and geography, we're all facing what feels like insurmountable challenges. This package makes a small but very important dent in those challenges facing the mothership whiting fleet. Thank you for your consideration and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Heather. Are there questions for Heather? Chris Svensson? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for your testimony, Heather. I um, just have a question about the, the fisheries you re referenced up north and, and billion dollar fisheries for catcher vessels. Um, do you know percentage wise or, or number of vessels, how many of them are, are participating in Alaskan fisheries? Um, meaning, are, is everybody impacted when motherships go north or, or is it a percentage of the folks we're talking about? I'd, I'd just be interested in learning a bit more about what that looks like. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Krista, for the question. Um, several catcher vessels leave um, Oregon and Washington and they head north in January of each year. Um, the, the Pollock fishery, the AFA fishery starts on January 20th. I believe the cod fishery generally starts around that time too, though we've had some delays with voluntary catch share programs up there, spreading that out. And those are A season fisheries. Um, but it just depends on where you're fishing and who you're fishing for and what the rotations are um, to get your A season fish in. So I could, Look, and Brent probably has the numbers handy on exactly how many vessels go up to fish Pollock, but I do know that the MTC vessels from Oregon are all back here um, well before the May 15th date, generally, to start gearing up for Pacific Whiting. Um, I can think of maybe one Oregon boat that might have stayed up to fish B season, but what our boats generally do is trade. Um, B season quota with other boats so they can catch more in the A season and then be back down here for Pacific Whiting in the, in the, uh, when they would otherwise be in the B season. All the mothership processors, as far as I am aware, participate up north um, in the Pollock fishery. And I know that in the past couple of years, the uh, the TAC has been high, it's lower this year, but it's also taken a little bit longer to catch the Pollock due to a variety of other um, challenges. And so when that happens, you know, the mothership processors who are either acting as a mothership or even a catcher processor up there, um, they will stay and catch that Pollock first. My understanding is it's just much more valuable than coming down for Pacific Whiting. So I hope that helps. Yes, thank you. And, and thank you for addressing both A and B season so that I didn't need a follow-up question. Thanks. Further questions? Corey. Forgot the button there. Uh, yeah, thank you, Heather. Yeah, thanks for, I, you did a nice rundown of how long this has taken and, and appreciate your effort and dialogue throughout. I just didn't quite quick catch something you said um, you, 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 um, gave the example of the emergency rule that allowed the catcher processor to use the same boat as a mothership, uh, during the pandemic. And then you said that the catcher vessel didn't have the same opportunity. Was that relating to what you kind of ended up with about how to create more competition 
in the sector? Am I, am I, can you just elaborate on that? I, I just didn't, didn't get the point you were making there about the uh, catch a processor operating as a mothership vessel. Um, Mr. Chairman, Corey, thanks for the question. I think I, um, I'll just walk through it that, uh, you know, I was bringing up the fact that COVID had shined this bright light and that um, one of the companies that only has one mothership permit let their catcher vessels know that they were going to focus on their CP fish first if they didn't have an emergency rule that would let them be a CP and a mothership in the same year. And without the council supporting that and NIMS implement, implementing that, those catcher vessels, three of them at least, would not have had a mothership market. So I think what I was trying to do there was just demonstrate the different flaws that currently exist within the sector and that you know the catcher vessel particularly the independent catcher vessel is really at the mercy of the decisions that the processor makes in terms of competition you know i was saying that if we really care about competition and want to create something then we should absorb the mothership sector into the shoreside sector. Give mothership processors an allocation similar as we did to shoreside processors and let shoreside processors and mothership processors compete for fish, that the fishermen could take their fish you know, either way at sea or shoreside. That would create a lot of competition. It's really hard to see now anything that is creating competition in the mothership sector. Um, you know, I've never understood how, and I've I worked closely with Sarah and Donna before, and even Dale at Arctic Storm. You know, I've never understood how they, I mean, it seems like they can sell every single whiting that they can harvest, where other um, other platforms either don't have those markets or aren't interested or it's just not worth it to them. I don't, I don't know the answers there. Um, but it just doesn't feel like there's any competition. If anything, I've got catcher vessels that are just calling around begging to be able to get their fish out of the water, you know, agreeing even to lesser price or doing something. Cause even if you're leasing that fish out to somebody else in the mothership sector, maybe a vertically integrated catcher vessel, um, you're still not making the kind of money to support your, you know, your business that you'd be making if you were fishing that fish. So it doesn't appear to me that there, that's what I meant when I said there aren't anything, you know, in the existing program, whatever's in there that's supposed to be promoting competition, it's not working. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Heather. Definitely appreciate it. Thank you. Maggie. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Heather. Heather, can you speak to um, how you would see the the mothership processor cap, the higher cap alternatives affect the catcher vessels you represent compared to the no cap alternative? Sure. Uh, thank you for the question, Maggie, through the chair. I think I, I see a couple of different things. First, it's really hard to get on the council agenda to get things done. And so for, the, for my guys, I would like to be proactive, uh, eliminate the cap so that we're not back in front of the council asking for an emergency action to do so. If we only have a couple of platforms that are down here buying Hake and you have one that is willing to take on more vessels, but can't because of the cap, then we will be in that situation. Um, people say, well, that is a rare situation. It probably, you know, you don't know if it'll happen. If the whiting tack drops, which it will eventually, we are gonna find ourselves in that situation where a processor is gonna say, I'm gonna do better with Pollock. I'm gonna stay up North. I'm not even bothered with the the price of fuel, 
everything we have to do with COVID, switching out crew. I'm not even going to go down and fish whiting. And that's their decision to make. Again, it's not, I'm not trying to say they shouldn't, they have to make those decisions. But where does that leave us? And so if we only have one vessel that's willing and able, that stays down on the grounds all summer long and has the markets to sell this fish, it could negatively impact the ability to get that fish out of the water. That's how I look at it. And I, I know people are so tired because people have said it before on the council floor of hearing from the whiting industry. Um, why does the whiting industry always get the attention? Why are they being prioritized? And I don't want to have to come do that for, for something that we can be proactive about and eliminate. And I keep thinking to myself, what am I missing? What am I missing here? Because if anybody were to be worried about eliminating the processing cap, it should be the catcher vessels. But trying to game it out and think of unintended consequences, I can't think of anything. I can only think of how it could hurt us in the future and take up more precious time trying to get it fixed. So those are, those are the things that I've been thinking about. Um, and so 65%, I mean, that could, that could have an impact. 85% could have an impact. I just would rather it not be a barrier to flexibility. Hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, any further questions of Heather Mann? Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dan Waldeck. Welcome, Dan. Here we go. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Gorelnik. Uh, you can hear me, yes? Loud and clear. Great. It is good to hear your voice. I certainly look forward to the time we can all meet together again. I, I, um, I miss those interactions greatly. Um, I am Dan Waldeck, Executive Director of the Pacific Whiting Conservation Cooperative. We represent the catcher processor vestals that participate in the whiting fishery. Um, I'll be relatively brief. We, we thank the council for the time and attention that you've given to this important matter. Um, and as Ms. Mann spoke, the council has, has made uh, extraordinary efforts over the last decade or so to um, help tune the whiting fishery to perform um, as best we can to optimize things for us. And, and this is another step in that direction of, of optimizing the whiting fishery. And so we, we thank you for this important action. Um, I can't help but say that we also truly appreciate the work that Ms. Dorpinghouse and Mr. Weedeff have done. Um, it's, it is a, a great analysis, it's informative, and I think it is, it's all the council needs to make your decision today on an FPA. Um, I also wanna call out that the, 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 the way that, that Jesse and Brett have worked through this process, the collaborative approach that they've, they've taken to engage with industry, to ask us questions, to ask for our input, to, to care about our perspectives. Uh, it, is, it is truly, um, it's, it's worth mentioning and it's remarkable in some ways. And so I really greatly appreciate that. Um, you know, in short, we support the GAP report and the recommendations therein. Uh, the GAP provided rationale back in September when you took the PPA, and the GAP again has provided strong rationale for the council to make a decision today on an FPA. Um, we support their recommendation to adopt the PPA from September 2021 as the FPA. Um, and then I also want to call out uh, in, in Ms. Dorpingtow's presentation, she had a clarification for alternative one about this question of simultaneous registration. And uh, on one hand, I'm, I'm somewhat um, concerned about leaving an open question for the fishery service to implement the most efficient way, um, but I don't have all the answers today. I think the gap provides a, a strong rationale that, that allowing stacking could be the most efficient process for uh, this, this permit transfer between motherships and CPs. Again, I, I would leave it to the, to, the, to the wise voices on the council to think about how to handle this question posed by staff. Um, to my perspective, I think the gap provides a strong rationale that allowing stacking might be the most efficient way. And so I just pose that um, as an answer to the question that staff has um, put forward in front of you. Uh, so thank you for your time today. I'm available for questions. Um, again, thanks. Thank you very much, Dan. Are there questions for Dan? All right, Dan, I think you get away scot-free here. I don't see any hands. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you, Chairman. 
All right, that concludes uh, public comment. That takes us to our council action here, which is to um, adopt a final preferred alternative as appropriate. Um, so let's have some discussion and eventually I hope a motion. Brad Pettinger. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Um, you know, one of the things about the mothership sector that's kind of perplexed me is that the processors wanted to close class, uh, but then didn't feel any obligation that they had to come down here and process the fish. And I think that basically stranding fish where the people couldn't uh, couldn't sell it. I just, I always thought that was a wrong to the fleet. And I think that, um, um, I think that the, what we see today is oh, going a long ways maybe to fix fix that matter as far as make sure the vessels get the uh, willing buyers will be actually able to sell to uh, willing sellers. We talk about uh, consolidation and people worried about that on the, on the processor side. And I'm trying to think about how that could be an issue. Uh, there's four companies own six permits currently. Um, and the word becoming an issue, I believe, would, if someone would come in and buy all those permits. And I'm kind of curious, uh, looking at uh, to Rose over there, is um, how would how would the NOAA GC re, uh, view that? As would they would that be? Would they would see issues there with antitrust if someone would buy all the uh, catch your vessel um, mothership medallions? So I'll stop right there and ask Rose. Through the chair. Thank you, Mr. Pettinger. Um, I think right now that because there are no permit ownership limits in the mothership sector, that there would be no prohibition from someone buying all of the permits. I don't see an avenue currently for legal review. Interesting. Okay. And that's, that's all. You have a follow up? Um, I'm good for that. Okay. Right Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think uh, most people know this is where my roots are. This is, I've been in this battle since day one to try to get more flexibility in the mothership sector. And we've worked through this and the council's worked through this and the agents, uh, agencies worked through it. And we've had, you know, a lot of collaboration to get this to the, to the council floor. We've had, at the beginning, we had companies that were adamantly opposed to removing a, a processor limit. And now that very same company, one of them, is, is, is supporting this. And I think the flexibility that it would bring, it's 11 years later we're talking about this, right? It's 11 years after the fact, and there were a lot of fears to begin with of how this might be when it started. What might happen? But the track record shows that there's not a lot of consolidation. And I would note that I had never considered the fact about permits being purchased because this is a processing limit is what it is. It's not a, it's not an ownership of a permit limit. It's not that at all. So I don't, I think the flexibility given this, like, Heather Mann noted, it's not the panacea, it's not gonna fix all the problems, but it's gonna go a long way to getting people markets and having the flexibility to do so. There aren't just spare ships floating around looking to process. This is a very specific purpose. That's why we ventured into having, being able to have CPs and motherships in the same year. That's why that was even brought up, because if you don't have a mothership that's existing or a CP, there's very little options for any other kind of vessel that could produce the, the volume efficiently and economically to, to even be in that sector. So I see the concern of removing the processing cap. I see that concern, but I really don't think that any, I don't see the, the chance of, of us stranding anybody at the end or having just one processor on the grounds. I was out there fishing the year that 
the quota was probably its lowest in, in that we knew about. And the price was in the toilet. And we still had three processors on the grounds. Two of them didn't stay very long. The price was $60 a ton then. Nobody was paying for anything. I, one one hard-headed guy stayed there a long time. That'd be me. But uh, and caught a lot of fish. However, didn't make a lot of money, but it, that's that's okay. Uh, I would say, it, my opinion is, I appreciate all the hard work Jesse did and Brett did to, to bring this forward and others. There's been others along the way. Appreciate council members that actually worked with industry to broker a, a deal to try to get this to us in a in a way that can be acceptable to everyone. I, I, the work the industry has done to avoid salmon, to be able to even do it, it's it's impressive. And so this looks like a very much fully supported proposal. Our GAP, GMT, the agency, I, I don't see us questioning this. I, I support the GAPs, what they're doing full, full, full hard, wholeheartedly. So I guess I could go on for days here, but I'll stop. And that's about all I have to say right now. Thank you. All right, thank you, Bob. Phil Anderson and then Maggie Summer. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll try to be fairly brief. Um, this has been, a, as Heather laid out the, the timeline, and I think Jesse did too, this has been a long, long process to get to this point here today. Uh, I think the perseverance that the industry has shown is, is a commendable. Um, and I think as Heather in her testimony talked about the steps along the way and, and the package was bigger to begin with and pieces of it uh, were taken off as we went along uh, due to due to the um, controversy maybe around it and the difficulty to, to move it forward and and there's certainly been despite how long it's been there there's been a sense of urgency to get this done because of the situation that the mothership sector finds themselves in relative to the proportion of their quota that they've been able to take out of the water um, I, I really appreciated being invited to the industry meeting that Heather referenced. It was it was in not too far from the Portland airport. And I got a chance to hear firsthand some of the difficulties that they were having. And uh, so thank you for that. Um, and um, so, and, I, and I, I greatly appreciate the work that was done in the sector to bring to the council after we asked them to um, a, a suite of, of uh, measures that there was consensus around. And, and we all know that that's no small task for them to achieve. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge that as well. Um, on the processor cap issue, um, I remember, as amazing it may seem, I remember in 2011 the 45 percent. I remember, um, at least from my perspective, what the intent was at that time, and it was pretty simple. We wanted to try to make sure there are at least three companies that could participate in the fisheries, and that wouldn't uh, wouldn't uh, there wouldn't be excessive consolidation or. Uh, shares kind of thing um, and um, and it really was in in my mind at that time it was um, to try to keep the catcher vessels from being disadvantaged um, it, I don't ever recall thinking that it would that it ensured that three companies would continue to participate I just recall that um, we wanted to ensure that there were at least three companies that were able to and uh, qualified to participate in the fishery. I suppose if if I um, had my druthers, I would uh, I might um, ease into this a little bit more than just pulling it off. Uh, but at, at the same time, I think 
um, people that are in this business that have um, uh, evaluated all the potential negative consequences of taking it off or, or searched for them and uh, haven't been able to find them. And they, and they have been that, and that, that, that thought process um, has certainly uh, been a part of the representatives of the catcher vessels that have testified before us. And um, so um, I'm going to be prepared to support the PPA if that's what comes forward as a motion. Um, and I just appreciate all the work that's gone into this, all the work that staff has put in to help us analyze and make sure we've thoroughly thought this through. And uh, lastly, just I, what I really hope most of all is that the one or more of these measures will really help the mothership sector and that they'll be able to get a greater portion of their quota out of the water. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Maggie? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I intend to offer a motion when ready, so I'll, I'll save most of my remarks for then. Uh, just wanted to um, also express my uh, uh, appreciation to staff for the very thorough analytical document. As Phil said, the reminder at the beginning of today's presentation on the, the history of this issue was, was uh, a good one for us. I was at the Catch Share five-year review public hearings when this issue was uh, initially raised. And I think that the council's history of, of considering this action since then demonstrates our interest in responding to the need that the mothership catcher vessels described. Um, and uh, also maintaining fair and equitable access to uh, whiting by all of the sectors. I think I'll save the rest of my remarks for motion comments. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Maggie. Um, let me see if we're ready for a motion to see if there are any hands that go up. Corey. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Mr. Chair. Chris, I can see you out of the corner of my eye there. So thank this button thing. I'll get it down. Um, yeah. Uh, I think a lot of, of, of my thoughts have been said. I believe I was, I've was i been really impressed by, by, the, by this sector, by the mothership sector in particular, and in, in, in sticking with it, as Phil said, um, in terms of avoiding salmon bycatch, in terms of, you know, of, of, of paying for sea state, as Heather put it, and avoiding bycatch in a way that I would never thought was possible. Um, this, this action as a whole, or pieces of this action are, are going to help um, improve the situation for the sector. Um, for example, I think the uh, we heard we heard the benefit of the emergency action we took uh, last year or, or um, you know recently to allow an extra vessel to 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 participate as a, a CP and a mothership um, in the same year, which it alleviated a business choice that of the company had to make. Um, you know, extending the season two weeks really helps. The two weeks doesn't sound like a long time, but a lot of fish can come out of the water. And I think I, we didn't hear testimony today, but we've heard testimony last September that you know those two changes alone could you know up it by uh, twelve thousand metric tons or around thereabouts. Um, and yeah, like like uh, I'm probably a little more um, going to voice the the, the uh, viewpoint a little bit more um, more strongly than Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson, about the processor cap. Um, again, as I kind of let off in my question too, with uh, with with Jesse and the analysis, and I'm on, on this interpretation we've been hearing about National Standard Four, which first of all, I'm in no way am I saying that a decision here today w would violate the Magnuson Act in in my mind at all. Um, but the original intent of the of having the cap was we we made an allocation as uh, Brad said we closed the class we created a permit which is unusual for the processing sector, at least in, in our area. Um, 
and therefore that was an allocation and the Magnuson Act says we shall have you know, measures to prevent uh, excessive consolidation. So the allocation again was the permit, the cap was a measure. I think we've learned um, there are other pieces, you know, uh, affecting um, the, the prospects of consolidation here besides that cap. Maybe the cap isn't having effect. I don't, I don't, um, I don't know what the effect is. The analysis, I'm gonna complement the analysis, but it also doesn't go into what consolidation might look like. It doesn't address the probability. We, I do also trust uh, what Mr. Anderson says about in, Bob, a long time participant, that the odds do seem low, but you know, it's uncertain. Um, and so what, what the Magnuson Act says to do in my mind is to, to we have a purpose and need of increasing utilization and, and the trade-off is, you know, what's the probability of getting more fish out of the water? What's the probability of more consolidation? So what, I, what I've been hearing, you know, in, in, in listening and asking questions and, and, and uh, you know, all throughout this, um, especially focused after September uh, with this PPA is, you know, what is that probability that, that taking the cap off is going to improve utilization above and beyond the other parts of, of this package. And, you know, we heard in testimony that it, it, there was not going to be a big difference in most years in, 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 in regular circumstances. It's the difference between 65% and taking it off in terms of what comes out of the water. Um, it's, 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 it's an unforeseen circumstances type of thing. We haven't, we have a couple examples of where the existing cap of 49, 45%, excuse me, um, affected some some businesses, um, but on the whole, like as the analysis said, at least it looks like in terms of what was processed, it, it's at been most 20%. I don't think that captures the examples we've heard of where it did affect things, but so it hasn't really come into play. It's not been the cause. Um, it has not been the cause of, of, consult, of the lack of utilization. And, and you know, as, as we heard in testimony today, there is consolidation happening in the North Pacific. Is it going to happen down here that also uncertain, also unintended? The one thing I didn't hear Mr. Anderson say is what you said in September and, and before is, you know, the one extra risk there is if consolidation happens, you know, it's hard to, it's hard for the council to then to react to. So I'm, I'm weighing that factor of how do we react if it happens, maybe it's probability is low, um, yet how do we react? And then again, I think we're gonna meet the purpose and need of this action at least a little bit. I mean, as much as this action is going to, if with 65% with alternative, um, I, I'm gonna get it mixed up, but alternative two, the 65% would achieve the purpose and need is just as much as taking the cap off, except in a very, very small probability um, chances. But yeah, I think this is a, um, this, this is one of those decisions where it's, it's a, um, you know, just how you weigh those trade-offs and, and, and um, what, what is the probability of excessive, not even excessive consolidation, but more consolidation. You know, we heard, right, as it is now, the mother, the, the catcher vessels feel that they are, um, I don't want to use the phrase at the mercy, but I think that's what we heard of, of the few companies that are, are out there and who are making, as we heard, reasonable business choices to maximize their, their, their revenues. So consolidation, we don't, it doesn't, it's not gonna solve any of these issues. It's, it would make them worse. And 65% would, would have two, would have at least, I think we heard, you know, that's, that's two companies and that's what in most cases would solve people's problems. So that, that's my view. Um, and again, I, I don't think there's a clear answer and, and reasonable people can weigh those trade-offs differently. And uh, yeah, looking forward to, to Maggie's motion. Thank you, Corey. Let's see if there's any other discussion before we receive a motion. I don't want to cut off discussion, but I don't see any hands. So Maggie, if you have a motion, and I imagine that may prompt some additional discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the council adopt as final alternatives for Pacific Whiting utilization, the preliminary preferred alternatives described in E2 attachment one, March, 2022. Number one, Whiting season start date for all Whiting sectors. 
north of 40 degrees, 30 minutes north latitude. Alternative one, May 1st, move all administrative deadlines associated with season start date to 45 days prior to the season start date. Two, mothership processor obligation. Alternative one, remove mothership processor obligation from regulation. Three, mothership processor cap. Alternative three, remove mothership processor cap from regulation. Four, mothership processor and catcher processor permit transfer. Alternative one, with suboption C, a vessel can be registered to a mothership permit and a catcher processor permit in the same calendar year with unlimited transfers. Okay, thank you. Just uh, thank you, Maggie. Just confirm the language on the screen is accurate and complete. Yes, thanks. All right, I will look for a second. Seconded by Phil Anders. Oh, there's a, a Pete Hassamer. I'm going to give the second to Pete Hassamer. Welcome, Pete. Um, please speak to your motion. Thank you, Chair. This motion represents the uh, preliminary preferred alternatives, as uh, which were adopted last September have been recommended again by the GAP and the GMT at this meeting. These were selected as preliminary preferred alternatives based on uh, the industry consensus recommendations that we've heard about, intended to provide uh, maximum flexibility to address the lower utilization in the mothership sector. Uh, I want to uh, thank staff again for um, for the report, this time uh, recognizing the um, inclusion of the section on how the uh, preliminary preferred alternatives align with the Magnuson-Stevens Act national standards. But that was very helpful and um, we'll uh, just note that much of the um, uh, rationale and, and support for the preliminary preferred alternatives are contained in that document, and I don't intend to repeat most of it here. Uh, again, we, we reviewed the purpose and need statement earlier today at the start of this item with the presentation. Uh, heard the need to address the mothership sector under attainment issue. Uh, which was raised uh, beginning about six years ago. Um, we um, are, a, uh, and we heard more today, particularly uh, noting the catch and attainment trends presented to us earlier in the staff presentation and the lower increase in mothership sector attainment compared to the allocation. Uh, our purpose our adopted purpose is to identify and revise regulations that may be unnecessarily constraining to provide increased operational flexibility and increase the mothership sector's ability to utilize its allocation while maintaining fair and equitable access to the resource by all sectors. And this PPA uh, recommended here for final alternative adoption does that. Specifically on the season start, this has been identified in the analysis and by uh, state industry stakeholders as the element most likely here to address the attainment and to have an impact. Appreciate the thorough evaluation of potential impacts on salmon and non-whiting ground fish uh, by the whiting fleet that we have uh, received on several occasions, including the uh, additions to the analysis at this meeting. Uh, noting again that that analysis found that uh, overall anticipated bycatch of Chinook salmon is within the, uh, the uh, 2017 biop evaluation, even if the impacts of the earlier season start are additive rather than a seasonal shift. We had questions about differential stock specific impacts on listed salmonid species and uh, Note that Appendix B to Attachment 1 under this agenda item, uh, again, provides a detailed evaluation on the potential impacts to each stock using the best scientific information available and concludes 
that the analyst found little, if any, evidence of impacts on listed ESUs that would not have been captured in the 2017 biop. We have uh, received information suggesting that there is negligible risk to coho salmon from bycatch uh, related to these actions because of the very low bycatch of coho over the five year, recent five year period for at sea sectors as a whole, uh, and also very low in the shoreside sector. Uh, non whiting ground fish impacts were evaluated and uh, found to be likely still within the impact levels analyzed in the last ground fish specifications process. And the at sea impacts would likely be within the uh, current set aside amounts. And we are reminded that the salmon mitigation plans and all of the co op measures will still be in effect in the earlier uh, two weeks of the season. The shoreside IFQ program will have to cover all of the catch with quota pounds, catcher vessels participating in, in the early season in that sector, and that measures such as block area closures would be available if needed. This action uh, to change the start date two weeks earlier does apply to all sectors to maintain fair and equitable access. On the mothership processor obligation, originally intended to provide for some certainty to the mothership on a short-term basis. Uh, we have heard about the development and stability, uh, uh, pardon, development of the sector and uh, uh, relationships formed between catcher vessels and motherships, and also the uh, potential obstacles created by this obligation, uh, deadline obstacles and administrative burden Alternative one, removal of this uh, item is intended to provide flexibility and remove that burden. On the mothership processor cap, which has been the topic, I think, of most uh, discussion, certainly at this meeting today and recently, I want to recognize that uh, when it was first adopted and now there there have been concerns about consolidation to keep catcher vessels from being disadvantaged by potential consolidation. And I, I recognize that those remain. Uh, and we have um, heard about instances of catcher vessels not having a processor to deliver for various reasons. We are not seeing clear evidence that so far, this has been due to the cap, at least in most cases. Uh, but we have also heard concerns that the cap could uh, limit the uh, ability of a catcher vessel to find a mothership to receive its fish or of a mothership processor to uh, process as much fish as it might be able to otherwise take. Uh, removing the cap here is intended to maximize opportunity and flexibility from the catcher vessels, and we have heard that request repeatedly from catcher vessels. I agree with Mr. Niles that there will probably be little practical difference between eliminating the cap and raising the cap. Uh, but but I, I also concur that there are many factors that go into processing operation decisions. And in my mind, uh, it's the permit, not a processing cap, that ensures that a mothership vessel can and is able to participate. I would suggest that if the council is concerned about consolidation, then we could consider a future action to establish a limit on permit ownership. The processing cap is one tool to address consolidation concerns but having heard about the actual or potential negative consequences of that cap, uh, my recommendation here is to remove the cap. On the mothership catcher processor permit transfer, this uh, dates to implementation of the whiting sector allocations in 1997. Uh, this was one measure intended to prevent uh, the higher capacity catcher processor vessels from harvesting the mothership sector's allocation. 
at least is my understanding from reading the analysis, not having been here at the time. Uh, and we have also heard and in fact taken action ourselves through emergency rule to, uh, to address a need to allow um, uh, allow this this action to allow registration of both permits within the same year. Uh, I would recommend that in implementing this alternative, the National Marine Fishery Service allow concurrent registration or stacking of permits. Uh, at the, in other words, they can both be registered to a vessel at the same time noting that the gap suggested this might be most, uh, most efficient. And overall, uh, again, I'd like to also appreciate the work that uh, industry members have put into this and, and acknowledge this as an industry consensus and echo the comments made earlier that We're while we do have concerns uh, and a responsibility to do our due diligence to try to make sure we aren't setting up the situation for uh, negative unintended consequences, that there are industry members who have far more experience in the business side of this industry who have also been thinking about this, and we are not hearing those concerns from them. We are hearing the request to adopt the preliminary preferred alternative. Uh, package and that there is some synergy among this suite of measures designed to reduce the regulatory barriers that may be impeding attainment in the mothership sector. I'll conclude there. Thanks. Yes. Rose. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to offer a clarification on my prior answer to Mr. Cuttinger's question, if that is okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, part of the question related to whether there might be antitrust implications if an owner were to acquire all of the permits in the mothership sector, um, I would like to clarify that because there are no own limits on ownership in the sector, that if an owner were to acquire all of the permits in the sector, there would not be a clear pathway for legal review by NOAA under the Magnuson Act. However, upon further review of the question, um, I'm not clear on whether there may be antitrust implications. So I'd like to clarify that I'm not prepared to answer definitively on that point today. Thank you. Okay, questions for maker of the motion? All right, discussion on the motion. Corey. No one else can hear me groan because I'm beginning to push the button again, but the, um, that's, now they know. But yeah, thank you, Maggie, for, um, for what the well-organized motion and, 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 and as, as always, well-spoken um, to your motion. Again, I, I, I do agree. I think the one, the one difference continues to be um, the, the processor cap and this, I, yeah, I, I believe, I agree that the permit um, would be the more natural choice to focus on. But in effect, I think, I mean, I would point out what, what was the, I said earlier in that it's, is it, are we gonna be able to get there if something happens? Um, but in, and in effect, we now have in a permit, it is in a, you know, indirectly a, a, um, a limit on permit ownership because for example, at 65%, and you could only process. Um, you know why? Why would it? Why would it consolidate beyond what you could actually process? No one would buy all the permits if they could only process 65%. So indirectly, it um, it, it is. I mean, at least a, a business, a rational business, would not would not try to uh, uh, acquire more permits than it would be able to process. But I agree that uh, the more direct route would be to do something like we have in other sectors where there's where there's ownership on on the on the permit, and just hearing you know hearing um, 
hearing people speak to uh, to the issues before before this, um, you know, I'm 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 wanting to amend the motion just to go on record as having a difference in, in opinion on how we weigh the trade-offs here. And um, again, this is not a big difference, a slight difference, but I would like to go on record. But now I'm wondering even if I will get a second. But um, I will I will stop there. And uh, you know. I, I would. I do have interest in in amending this motion, um, but I will pause to see if there's any any other discussion. Thank you, Corey. Brad. Um, well, yeah. Thank you, Chair Grolick. Um I'm going to support this motion. I think it does a long ways to uh, to fix the issues we've been having with the mothership sector for a long time. Um, you know, we look at the, look at the lens of what we see this fishery today, and I think that uh, what happens when we don't have banner whiting seasons, and they're it isn't very attractive to bring a processor down here to process a little bit of fish because there's not much available to do, and I think that it really gives the um, this really gives the fi the fishery um, the best chance of success, and um, I. I'm looking forward to this passing, and I'm hoping uh, forward it to some point in time. But it'll be uh, in April. It'll be uh, it'll go through uh, the intact, and um, we get more than 58 percent of fish out of the water, which we've averaged the last six years. And so, uh, I think the fishermen deserve it, and uh, I think it'll be better for everybody in the long run. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brad. Pete Hossamer. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you all. Clearly, with my second, I support this motion. I just wanted to speak a little bit to my rationale for that, um, and and I appreciate the um, rationale provided by the maker of the motion, Maggie, as she went through. That was very thorough. Um, I do want to express my, you know, acknowledgement for the analysis, um, the thorough and complete analysis that was done by the staff on this. It, it brought us to a good point here. Um, earlier, uh, before the motion was made, Bob Dooley spoke to his experience in the fishery, and he was able to speak from you know, living in the fishery, being part of that, seeing what it goes through. I didn't have that opportunity, but I, I did have the opportunity to um, be uh, live through this entire process on the mothership issue before the council. And so I've heard the problems that have plagued uh, the mothership sector, uh, some of the constraints and the issues that we're facing and um, looked hard to find ways to solve that. And very simply, I see this package of these four alternatives as a good mechanism that helps us to achieve, uh, potentially achieve that outcome of increasing utilization in the mothership sector. Um, the individual alternatives taken by themselves may not do much, but as a package, it has great potential to do that. Um, also as a package, um, I think Maggie spoke to the, the national standards, meeting the national standards and that part of the analysis. And I think as a package, that's what helps us to meet those national standards. Um, if, if there was one deficiency, and I don't wanna be critical in, in the analysis, it's on national standard five, which deals with utilization. I, I think the one sentence that uh, says the proposed measures may increase efficiency, undersells that a little bit because based on testimony we've heard, I think there is great opportunity experience efficiencies that help this fishery along. But I'll just leave that comment at that right now. The, the package opens a number of doorways I see that help to um, make it possible to increase utilization in the sector. I realize and I, I've heard the discussion about the unintended consequences of allowing some consolidation to occur. 
there are risks associated with that, but I do believe the potential for negative consequences is far out, um, is far outweighed by the benefits that this provide, that um, the benefits outweigh that risk, and this is a good package to move forward with. So again, that that's, is some of the background on my support for this issue, and I certainly hope it moves forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pete. Further discussion? Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Maggie, thank you very much for a really thorough motion and, and explanation of your motion. I really appreciate that. I am obviously going to support this motion. I would like to speak a little bit to Corey's concerns. And he made a comment that the consolidation, why would someone buy a permit to consolidate? If the worry is we're gonna get down to one processor, one platform, that's the way to do it, is to buy the permits. I think there's a lot of obstacles to buying processors, not the least of which is the ownership requirements in AFA and all of these votes are participants in AFA. And they would be, you know, the consolidation you speak of in the North Pacific, and I don't think it's, it, it's all guided by a, um, a cap. And I think a lot of those entities are very close to that cap. So to, to get it at, knowing the participants to get to that consolidation by actually acquiring platforms is a whole big lift. Now, I agree that idea of permit consolidation, not, not bringing the platforms, could be a way of getting to one processor, but that's a different issue. And changing this processing cap is not going to address that. I think... I really appreciate the fact that industry from both sides, from the processing sector to the vessel sector, the catcher, mothership catcher vessels come together over many years, analyzed all the, the risk and all the, as opposed to the, the benefit on this. And <clears throat> understanding from my perspective, being a part of this for a long time, there were some real concerns, but those have come together because this sector is, is not achieving its goal. And that doesn't just affect catcher boats, it affects the processors as well, the platforms. So I think I'm gonna support this motion, but I'm not opposed to thinking about the permit issue sometime in the future. So, um, but, I think this satisfies the actual goals of what we were trying to, what was trying to be achieved by the sector. But I think it, it, it like Heather Mann said, it does, it's not a panacea. It's not gonna give everybody a market, but I think it's gonna enable the ability to have it and make it, make it better. So um, I will be supporting this, thank you. All right, thank you, Bob. Uh, Corey, followed by Krista. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just a, sorry to jump in front of folks, but I just want a quick clarification. I'm trying to understand, Bob, what you were um, telling me, and maybe I spoke wrong before, but my question was why, if, if the cap were 65%, why would someone buy all the permits so that they could only, because then in that, then they would only be able to process 65% of, of, of the allocation so that was kind of what I was trying to ask. Of that's why I think there's an indirect limit on that. But but you're telling me. Um, so I'm trying to understand why I wasn't thinking about that right. And maybe I just missed your point. But I don't mean that. that I don't know if you had an answer to that. But that's to clarify what I was saying. Before, I don't. I wouldn't buy all the permits just to be able to process 65% of the of the allocation. Krista. Yeah, thanks. And uh, I'm not going to answer the question 
that just preceded me. Um, Bob, you just had your hand up, so I don't know if you want to respond to that or if that's in order or you want my comments, but. Okay. Um, Bob. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Corey, I, I guess my point would be that if you were, if you were a, a, a person interested in, in having control of all the mothership whiting and all, all of that quota, and having no competition whatsoever in it. Yeah, you could justify that. You might buy two permits and get 100%, not as one entity, maybe two entities. But if you're one entity and you wanted all that fish, you'd only get 65% of it, but it's all. There's no competition. And that, that's a market share. That is a, a thing that might be considered in the future. I'm not suggesting we need to go there because I think those are, we're, we're, you know, discussing how many angels dance on the head of a pin. I don't think it's going to happen, but in my experience, but that's, that's what I was getting at. So thank you. Krista. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I also intend on supporting this motion. I, um, I've heard a lot of testimony. I come out of processing, uh, at least here on the West Coast, and we've heard a lot of talk from uh, other council members who come off of the, the fishing side of things. And I can remember being really struck the first time I sat up here and this topic came up because uh, one of the vessels testified about how he had been stranded. And my company at that point was stranded based upon uh, the size of our port and the fact that the number of vessels that were down here couldn't physically get in there. Um, but we actually had quota and it's, it's one of those deals where we, we did not have that flexibility um, based upon what we were doing to be able to, to share. Um, I am appreciative of the fact that this does provide flexibility for our fishermen and for the processing sector um, on both sides of those equations. The other thing that I think is really important about this is that it is 100% industry backed and it didn't just come through the council process. People have met in the margins and more importantly, people have met outside of the council process to really come forward with a packet. And I agree with Ms. Mann this isn't a panacea. I feel quite certain we will have people come back and we will need to fine tune at some point in the future, whether that's to get to um, Corey's concerns or other concerns that may crop up. But I do think that this is remarkable in terms of the amount of work and effort that the council industry and everybody that's interested in it have been willing to put into the process um, to come up with some, some creative solutions to get us a better opportunity for as many of us on the West Coast as possible. Thank you, Krista. I'm not seeing any other, any other hands. I'm doing a double take. Uh, Corey. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Mr. Chair. Well, yeah, I, again, maybe, and please, in no way does this, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with Krista said about all the hard work that went into this industry. Um, this, this, this effort here it was a lot of efforts, a lot of years, but I do, I do want to go on record as having a different point of view on, on the processing cap and this relative risk of, um, you know, addressing it after it's too late. So, and, and if, you know, this is made of maybe a Hail Mary, even asking for a second here, but um, I, I'd be ready to move that, move for that when, um, when ready, Mr. Chair. I didn't, I didn't catch that last. I, I'm ready to make the motion to amend, amend the, when you're ready. All right. I think we are ready. Why don't you make your motion? And my computer uh, locked the screen on me for just one sec while I was saying that. No problem. And uh, yeah, excuse me here, a little out of out of practice, but I, I would move to uh, amend the motion um, and 
Mr. Chair, if you're, your help here if I stumble on the right form, but to replace uh, item number three with alternative one, 65%. Is that it? Uh, Mr. Chair, I think if, yes, I believe if you, um, I think you under and if your ability to advise on whether that if you understand my intent if that if that would have the effect of the motion to you with our parliament parliament excuse me parliamentarian the intent well, there um well i'd have to go back and look and see what i don't have in turn of one in front of me but if 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 that accurately captures alternative one yes yes excuse me okay uh, yeah. it's already in print somewhere so uh, we have a motion. Let me see if there's a second. Seconded by Corey Writings. Please speak to your motion. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Corey. Yeah, just I don't I won't belabor the point. I think I think we've had the discussion. People have put their uh, views on the table. Um, it's a slight difference in view on 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 the trade offs. I believe the purpose and need, need will be um, met as well at 65% as it with the PPA with less risk of consolidation. And, and that's, is, that's basically it. That's the, that's the point. And it would be harder to uh, address the, the consolidation issue if, if it were to happen. All right, thank you, Corey. Are there any questions for Corey or discussion on the motion to amend? All right, I'm not seeing any hands, so I'll call the question on the motion to amend. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 Uh, I think, I think, I heard no, but I think there were enough voices. I'd like to do a roll call. <clears throat> Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll be reading from voting sheet number one on Mr. Niles' amendment to motion concerning E2, Pacific Whiting Utilization. Um, Mr. Niles. Yeah, yes. Ms. Fenson. Yes, or no, excuse me, no. Mr. Oatman. Oh, sorry, no. Mr. Pettinger. No. Mr. Moore. Mr. Wolf. Abstain. Mr. Dooley. No. Uh, Mr. Smith. No. Mr. Anderson. No. Ms. Writings. Yes. Um, do we have Ms. Yoremko? No. Mr. Hasmer. No. Uh, Ms. Summer. No. And the last vote to you, Mr. Chairman. I don't need to vote unless there's a tie. Good. Motion fails. All right, the motion to amend fails. We're back to the main motion, unamended. See if there's any further discussion on this motion. I'm not seeing any hands, so I'll call the question on the main motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much for the motion, Maggie. Let me see if the council has any further action on this agenda item. 
I'm not seeing any hands. I'll turn back to our staff officer, Brett, see how we're doing. Thank you, Chair Gronick. Yes, we've completed our action here. We've taken final action to adopt some final preferred alternatives. I appreciate all the work here and the conversations. Uh, we'll take this and put it forward and package it for uh, National Marine Fisheries Service to implement it. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Brett. Well, uh, even though it's coming up on five o'clock, we're, we're now officially about two and a half hours behind. So we're at least gonna get started on agenda item E3 and see where we can get. I don't expect we'll finish it uh, today, but um, we gotta make some progress on it. So um, I'll turn to our staff officer, John DeVore to get us started. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, council members. Uh, agenda item E3 concerns stock definitions. Uh, this agenda item arises from uh, some uh, late breaking news from the National Marine Fisheries Service. Uh, last November, uh, we transmitted the council's action on uh, stock assessments and status determinations uh, based on some uh, new ground fish stock assessments uh, that were done. Um, and uh, one of the uh, transmitted actions was removing quillback rockfish from the nearshore rockfish complexes, both north and south of 4010, um, and um, recommending uh, development of a rebuilding plan based on the results of that assessment. However, uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service came back and, and, um, and, and stated that uh, without um, a definition of the stock management units uh, in the FMP, um, we didn't really have uh, a basis for making a, st a status determination for uh, quillback rockfish in California, or for that matter, any of the stock assessments were, that were conducted last year um, without that uh, codification of um, stock management units in our FMP. So uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service in their uh, advanced report, uh, book report that is in the advanced briefing book um, recommended that uh, before any status determinations are made, there needs to be an FMP amendment where um, the stock management units for which status determinations would be made are um, codified in the uh, ground fish fishery management plan. They recommended uh, two different options uh, for um, pursuing uh, an FMP amendment. Uh, option one um, would uh, sever the considerations for an FMP amendment from the 23-24 specs process and, and would um, uh, have the council embark on a, a more deliberative process. And as part of that process, uh, this, the council would need to identify stocks that are in need of conservation and management. Um, otherwise known as actively managed stocks. Um, they would need to define uh, the stock management boundaries on the West Coast um, and uh, for which status determinations would be made and for that matter for which harvest specifications would be uh, specified. And, um, and then upon approval of an FMP amendment, status determinations would be made and uh, the consequences of those status determinations uh, or the results from those would uh, um, uh, would direct the council towards uh, either developing rebuilding plans or 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 whatever the management action might be. Uh, option two is is more of a uh, fast track um, process for an FMP amendment, and uh, it, that would be done in association with the twenty three twenty four specs process. Um, I could, I could uh, speak a little bit to that, but I don't think there's a need to do that. We have advisory bodies that offer recommendations and rationale, and and uh, we can let them speak to that uh, question. Um, to aid the council, since this was 
an unexpected agenda item and development. Um, council staff put together a, a supplemental attachment one, which uh, uh, offers some potential pathways to defining stocks in the FMP and uh, basically the process steps that uh, could be taken under both options. I, um, I don't want to speak too much uh, to the National Marine Fisheries Service report. I think it's, I think their report uh, uh, speaks to uh, the rationale for uh, their actions and certainly uh, they are at the table to uh, speak to it so um, I don't need to do that. Um, I will offer that we have um, uh, three uh, supplemental advisory body reports, the SSC, GMT and GAP. There's also a, a public comment a letter from Oceana uh, for you to uh, consider and I think perhaps in the interest of time, it might be better for me to stop there and uh, to take any questions on the process. Um, certainly you could answer questions on the potential pathways uh, that the council can consider if there's any uh, confusion with that supplemental attachment one, but <clears throat> I think it might serve uh, you better to uh, uh, talk to um, the advisory bodies and receive their reports and and um, I will stand by and uh, answer any questions you might have. All right, thank you, John. Are there any questions of John on the overview? And if not, we will turn to our various reports. Uh, we'll first hear from the National Marine Fisheries Service, Mr. Ryan Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I'll be speaking to the NIMS report here. Before I do, I just wanna thank John for his opening remarks as well as for the staff's uh, supplemental report, which I do think complements our report nicely. After the November council meeting, we discovered an issue that ultimately resulted in NIMPS not making the status determinations that were anticipated here. Uh, the overarching issue is that while the stock assessment assessed Quillback individually off the three states, there has been no determination that Quillback should be managed as three separate stocks taking into account management and policy considerations. Currently, quillback rockfish, like all species in the FMP, are listed coastwide. NIMS decision on stock status must be based on best scientific information available, but it also must be informed by the council's deliberative and public process to make a policy decision on how to define stocks or stock complexes for management purposes and those decisions should be documented in the council's FMP. So in our NIMS report, we cite to some statutory guidance for considerations on how to define a stock. For some stocks, the council may want to reconsider whether they should be included as stocks in the fishery. For others, geographic divisions in stock definitions should be moved into the FMP. We also present more specifics on two example options for pass forward, which John highlighted and I'll touch on briefly in a moment. But in summary, we present four key initial considerations the council should make moving forward. One, whether species are predominantly harvested in federal waters. Two, whether some species may be more appropriately categorized as ecosystem component species. Three, a further evaluation of whether the current stock complex compositions are meeting the intent of the stock complex guidance and regulation. And four, how the overfish stock status units align with the overfishing stock status, excuse me, the overfished stock status units align with the overfishing stock status units, which is an issue primarily for our stocks and stock complexes. So the two options we put forward, number one, uh, describes a longer term, a, a more holistic approach that's separate from the current 23-24 harvest specifications to address several interconnected issues that are fundamentally tied to how the council chooses to define a stock. So if the council uh, signals under this agenda item uh, that that's the option they prefer, it should be then discussed and prioritized under agenda item E6, 
workload and new management measure priorities later at this meeting. Option two, uh, zone dependent is a fast track. Yes, it is a shorter term approach. It may be specifically targeted at certain stocks uh, and it would amend the FMP to include these new stocks as part of the 23-24 harvest specifications and management measures process. Acknowledging the timing of the information contained in this report, we do see this option as less likely to afford the time that may be necessary to take all four of those initial considerations that I just listed fully into account. So regardless of these options, the council should, one, continue to manage the ground fish fisheries using the 2021 assessments as the best scientific information available. And we would encourage the council to consider management measures to reduce fishing pressure in areas of concern as suggested by the assessments under either option. And to consider the implications of this procedural and policy shift in discussions at this meeting uh, when we get to agenda item E8 under initial stock assessment planning and terms of reference. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much, Ryan. Other questions of Ryan on the NIMS report? Thank you very much, Ryan. We'll now hear from the Science and Statistical Committee, Dr. Galen Johnson. Good evening. I'll be reading agenda item E3A, Supplemental SSC Report 1. The Scientific and Statistical Committee discussed options and approaches for defining stocks in the ground fish fishery management plan. The SSC discussed the alternative uses of the word stock, noting that for these purposes, stock refers to a status determination unit or management unit rather than an assessment unit. Assessment areas should take into account but not be dictated by status determination management boundaries, while status must be reported at the status determination management unit. A variety of information may be useful for defining stocks for status determination and management. This includes a suite of data on species biology and distribution, as well as information on data availability across space. Properly considering the available information where will require a multi-stage process, including development and review of a proposed framework for defining stocks, application of said framework to FMP species, review of results, and council deliberation and decision-making. Option two does not provide adequate time for this process, and therefore would largely involve formalizing the status quo, while the more deliberative approach of option one would still need to be undertaken at a future date. Changes in stock definitions may occur in the future due to, for example, new or improved data or shifts in ranges due to climate change. And that concludes our statement. Right, thank you very much, Galen. Are there questions on the SSC report? Thank you, Galen. Now we'll hear from the ground fish management team, Lynn Mattis. Yeah, good afternoon, or, or I guess it's good evening now. Uh, this is sub, uh, agenda item E3A, Supplemental GMT Report 1. Uh, we received an overview from uh, Mr. John DeVore of Council Staff on our February 23rd webinar. Then we reviewed the NIMS report uh, that Mr. Wolf just described and Supplemental Attachment 1, and we were able to have some additional discussion with NIMS staff to inform our discussion in this report. I uh, especially want to thank Keely Kent and Gretchen Hanshu for the extra time they spent with the GMT helping us work through this topic. Um, it, it was very, their, their input was very helpful for us. Section one, definition of the term stock. A key part of the GMT discussion was on the definition of the term stock. We identified several places where the term stock is used in different contexts in the overall council management process. Possible variations of how stock may be defined or aspects that may define a stock include management unit, biological or genetic information, geographic boundaries, political boundaries such as state or national borders, assessment units, and status determination unit. Having agreement and a clear definition by the NIMFs and the Council on what the term stock means in this context will help establish a foundation for all advisory bodies and parties involved in addressing issues related to the stock definitions as we move forward. Section two on the NIMFs report. We had a lengthy discussion on the pros and cons of the two options outlined in the NIFS report and the supplemental attachment uh, one, and we get into that here below. In regards to option one, 
Uh, option one has consider consideration of stock definitions and re-examining stock complexes on a separate standalone trajectory, rather than trying to incorporate into the 23-24 biennial process. That timeline would allow for a deliberate, holistic, and more thorough process to complete all of the steps needed for all groundfish stocks, including coolback rockfish. It would also allow time to incorporate re-examining the current stock complexes to determine if they are still appropriate as per National Standard 1 guidelines. This, this longer timeline would also allow more time for public input as well as coordination with the SSC science centers and the West Coast region. However, creating a new standalone pathway for this could potentially cause delays in other ground fish items that are already in the works should this get prioritized over them, uh, as this item would likely warrant urgency from the Emerson Council as well as GMT members. Additionally, the council is in the process of planning for stocks that will be assessed in 23 uh, to inform the 25-26 biennial process. In regards to option two, that, that incorporates defining stocks into the 23-24 process and is a faster and more predetermined timeline. However, given where the council is in the 23-24 process, there may not be enough time and workload workload capacity to incorporate this into the process without delaying the analysis, final decision making, and or rulemaking. We also have concerns that the rushed process, on top of all the other moving pieces and parts of this biennial process, could lead to errors or omissions that would require additional work later on to rectify. The shorter timeline would also not allow for a comprehensive re-examination of the existing stock complexes, requiring additional analysis and council time at a later date. Section C, GMT recommendation. Based on the pros and cons above, we recommend the council choose option one as the pathway to move forward on the stock definition issue. We have concerns that trying to incorporate this into the current biennial cycle would be too quick to allow for a holistic examination of how stocks are defined and would not allow time to address the related issue of stock complexes. Additionally, it has potential to cause delays to the overall biennial analysis, uh, decision-making and rulemaking. Regardless of the option chosen, the Council can continue to recommend management measures for 23 and 24 to reduce fishing pressure on stocks of concern, such as quillback rockfish. D, next steps. If option one is chosen by the Council, there are several next steps that would need to be discussed and at least preliminar preliminarily decided upon under later agenda items at this meeting. Under agenda item E6, the workload and new management measures prioritization exercise, the council will need to provide guidance on how this item should be prioritized in relation to the other already prioritized groundfish items. Then under the future meeting plan to agenda item, item C7, the council will need to identify at which upcoming meeting stock definitions will be addressed. Finally, the council will need to identify who is going to be tasked with doing the work and analysis, which we discuss more below. Uh, two examples are the GMT or um, a new ad hoc work group. Who will be doing the work may influence when this item can come up before the council, uh, before the council again. Uh, that should be a period and not a question mark. If the council were to decide to create an ad hoc work group, that discussion should happen under agenda item C6, Council Operating Procedures and Memberships at this meeting. We do note that given the potential scope of stock definitions and re-examining stock complexes, we, the GMT, do not have all of the expertise that will be needed and additional expertise that will be necessary, such as that from the, science, uh, the SSC and the science centers. Some additional items for consideration. If option one pathway is selected, the council may want to consider the implications when selecting stocks to be assessed in 2023, which will be discussed under item E8 later at this meeting. In the absence of an FMP amendment defining management units prior to the conclusion of the 23 assessment cycle, uh, November of 2023, and if there is a stock that had multiple assessment units across the West Coast, example assessments conducted on a state by state basis. Then there could be similar issues as experienced in 2021 where NIMS would not make the new status determination. This issue could potentially be handled in a couple of different ways. Sim uh, first, similar to the 21 assessment cycle, the council could opt to move forward with implementing the new scientific advice from area-based assessments into the 2526 process prior to receiving approved status determination from NIMS. 
A second option would be to implement a fast track, limited species specific FMP amendment, similar to what might happen under option two, defining management units for those select stocks. Section two, uh, example implications uh, using the quillback rockfish example. Uh, attachment one seeks council guidance on pathways forward for defining stocks in the FMP. Under option one, quillback rockfish off of California would be managed under the default harvest control rule to determine the species specific annual catch limit contributions and would remain in the near shore complexes both north and south for 23 24. The council would then need to rescind its November 2021 motion to remove quillback from the near shore complexes and the GMT would develop and analyze 2324 specs with quill back, uh, back in the near shore complexes. Under option two, the council would define stocks and stock complexes part of the 2324 harvest specifications. The council could recommend managing quill back as three separate stocks off Washington, Oregon, and California. If this stock definition for quill back rockfish was selected, we believe NIMFS would reassess the 2021 status determination for quillback rockfish starting the two-year clock for rebuilding plan, which would be implemented as part of the 2526 specifications. Uh, further consideration. Uh, this section gets into the four topics proposed in the NIMFS report where the council should consider moving forward. Uh, we attempted to provide some preliminary input on those uh, topics, uh, and we anticipate having additional input as this process proceeds. Uh, A, whether species are predominantly harvested in federal waters. Data to inform this topic could be available on recreational fisheries from RECFIN and or state management agencies. Data from commercial fisheries is available in PACFIN from state fish tickets and the West Coast Ground Fish Observer Program. However, the data may not be stratified to federal versus state waters, depending on how the data was collected and reported. In some cases where the data are not stratified by, spa by state versus federal, depth, if known, could possibly serve as a proxy, uh, depending on, on the location. Additional information should be available from fisheries independent data, such as the various state and federal surveys. However, not all surveys are able to sample areas where rockfish reside or are in shallow, more near shore waters. A third source of information would be to conduct a literature view uh, by species to, where, to see where they have been documented. While the GMT has access and expertise in some of these data sources, other expertise will be needed to supplement what we, can, we are able to do. Whether some species may be more appropriately categorized as EC species. When stock complexes were discussed previously, some species that were previously managed under the groundfish FMP were designed, were designated as ecosystem component species. One example, fine scale codling. There may be some additional species that could be considered for designation as EC species. Examining commercial and recreational catch data as well as survey data could help inform this decision. As in the topic above, a literature review could also inform this topic. Uh, based on previous discussions, some species that come to mind initially were dusky rockfish and possibly some of the dwarf rockfish that occur off of Southern California. While the GMT can provide some information on this, as above, we will likely need some additional expertise to supplement what we can do. Further evaluation of current stock complexes. Uh, are they meeting the intent of the stock complex guidance? The GMT did a preliminary evaluation of current stock comp stocks within complexes in November of 2021. To supplement and expand on that evaluation, additional expertise will likely needed to be brought in specifically to inform the biology and life history. Information on geographic range can be gleaned from fisheries catch and discard data, as well as the variety of fishery independent data, such as the NIMS trawl survey. Updating the stock vulnerability analysis has also been identified as a key part of this evaluation. This will mean updating the productivity and susceptibility analysis last conducted in 2011. Specifically, the GMT can help to inform the susceptibility portion of that analysis to better reflect the current state of fisheries and species-specific susceptibility scores. 
To accomplish that, the GMT will likely need assistance from Dr. Jason Cope and possibly Dr. Ian Taylor from the Northwest Science Center as they were key contributors to the original analysis and the programming behind the scenes. The GMT, with help from others, can provide the data to inform the, the evaluation and justification of stock complexes. However, it will be up to the council to start scoping the issue and develop the full justification for the composition. D, how the overfish status units assessments align with the overfishing stock status units, OFLs. For stocks that are managed in complexes, some stocks are assessed while others are not. For those that are assessed, harvest specifications are able to be determined. Currently, those harvest specifications are the OFL and ACL contributions to the complex OFL and ACL. They are added to those of the other species in the complex to come up with the overall complex OFL and ACL. Although some individual species are given a species-specific OFL ACL contribution, so uh, I have a duplication in there. Uh, some individual species are given species specific OFL ACL contributions within those complex. Those are not used to determine if overfishing is occurring. In other words, the individual species total mortality is not currently managed to stay within that species specific OFL ACL contribution. Rather, total mortality of all species within the complex are managed to the complex total OFL and ACL. The policy of managing to the complex OFL ACLs may be a relic of when stocks and complexes were not regularly assessed. Now that more stocks within complexes are being assessed, including via data moderate and data poor assessment methods, consideration should be given to whether it is more appropriate to manage certain species to their species specific OFL ACLs rather than incorporating them at the complex level. And it is our understanding that this would apply to category two and one stocks, but not category three stocks. If the council manages to species specific harvest specifications, the council should consider the purpose of the, that stock complexes serve. Option one would give everyone involved in the process more time to review the current stock complexes and possibly recommend how to restructure. The review of the complexes would include identifying indicator and inflator stocks, as well as biology and life history to better align species that could be managed together in updated complexes. And our last section, implementation for future assessment cycles. The GMT is unsure how this process will impact future assessment cycles. What processes or procedures will need to be put in place and when? What if during the assessment process, the assessment team has new biological data such as genetics that indicates multiple distinct stocks along the coast, while the FMP includes management units that do not align with that new scientific information? It is the GMT's understanding that an FMP amendment would be needed to realign the management units, but it is unclear whether that would have to, have, have to happen before the subsequent biennial harvest specification cycle begins, or could it happen concurrently? We are also unclear about how stocks that fall within both federal and state jurisdictions will be managed in future and how ACLs will be partitioned among those two areas. We do have concerns that this could delay the already lengthy and precarious harvest specification cycle and schedule. Specifics on how to front load future stock boundary changes prior to when specifications and management measures are developed will, be, will need to be outlined and agreed upon. Additionally, when stocks are declared overfished, they are typically removed from complexes. However, it is unclear if stocks should be reintegrated into complex once, once they are rebuilt. Questions such as this should also be analyzed as part of this process. And that concludes our report, and I will be happy to take questions, but I may have to defer to NIMS on some items. All right, thank you very much, Lynn. Uh, questions on the thorough GMT report? I'm not, oh, Maggie, I'm sorry. Thanks, Chair Grilnick. Thanks, Lynn and GMT for the report. On the... Uh, uh, on the example you provided of quillback rockfish example implications, and you mentioned that under option one, quillback could be managed under the default harvest control rule remaining in the nearshore rockfish complexes. Um, I, I recall the um, also very thorough report 
the GMT provided at a previous meeting on stock complex issues. Um, so not asking you to repeat any of that here. Just curious if, if in this stock definitions context, did the GMT discuss at this meeting uh, pros and cons of leaving Quillback rockfish in the complex versus removing it? Uh, thank you, Chair Grimlick, Ms. Summer. In this specific context, we did not. We just tried to lay out the pros and cons, um, seeing it as a council policy decision at this point. Thanks. Further questions of the GMT? Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. And just to let the council members know, um, we will not conclude this agenda item tonight. Uh, my plan is to go through public comments. We'll pick up discussion and action tomorrow. So next we will hear from the GAP, Jerry Richter. Good evening, Mr. Chair. Good evening. I'll be reading from agenda item E3A, Supplemental GAP Report 1, Groundfish Advisory Subpanel Report on Stock Definitions. Mr. John DeVore, Council Staff, and Ms. Keeley Kent, National Marine Fisheries Service, briefed the Groundfish Advisory Subpanel on Stock Definitions. The GAP offers the following comments and recommendations on stock definitions. NIMS has delayed making a status determination for quillback rockfish and all the other species assessed in 2021. The 2021 quillback rockfish stock assessments were conducted for three areas delineated by state boundaries. However, NIMS has rejected any status determinations pending approval of a fishery management plan amendment to define and codify stock boundaries for which status determination can be made. The objective of this agenda item is to decide a process for deciding stock definitions in the FMP before status determinations are made for quillback rockfish and all other groundfish stocks requiring conservation and management. Once an FMP amendment is approved, NIMS would make status determinations and if any defined stocks are declared overfish, NIMS would notify the council and the two-year clock for developing a rebuilding plan would begin at that time. Two different options are proposed by NIMS in agenda item E3A NIMS report one to define stocks in the FMP. The GAP reviewed both options and supports option one as our preferred choice. We note that the Scientific and Statistical Committee also supports option one. The GAP believes option two would not be an adequate process to properly deliberate an FMP amendment that seeks to consider and potentially restructure our stock management units so they are more compliant to National Standard 1 guidelines. Should the Council choose to go with option one, the GAP supports the NIMS recommendation to prioritize the action under workload and new management measures priorities, which will come up under agenda item E6. And lastly, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife has already taken in-season action to reduce the take of both quillback and copper rockfishes in 2022. Further, precautionary management measures for these species are under consideration in the 2023-2024 biennial harvest specifications and management measures process. Mr. Chair, that completes our GAP statement. Be glad to field questions. Thank you very much, Gary. Are there questions of the GAP? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, sir. All right, have a good evening yourself. And uh, that concludes reports. We'll go to public comment now. We'll pause for a minute to get that up on the screen. Uh, we have one uh, public comment from Mr. Ben Enticknap. Welcome, Ben. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik and council members. Uh, we submitted a comment letter in the briefing book that just posted this morning, so I wanted to go ahead and speak to it. Um, Oceana is concerned that NIMS does not intend to comply with the legal require requirements regarding overfished quillback rockfish. Last November, the council adopted a new NIMS stock assessment for quillback off California that found that they've been experiencing overfishing in all but two years over the past decade. The assessment, which was endorsed by the SSC, concludes that in 2021, quillback off California were at 14% of their unfished biomass. Also last November, the SSC had a deliberate discussion whether to aggregate stock assessments 
across stock delineation boundaries for the purpose of status determination. The SEC recommended, and I quote, for quillback rockfish, that three separate stocks, stock areas be maintained for status determination, California, Oregon, and Washington. Therefore, based on the best scientific information available and the overfished uh, threshold defined in the FMP, quillback rockfish are overfished off California. This is not a policy call. An overfish determination requires specific and immediate actions by NIMS and the council to end overfishing and to implement conservation and management measures to rebuild the fish stock. The MSA requires that upon determining that a fishery is overfished, that the agency immediately notify, that's a quote from the act, immediately notify the fishery management council. So we're quite alarmed to learn that NIMS has not notified the council that quillback rockfish are overfished. This delay is contrary to the law uh, and to the agency's procedural directive that stock status determinations be made, quote, as soon as possible after SSC deliberation on the assessment. So NIMS state is stating in its report that it will not determine quillback or overfished until after an FMP amendment is completed to redefine stock, assess stock complexes. And the NIMS report indicates it would uh, consider removing stocks from the FMP or moving them into the ecosystem component category. If that were the case for quillback, rebuilding requirements would be non-existent. And the only backstop then becomes the Endangered Species Act, like what's used for rockfish in Puget Sound. NIMS bases its decision to not notify the council that quillback are, is overfished on the fact that the groundfish FMP does not geographically define quillback of California as a stock. We'd like to note that in uh, 2019, NIMS notified the council that the northern subpopulation of Pacific sardine is overfished. Yet the CPS FMP makes no mention at all of a northern subpopulation of sardine. It, yet NIMS designated the sardine population as overfished based on the best available science in the stock assessment regarding stock structure. Again, the best available science as recommended by the SSC is that quillback off California be managed as a distinct stock for the purpose of catch levels, status determination, and the development of a rebuilding plan. <clears throat> the, the, the act is clear. There are no exceptions under which NIMS may delay notifying the council that quillback rockfish are overfished. And it should go without saying that the way species are listed in the FMP does not supersede the requirements of the act. Such a failure to act based on the best available science raises serious concerns. The requirements to prevent and end overfishing and rebuild overfish docks are fundamental conservation safeguards. The act ensures short-term economic concerns and political pressures do not outweigh the long-term conservation of fisheries. So we're urging the council and the agency to reconsider this position and ensure NIMS complies with the law and I'd like to suggest that there are not just two options before you here as defined in the, the NIMS report. A third approach is to go ahead and declare quail back overfish now, consistent with the act and the science, and then take a deliberate look at the FMP to redefine stock structure if you feel that's needed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Are there questions for Mr. Indignant? Thank you very much, Ben. So uh, that would take us, uh, concludes public comment, would take us to council discussion and action. Uh, but, get, but given the hour, uh, what we'll do is we'll break here. We'll resume this agenda item uh, tomorrow morning and then continue on with groundfish for the rest of the morning, I'm sure. So um, before we break, let me see if our executive director has any announcements. Uh, no announcements here, but thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Well, thanks for the hard work today, everyone, and we'll see you uh, in the morning. <laughs>